ون مينت بس حتى اطلع على اليوتيوب ثواني بس بسم الله نبدا بسم الله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه ومن والاه اهلا وسهلا بكم جميعا في اليوم الثاني من ايام مؤتمر الطوارئ مؤتمر الطوارئ ملتقى الطوارئ الدولي الاول المقام في المستشفى السعودي الالماني فيرست اوف اول ويلكم اول تو اور سكند دي ان ذا اس جي اتش ايمرجنسي انترناشونال سيمبوزيوم فيرست اوف اول ليت مي انتدوس اور مودريتر توداي بروف هاني باروم هي از جروب ايمرجنسي ميديسين شيف ميديكال اوفيسر ان اس جي اتش جروب اند هي از ذا جاد فادر فور ذا ايمرجنسي ميديسين سو بليز بروف ذا مايك ويز يو Hey, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome everyone for this wonderful uh, gathering uh, for the first emergency uh, international symposium, thankfully hosted by um, Saudi Germany Hospital in Medina. And I would like uh, to take the opportunity to thank the organizing committee and the chairman, as well as the uh, CEO and CMO of Medina and special thanks to Dr. Muhammad Talat, the head of the department, and Mr. Ala uh, Aladdin, uh, the, one of the organizing committee members. Uh, let me first um, um, introduce you um, for the uh, first lecture for today, uh, which will be hosted by uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Muhammad Wakil uh, from Australia. The lecture will be uh, about one pill can can kill. So uh, please welcome with me, Dr. Muhammad Wakil, and uh, the mic is yours. You may share your lecture if you may. I can see Dr. Muhammad Wakil is not yet uh, logged in. So, uh, okay, so Dr. Muhammad Wakil. I can start by the time uh, Dr. Muhammad Wakil starts. Uh, oh, yeah. Dr. Khalid, would you like to go ahead? Yes, please. Thank you, Prof. So the, okay, so uh, with this uh, minor glitch, Dr. Khalid uh, will host us uh, in this uh, wonderful lecture about traumatic brain injury, what you must know. So welcome, Dr. Khalid Atiyah, one yeah, of the thanks. emergency stars uh, in Medina and uh, Saudi you. Arabia. Thank you very much. Dr. Khalid, please. <laughs> okay, just uh, yesterday we had an event uh, that uh, one of the speakers uh, had an emergency unexpected and they have to leave. So I uh, did present the TBI. Today I have a lecture of hand injury in the initial management of hand injury in emergency. I hope we can enjoy this lecture. So before I start, uh, this uh, Prof. Hani uh, remind me, is this is the same room that you uh, you used to teach us in? Uh, no, this is my in, own in, private uh, office. <laughs> yes, I think we used to come there. <laughs> you remember. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you very much. Nice days. Anyway, this, let me, uh, allow me to share the uh, presentation, please. So let's go from there. So we'll talk today about the um, initial management of hand injury, uh, important topic with uh, some debates. I hope we can uh, add some uh, new information or not new, I would say, uh, stress on uh, some of the concepts that we need to uh, modify in our management. So I have uh, no disclosures at all. So it's part of reconstructive surgery, uh, and the aim of the reconstructive surgery is to um, restore the function of normal appearance, okay? Um, it improve or restore the normal function, um, restore the uh, appearance of abnormal or malformed uh, part of the body, and uh, most importantly is to improve the uh, patient quality of life, uh, especially if it is related to the uh, main uh, job of the patient. So there are some uh, overlapping between constructive and cosmetics. 
So um, they are covered with the same specialty, but you know, some of them, they just leave everything related to that and they just uh, do the um, cosmetic one. So the reconstructive blood cell is typically considered medically necessary and it's covered by most of the healthcare insurance. This is very important to understand because nowadays the insurance companies are gonna cover private as well as governmental. The cosmetic plastic is not that medically necessary unless you are an actor. So you need to be, uh, to look something uh, else uh, in front of the uh, camera. And uh, it, it is done to enhance the overall cosmetic appearance. But sometimes it is, most of the time it's not covered by the uh, insurance. So what are the common types of the um, reconstructive surgeries? We have uh, breast reconstructions. I mean, this one, the, one, the, the, the uh, tissue, the mammary gland that is affected by tumors, by uh, some inflammation, a breast reduction, and uh, the famous lift lip, lift ballet repair, skin cancer removal repair, and of course, hand surgery, foot surgery, and other part of I just want to share with you this uh, study that was done uh, testing the importance of having a plastic team or a plastic surgeon in trauma team. So they found that their conclusion, their initial primary conclusion, that they might play a role in a level one trauma center by sometimes limb saving or so ultimately life saving by you know, handling better the uh, vascularity of the hand and they know how to control the bleeding over there. So regarding the hand injury per se, why it is important for us as an emergency physician. So they are not that much frequently life-threatening, but they are common emergency department presentation and they are associated with significant patient morbidity and medical legal risk for physician. So you have to be careful. You might be sued for uh, any pitfall in uh, hand management. Here is the uh, recommendation of uh, ASIP. So we'll go through our lecture under these headings. So they recommend irrigation of the wound under pressure, please. This is a very important concept we need to understand and share today together. And I will talk in more detail regarding, regarding the uh, irrigation. Uh, debride the devitalized tissues. We need to consider the overall uh, patient health and wound closure should be individualized to the type of wound. And tetanus toxoid, please relieve your, uh, you know, uh, table that you uh, want to memorize all the time, whether to give or not to give. And of course, you need to maintain a low threshold for uh, hand surgeon consultation. Let's see the uh, recommendation of the American College of Radiology. So they recommend at least two views. So no one should image the patient if the patient does not need image with one view. If the patient needs to be imaged, he requires at least the minimum two views and you might add the third view which is oblique if you have uh, suspicion. But ordering one view is not a practice of uh, evidence based. So we go with the recommendation of the American College of uh, Radiology that you do at least two views. Of course, lower your threshold for doing CT, especially for the small bones, hands bones, uh, foot bones. And um, if you want to plan your surgery, it's better to plan it upon, say, upon CT to give you a more um, uh, delegate and more uh, be, be, uh, measurements rather than the x-ray it is confusing especially in the hand because of the uh, you know crowding of the bone over there and they um, you know if you have something like um, tender related uh, mix between tendons and bones so MRI is the way to go but ultrasound can help sometimes so here some injuries are advised or alerted that you should not be missing. You should remember all the time. And if you can make it negative in your documentation, it would be much better. So make sure that the patient does not have a compartment syndrome, actual or ongoing or impending. 
high pressure injuries. It's a big alert. You should not take it lightly because the opening in the hand is small, but you know, it has a devastating tissue injury inside. And of course, arterial injury. So those three are high alert, very high morbidity, you shouldn't be missed. Those are some of the high morbidity, but not very high like uh, the other one. Huh? Occult scopoid fracture, chronic pain, malunion, nonunion, if you miss it, Ronald pinet fracture, prelinate, lunate fracture, game skipper, especially if it is settled there and it's not a uh, degree, and the first degree or second degree, scapulonate to scratch and bite bite. You should not be taking it like this. You, have, you need to have a very good documentation rather than other. So what about moderate? Moderate uh, morbidity if missed. Flexor tendon injury, that would depend on your exam and documentation of the exam. So you have to isolate each joint, each phalangeal joint, and examine the power over there to not miss this injury. Mallet finger, famous. It has a chronic complication, so you shouldn't be missing. And the jersey finger, that happened to the uh, basketball player, you know, when they, uh, you know, run after each other. It is somewhat like opposite to the marriage function. So what are the initial management that you need to, uh, to uh, consider? Principles in treatments, hemostasis, control the bleeding first. Please give appropriate analgesia and we'll discuss some uh, debate over there. Wound care and splinting. So regarding analgesia, we have the uh, debate between the single floor injection digital nerve rock versus the traditional two injection uh, dorsal, not the, the dorsal uh, digital nerve block. So both of them, they have similar efficacy in analgesia. But I can tell you, Applying the uh, single floor injection is somewhat more painful than the regular traditional two uh, dorsal digital. So it is uh, once um, a finger is blocked, it gives it gives the same uh, amount of analgesia. But you know, uh, inserting the needle, uh, the volar aspect of the patient is more painful than inserting the, uh, the, the needle from the dorsal uh, aspect of the hand. Of course. Bleeding, how to control, simple, direct pressure initially, limb elevation if you like to help you. Otherwise, if you have a true arterial injury, please do not do blind climbing and ligation, figure of eight suturing that uh, it's been practiced by uh, some situation should not be done in the hand because of the proximity of the nerves and the other vessels. Tourniquet is a very important, especially if you have uncontrolled arterial bleed. Most important thing that I want, you, I want to alert you about in tourniquet is record the time please. And you need to have an intermittent release to avoid ischemia. And overall, your total tourniquet time should not exceed two to three hours. And you apply it for the true, uh, brisky, poorly controlled bleeding. Do not apply it for each and everything. And you know, don't mix tourniquet with the um, venipuncture tourniquet. It's totally different. We're talking about arterial tourniquet. Splinting is very important concept that you need to apply, especially in hand injuries. Uh, it improves uh, perfusion, restores the normal anatomical uh, alignment and minimize the pain, especially transporting the patient back and forth between the X-ray and the emergency department. And you need to repeat the distal neurovascular exam before the splinting and after splinting all the time. So please, whether you do the uh, pre-made uh, splint or you can use the uh, back slab and you uh, fabricate that one. So this is a famous uh, intrinsic plus position that helps to uh, maintain uh, the normal position. Uh, this is just to remind you with a thumb, uh, thumb spike uh, that usually for the management of the uh, thumb related injuries. Uh, we have also uh, two other uh, simple splints, volar splints and dorsal splints, opposite to the uh, uh, angulation of the fracture to stabilize the uh, fracture over there and help radial gutter, ulnar gutter. 
what we do with the amputated part and how do we store it? I just really don't want to really have an extra debate in uh, this uh, subject. So let's unify our, uh, you know, management. And let's agree. We should not be storing uh, amputated parts in different uh, modes or, or different modalities each and every time. So it's very simple. You need to wrap the amputated part in a moist gauze. So the gauze is moist with a saline or regal lactate, anything. And then you would rub it with the uh, gauze, then apply that gauze in a plastic bag. That plastic bag should go into ice with water, should not be in direct contact with the ice and water. So this is the point. Again, moist gauze, you rub it, you put it in a bag, you put the bag in the ice and water. So you have to isolate the amputated uh, uh, part or the amputated finger from the direct contact to the ice or the water. Regarding the uh, recommendation by ASIP, pressure irrigation with the saline. So it is proven that it is the high pressure irrigation is superior to low pressure irrigation. And it is superior to all antiseptics, hydrogen peroxide, bufidine, chlorhexidine, iodine, just name it. There is no difference. I would say that these chemicals might irritate the wound and cause uh, tissue irritation more than the um, uh, uh, yeah, killing the uh, organisms. And it might delay the healing. And they found that Similarly, uh, efficacy of tap water versus uh, sterile water irrigation. We have a special needle for uh, irrigation. You can just attach it and uh, pressurize it, and it, it is, uh, you know, associated with a cap, so it will not spoil the area. The uh, water will not be distributed everywhere. But if you don't have that one, it's not a problem. You can use and fabricate gauge needle. Um, this is 18 the green top, okay? And attach it to a 50 ml syringe and it will give you the same pressure that you would like to do and to irrigate your wound, which is more important and better than putting and um, antiseptic within the wound. So please irrigate your wound thoroughly under pressure with sterile water, saline, ring lactate, whatever, but not antiseptic solution. You might use the antiseptic solution around the wound, over the skin, but not inside the wound, please. Don't forget, removal of the foreign body with an inside the wound, and most importantly, if you have a hand injury, uh, risk of swelling, and then uh, another problem will uh, occur. So please, early on, remove the uh, sort of the jewelry or the ring or the patient. Of course, contaminated as dental scrubbing, and deprive the deprived tissue if you have it in front of you. This is another debate. Please, antibiotics should not be given to each and every patient for a wound, whether uh, the patient uh, is at risk or not at risk. I should not be covered. I should not be covering my patient antibiotic and relief headache. No, it has proved. See, look at the number of the studies that we have there. No benefits of prophylactic antibiotic of low restriction at all, there is no benefit. And what are the wounds that might have benefit from the prophylaxis? The one they would have associated tendon injuries, open fracture, violation of the joints, crushed injury, puncture wounds, especially if it is um, human bite or animal bite, or truly immunocompromised host. Long-standing uncontrolled DM is yes, but if somebody is having his uh, diabetic uh, blood sugar is controlled, is that considered to be immunocompromised? So please, uh, gauge your bullfight antibiotic to the patient who really deserves it and need it. It's not a must. Hand injury does not equal antibiotic by default. This is what I want to say. Do not give antibiotic unless you have a high risk wound. Vaccination. Long story short, 
update the tetanus, update patient vaccination. Uh, I know the timetable, the table. Clean wound, five years, dirt wound, uh, 10 years. And if you are taking three booster, you can, if you take the booster, you can take again. Yes, yes, update when feasible. Unless the patient is very recently he took a vaccine, then you can't really uh, overcome that one. Otherwise, please just regard the timing, update their tetanus immunization. Long story short. What about the illustration debate? So we, most of the illustration should be repaired in the emergency, except the uh, high infection risk that we consider uh, uh, more delicate irrigation or interoperative irrigation, or uh, we would consider secondary tension healing, depends, crushed injury, high velocity inside injuries, infected wound, uh, wound with a tissue loss, you might consider uh, um, this one to be done by uh, hand surgeon. The uh, myth of uh, more than six hours old wound is a contraindication for primary closure is not uh, true anymore. That's it. You can, if the, if the patient is um, young and healthy and the, and the wound is still um, fresh within the 12 hours the window, no problem. You can do it, irrigate well, um, and then you can suture with the primary closure. I want to share with you this study is done in pediatric population. They compare the absorbable versus non-absorbable uh, suturing. And uh, they found that uh, adhesions is less and the infection rate is less also. But you know, it's still, it is not um, a practice change uh, article. We will not change our practice uh, about this, uh, regarding this study. But it's still, it's giving you a uh, um, reflection that we might be, uh, or we will, we can consider absorbable uh, suture for uh, wound closure uh, anytime. Bite bite, 75% reported, reported complication rate. So very high, very high. So it needs exploration through full range of motion, of course, in the OR, meticulous wound care. And this is. Antibiotic here is a must, it's a must. So you will never close this wound, never suture it. Regardless, how does it look like? Even if it looks clean, don't irrigate and close. Fight bite, especially fight bite. And of course, hand surgery need to be involved in this patient for management and follow-up. Regarding the fingertip amputation, it's uh, a big topic by its own. Simple uh, classification, zone one, two, three, zone one, no bone involvement, so, uh, you know, uh, zone two, uh, partly involving some part of the bone, and uh, zone three, large part of the bone up to the joint. And there is another uh, dorsal who transfers, volar, and there is another one, which is level one, two, three, four, yeah. It is a tons of uh, classification that it is beyond our uh, scope today. But at the end, they found that if you have a simple zone one injury, bone is not exposed, you just do simple non-adherent dressing and leave it for secondary intention, uh, it will heal within one month. This is the important information that you need to explain to your patient that the, he shouldn't be expecting. Uh, uh, soon he will recover. So give him, you need one month for, uh, you need one month for your wound to heal. And they found that if you do this strategy with uh, recurrent non um dressing, it will uh, have a very good result, about 88% even normal sensory uh, function retention, okay? And infection rate was zero with this system. <coughs> Excuse me. Zone two and zone three, um, I think in uh, zone two, you might see this DY, BY shape uh, repair. That sometimes it can be done in the emergency, just trim part of the bone that is exposed or it is sharp. And then you can take a V shape uh, slab and then you can just uh, bullet and then uh, suture from down. It, it happened, it, ha it is easy to be done in the emergency in some selective cases, but make sure that it is not severe. 
zone three injury because it might require a distal phalanx amputation. Subangle hematoma, it's very famous. It looks simple, but I'm warning you today to be careful with this subangle hematoma. Most of it are simple, but be careful. So it's a simply a collection of blood below the nail, between the nail, uh, nail palate and the nail bed uh, matrix. You need an X-ray, two views at least, and I'm going to tell you why now. So, definition alone for any size. What we used to say before, if the subangle hematoma is 50% of the nail and less, you don't need to, uh, you would do trephination, that's it. If it is more than 50%, what you would do, you have to remove the nail, prepare the nail bed, and then reapply the nail. It's not true anymore. So any size, less than 50%, more than 50%, 100%, you can't do trephination. And this is the way that you do trephination with the needle. Or maybe roof uh, bar room in your office uh, and need a paper clip, you can, you know, sterilize with a lighter and do that one. Please don't. This is a very common practice they do in the office. It's very dangerous and prohibited. Never ever do this one. So please, no one should use a paper clip and, you know, sterilize it with a lighter and then do the trephination. It's a very bad practice. It needs to be done with a trial needle, new one, okay? So this is what I'm alerting you about, Simon fracture. So it's a displaced fracture of the distal phalanx. It is considered Sotar Harris, one or two. It's associated with a nail bit injury. What's the problem with that one? The tissue come trapped in the growth plate. And guess what? Sometimes it is not apparent. You would have only hematoma over there. So it is considered an open fracture, although it is not exposed to the exterior. So it have significant consequences. Stimulitis, growth arrest, and persistent mallet deformity. So please, you might be having a fracture underneath the angle hematoma. This is why we say we need to do an X-ray for that one. How we treat, it is bad. You need antibiotic, you need to bad, you need to take to the OR full exposure. And guess what? You might need to do nailing for this patient. It is not easy to manage this one. And, and what happened? It needs to be treated within 24 hours to restore the function. Otherwise, you are risking the patient for the significant consequences and the complication. Nail bit matrix. If you want to remember one thing about nail bit matrix, you just remember the eponychial fold. It's a very important structure that it should not be left after management. You need to splint that fold. So whenever you require to remove the nail, to prepare the nail bit, replace, replace the nail to splint the, this one, eponychial fault to restore the normal growth and normal shape of the nail later on. And of course, you need a hand surgery follow up for this patient. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Khalid, for this amazing uh, lecture. Just a flashback of uh, what we know and reinforcement of our uh, emergency knowledge. Thank you so much. Uh, I can see if there's any questions, any hand raised. I don't see any questions or uh, any hand raised. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Khalid. Uh, if we don't have any uh, questions, we might go to the next uh, speaker, Dr. Mohammed uh, Wakil. Is he there? Yes. Dr. Hello. Okay. Okay. Hi, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, so please uh, share your uh, presentation. Dr. Mohammed uh, Al Wakil is an emergency physician 
from Australia. He will be um, talking to us about one pill can kill. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohammed. It's, uh, I, it's yours. Can't, <clears throat> I can't share because there's still somebody sharing. Okay, uh, Mr. Ala or anybody can share uh, Dr. Mohammed's uh, lecture, please. You can try now to uh, kill. Yeah, I can share now. That's fine. Connect across. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So, um, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me for this conference. I'm so honored to be with this you and with this great um, faculty. I'm also be honored to be um, in a conference here in Holy Medina. Um, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Muhammad al -Wakil. I'm um, <clears throat> a FASIM and emergency consultant in um, South Australia. And today talks mainly about um, one pill can kill, but it's mainly about uh, introduction to toxicology and how to approach a uh, patient presenting ED. Um, so I don't have any disclosure. Um, and let's start with crack on this one. So normally when you, uh, most of us in ED, um, if you receive a call from recess or one of the nurses that we have a patient coming with uh, most probably a toxicology or offensive drugs, some of us get panic or anxious because um, they try to think about, oh, what shall I do with this patient? What the proper antidote? What are the consequences of these medications? How long should I support these patients? If you, if you feel this, that's all right. We, most of us have been in the same situations and toxicology is quite tricky <clears throat> um, presentations to the department. But what I'd like to, to let you know that you are the best one in the hospital to deal with these patients. Nobody else um, in a hospital can deal with talks uh, like the emergency physician. So be proud of yourself, trust yourself and just crack on any patients coming with toxicology with this approach. Um, so what, the, what about the um, toxicology? Um, you have abnormal physiology. This is the first thing that you can see with any patients coming. Um, this physiology is um, deranged. Uh, from ABC point of view, you can see patients could be uh, compatible or funded. Patients can be uh, pradipnic or uh, tachypnic uh, or hypoxic or uh, hyperventilated. Patient can be uh, in a shock or uh, extreme hypertension, pradicardia or tachycardia, um, be hypothermic or hyperthermic. So anything can be deranged uh, with an offensive drug. So what you need to do is try to optimize physiology and support the patients. Most of the patients will have about six to eight hours up to 24 hours till the drugs wear off and back to normal. Your rule is try to support this patient during this, this period. Also, thanks to me, come in your mind what the patient has been taking. And this is quite difficult questions and nobody has a clear answer. Um, one, what I want you to, to understand is you, most of the time, we never know which offensive drug has been taken, especially if the patient taking illicit drugs. It would be most of the time a cocktail of um, amphetamine, THC, um, plus GHP, a, a combination of stimulant with hypnotics. Um, and it would be very hard to ascertain which specific drugs has been taken. Also, in terms of the medications, it's almost will be a polypharmacy. Um, patient is on beta blockers with joxin or, or uh, antihypertensive medications, your, your assumption will be this patient have been taking all this medication at once. So you need to think about the worst case scenario. You need to um, assure that, make sure this patient having a polypharmacy or a cocktail of illicit drugs. And then you have some time critical priority. Patients coming to the emergency, most of the time you will have some time to think about the cause, the treatment, the disposition, you can get help from the poison center, but sometimes the critical treatment shouldn't be given straight away. For example, if your patient's coming with alternative status for David diaphoretic, you need to make sure this patient is not hypoglycemic. So Dixlo should be given straight away. Um, patients um, 
coming with maybe um, opioid, uh, heroin or cocaine and coming with uh, or pain point pupil and he's not feeling well. So you're, you're, you need now to give some antidote which is naloxone and see if the patient is start to feel well or not. Um, and so on. We, we talk about this now, but this is mainly what you need to understand what the toxicology is sitting on. So now you are in ED, you're having a patient coming <clears throat> with um, most probably uh, toxins um, and you need an approach. So we love mnemonic. So this is from the Love and the Fast Line website, one of the um, brilliant websites free. Um, it's called RRSI. -DED. And you make you think about ahead what you need to do and what you need to uh, consider in any single patient and see if he, if you need to do something for him. R stands for resuscitations, risk assessment, supportive care and investigation. Um, does the patient need a contravention or not? Does the patient need enhanced elimination or not? Uh, what a specific antidote if available? And what's your disposition? So let's track on the first one. So resuscitation. Um, you need to ask yourself first, <clears throat> does this patient need a resuscitation or not? And this is a big part from our emergency department job. We like resuscitation, we like this room. So you need to make sure this patient does need resuscitation or not. Um, so you follow your normal ABCDE approach, but with some modification. Um, so from airway point of view, so first of all, these patients can protect his airway or not. And you can combine it with the disability. So based on his GCS, if the patient is quite comatose and he is not maintaining airway and he is obstructing, so you need to intervene with jaw thrust, maybe put in some oropharyngeal airway, nasopharyngeal airway, and see if these patients will end up with intubation or not. Is this patient um, having some corrosive uh, like alkali or acids in attempts for suicide. So now you are expecting a difficult airway. You're, you're expecting a, a distorted anatomy. So you need to get help soon. You need to get more, the most experienced uh, ED doctors. You need to get uh, anesthetics because you are now expecting uh, a quite difficult airway, which is maybe managed by even glucotherapy. Um, so, the second thing is in airway, we normally do a RSI, rapid patients. But um, my advice, ED is not RSI most of the time. We most of the time have some modifications for RSI. Um, for example, patient with um, toxins uh, having, as we said before, um, disturbed uh, um, physiology. Um, so if the patient's coming with tachypnea about 30 or 40 degrees per minute because he's having, for example, maybe toxic alcohol or salicylate, and he's, he's quite acidotic. If you try to attempt intubations, he will die. And it will be easy kill for the patients. So what you need first to optimize is physiology. You need to get lots of bicarb. You need to get the most expert one to have a very, very brief apnea, which is during the intubations. And then you need to set the ventilator to the uh, respiratory rate before intubation. Like if he's been breathing out 30 to 40, so you need to uh, keep the respiratory rate on ventilator to 30 to 40. And so on. If the patient is hypovolemic, you need to optimize his um, hemodynamic first. He needs lots of fluids. Uh, if he's not responding, he needs a vasopressors before attempting intubations because all the medication you're using in airway or RSI is um, hemodynamic unstable medications. Patients will be more hypotensive, more hypoxic if you don't intervene. Uh, again, if there's an arrhythmia, you need to fix first. So if you think about airway and toxins, don't rush for RSI. First, optimize the patient physiology before doing anything. Now going for breathing. Patients can be from normal breathing to pradi to tachypnic. Pradipnic, you may expect things, uh, if you're having some pinpoint pupil, you may expect, yes, this patient may be under influence of narcotics. So maybe antidote of naloxone could be um, all right. Patient can having uh, tachypnia because he's tried to um, fix himself. Patient is acidotic. Uh, so he's breathing so, um, so fast. If you get plug gas, you have some 
uh, respiratory causes because washing all the CO2, don't intervene with such patients because don't, don't do anything if he's breathing so fast because he's acidotic. Uh, try to treat the offensive cause first. Um, and again, if the patient is quite wet lung with um, pinpoint pupil, you may think about this is called deoxanophosphate. So you need to give a lots of atropine and suctioning and lung toilet. Um, going for circulations, wide range from uh, volume depleted, hypertensive to extremely hypertensive. Uh, if he's having some stimulant or some batomimetics or amphetamine, hypertensive, you need to have fluids and fluids. If he's uh, under effect of calcium channel blocker or uh, beta blocker, so you need to give fluids more, more calcium, high dose insulin, which is a specific antidote, vasopressors. Uh, if his patient is quite hypertensive, 240, 100 plus, because he's having amphetamine, your treatment is benzo, benzo, lots of benzo. If not responding, you can give some GTM. But don't give any patients with syndesomimetics uh, beta blockers because now you leave the alpha blocker anopause theoretically um, and it may worsen his symptoms. Um, again, in, in circulations, if the patient having a VT or VF and you're suspecting underlying toxicology like um, TCA or um, uh, you, you, this patient likely will not respond to any uh, NIFEB. So you need to give first sodium bicarb, you need to hyperventilate the patients because whatever you give NIFEB is not working. Similar to hyperkalemia, if the patient is hyperkalemic and went to VF or, or VT and you try to uh, cardiovascular the patients, unless you're giving calcium and uh, reducing the potassium, the patient will not get any benefits. Disability, we talk about um, from combative, with uh, need some benzo to sedate from obtunded who can maintain his airway, who may need some interventions. This is you think about this. Um, have a broad mind of differential diagnosis. Um, patients who has alcohol or GHP or illicit drugs, it doesn't rule out trauma. So these patients, if he's coming with all traumatic status and you're suspecting some sort of trauma, you need to scan his brain as well, his or her. So, uh, patient have a toxicology doesn't mean he doesn't have any other pathology. Okay, uh, exposures again. Patient may be having some alcohol or some drugs, and he um, stepped over the floor for a few hours. Weather was quite cold, and he's become hypothermic at 234. So you need to active actively warm the patient. Patient may having something basomimetics or went to uh, um, uh, SSRI, so it's going in serotonin syndrome or neuroleptic malignancy. So he's now uh, become hyperthermic with tremors, clonus, uh, maybe plus or minus seizures. So you need to actively call in these patients. So again, resuscitation, this is the same we do with any patients from A, B, C, D, E, but just consider some modifications from your normal um, approach. Try to de detect and correct why you are doing the resus. Make sure hypoglycemia don't miss. Um, any patients need uh, a finger prick uh, to make sure he doesn't have any hypoglycemia. Also, I would recommend to get a blood gas straight away. Blood gas give you a lot of information, give you blood sugar, of course, give you the uh, acid base uh, disturbance and give you information about potassium and sodium as well. Uh, seizure, uh, patient have seizures. Um, and if you're suspecting uh, offensive drugs, Give benzo. Give lots of benzo. Benzo, uh, benzodiazepine is your friends. Don't give any anti-epileptic medication at this stage, um, because all of this can cause also more seizures because of the sodium cell blockage uh, criteria. So unless you, you exactly know what's going of seizures, if you're suspecting toxins, just give benzo and correct hypoglycemia or hyponatremia if you um, if you find it. Yeah. Again, hypo or hyperthermia, you need to correct straight away. Antidote, um, it's quite tricky and most of us get anxious because we normally can recall uh, or uh, memorize all the antidotes and medication, which is a lot. Um, and it's okay, you don't really need to remember all of this unless you are getting into exam. Um, sure, you need to uh, remember all of them or most of them, but at least you need to 
during your daily practice, you need to make sure you know the uh, already available uh, antidote which can save your life. Uh, dextrose is one of them. Hypoglycemia, you give dextrose straight away. Uh, any patient, again, with ultimate status, um, any neurosymptoms, you need to get uh, virtually level straight away. Sodium bicarb, um, you giving sodium bicarb uh, in uh, TCA uh, toxicity, you give it for uh, propranol. Uh, propranol is beta blockers, but it's also had uh, a sodium child blockage uh, issues. Uh, salicylate overdose, toxic alcohols, which is ethylene, glycol, and methanol. Um, if you're suspecting all of this, you need a lot of bicarb. Start with one to two millimoles per kilogram, which is I normally give 100 ml of uh, sodium bicarb 8.5 or 8.4%. Um, also, as antidote, you need to know what's your endpoint, uh, how much I need to give, and um, what what's my endpoints. So, for example, if you look at uh, talking about TCA, um, like amitriptyline, uh, your endpoint will be giving sodium bicarb to the pH is more than 7.5 uh, and QT, uh, sorry, QRS is less than 100. So you keep going with sodium bicarb or hyperventilation depends on this um, situation till you have this pH and ECG finding correct. Naloxone, one of the easily available antidote cocktail in, in ED. Uh, naloxone is quite good for opioid overdose. Uh, but again, um, with uh, opioid toxicity or sorry, heroin or cocaine, your uh, aim is not to completely make the patients awake. Don't go for it. Uh, what you need to do with naloxone is with opioids, patient is predipnic, sometimes apneic. Um, and what you need is to stimulate the patient to start to breathe again. Patient paid a lot of money to get heroin or cocaine because it's expensive. Uh, he doesn't want to be uh, get rid of all the medication or drugs he's been given. Um, and if you give a lot of naloxone, you can end up with agitated patients, very angry, and even um, opioid withdrawal. So you need to give small doses of naloxone. Normally, I would start with 100 mic IV up to the 400 and see how he's responding. If I'm giving patient with pinpoint pupil with quiet apneic and I'm quite sure with the history and um, that he's likely having heroin, I'm, I'm giving 100 to, to 400 mic of, uh, of naloxone. And if he started to breathe, I can keep going with small doses. But if 100 is enough, this patient will be breathing like five or um, six uh, breath per minute with oxygen saturation. 100%, I would be happy with him. I know he can retain some CO2, but it's okay. Once he's fully awake, he can wash out all the CO2. Um, but if the patient is quite comatose and he's responding initially well to naloxone, but he's again become tunded and hypoxic, um, uh, apneic. So at this stage, you need to start now naloxone infusion. This will be an ICU. Normally you start with one third or, or half of the total dose of naloxone given initially. Um, Atropine, uh, atropine have a different uh, uses in ED. Um, most, pro most, most of the time will be organophosphate. If they're having patients coming with uh, sweaty, lacrimation, pancreas, uh, predicardic, um, pinpoint pupil, and you're suspecting glyphosphate, you contaminate the patient first and then give a loss of atropine. So call your pharmacist, get a loss of atropine because you need a lot. Your dose start with 1.2 milligram, which is two ampoule, and then you give double dose every two minutes. Your endpoint is pupil is dilated, the uh, lacrimations and all the secretions are worth getting less and patients become more stable. Uh, you still can consider atropine in um, calcium channel blockage or beta blocker, but you be aware it's less likely to work. Like if you give the full dose of G3 milligram of atropine in calcium channel blocker and beta blocker and didn't work, that's all right. It's, it's, the, it's more than atropine. Um, um, but it's, you still can consider it. Uh, Digipine, which is mainly for uh, the Um If you have any patient having uh, overdose of the coming come with potassium 5.5, more than 5.5, with the uh, drugs level more than 15, um, with some easy changes and trousers, you need to consider Digipine. Um, if you don't have it, try to get it from nearest 
hospital. It's expensive, and I don't expect any hospital will have digivine. Uh, but this is the only treatment for digoxin toxicity. And your dose will be, if the patient is stable, you can start with five ampoules. Um, Pre-arrest and arrest, you give a 10 ampoules. So you need a, a lot of doses of digivine. There's a lot of other antidotes like calcium and calcium sharp blockage, high dose insulin or calcium sharp blockage and theta blockers as well. Um, but this is beyond the scope of introduction. Um, so we talked about resuscitations, uh, risk assessment. This is the second thing. And it's a very important in your assessment, how to risk assessment patients coming uh, in ED. So my advice would be worst case scenario. Just consider each single patient coming to ED, what the worst case scenario could be having for these patients. If he's having a couple of um, packs of tablets and all empty, consider he's been taking all this medication at once. If he's been on uh, multiple medications, um, your assumption will be he's been taking all these medications uh, and so on. Don't assume this patient is taking one or two tablets. Um, and then also don't trust the patients. Uh, I'm not, don't be judgmental, but at least be skeptical and suspicious of the patients and don't trust his word because many of them change their um, uh, minds and they can hide some information from you if it's an illicit uh, or intention uh, overdose. Again, it's a co-injection. If he's having one drugs, sure he's got another one, but you don't know about it. Try to find from the toxic room, from the history, from the collaterals, and so on. Uh, any overdose in pediatric is NAI until proof otherwise. So if you have any kids coming with overdose, uh, it's a um, narc center injury until proof otherwise. You need to get a very, very good history, collateral history. You need to involve your friend from social worker. And if you have the suspicion, you need to contact the child protection. Again, any overdose in kids are, is any identity proof otherwise. All right, so what if the patient is unconscious, which is very common to present patient is unconscious and there is empty packs of many tablets and you're now stuck with the patients. It's hard, but you can use some of these uh, collateral. So if, you, if the patient coming with ambulance, they are very helpful because they bring all the tablets they found at home and they likely will tell you he's likely having 50 of these, 30 of that tablets and so on. You can call the family and try to get some collaterals because some of the intention and suicide attempts, they let the family know sometimes that they are going to take these and that medications. And health record, if you have any previous health records, some of these patients will sometimes be frequent flyer uh, to the emergency and some of them is new presenting. So if you are lucky enough, you will have some collateral information. Uh, if you don't have anything of this, you need now to go for toxidromes. And what's toxidromes is a consultation of uh, symptoms and signs uh, to give you a bit of find which most probably the offensive drugs. And again, after all your risk assessment, sometimes you will end up to don't know what he has or she has. And that's right. Your role at this stage is to um, support the patients uh, hemodynamically until the medication will off. Toxidromes, you're looking from head to two, you're looking for the eyes, looking for the lungs, from the uh, heart rate, skin, blood pressure, power sounds, temperature, to try to find out some of this, um, if he has this um, symptoms and signs all together, you're likely having some stimulant, some hypnotics medications, maybe opioids, you may be having some anticholinergic or cholinergic medications, or maybe serotonin. There's another one called slow and slow, which is um, low blood pressure as low heart rate. This is mainly with calcium channel blockage, beta blockers, the joxin and organophosphate. <clears throat> um, so again, this is not quite exhaustive, but if, for example, if we take opioids like a toxin drone, you will find the people is constricted and the heart rate, the blood pressure, the respiratory rate, the GI uh, motility, all are low. And this is give you some information. And of course, the um, 
conscious level. And this is giving, yes, this was for the opiate. But if the patient having some cholinergic like for example, state, especially if you have diarrhea, urinations, bronchus pass, lacrimations, maybe bronchial secretions and fasciculations and maybe seizures. If you have all of this, you, yeah, it's likely uh, your dental space or carpamates and so on. Anticholinergic life in bathmometrics, everything is high. Anticholinergic patient is dry. I think that's my expectation is sweaty and arthritic. This is the mainly things we can find, but most of them, if the patient ends up with seizures, you need to give some pills or pills or pills. Um, all right, so because of this, talked about one pill can kill. So I just summarize um, in pediatrics, just one pill can kill these kids. So be aware of this. Um, amphetamine, uh, one tablet of propranol, paclopine, one tablet of opioids, one tablet of calcium channels or carpamazepine, one tablet of sulfonyl urea can kill the patients. Firefell NTC, venlafaxine. So kids are so small, but they are tricky and dangerous. So a new risk assessment, remember to find the agents if you can. And most of the time with the agents, not just single agent, what it does, in the dose, what's the worst case scenario? If you have a couple of empty packs, so your assumption is he's taking all these packs. The time since ingestion, uh, and you can get some collaterals. And if you don't know, maybe asking the family, when the last time you saw these patients? Maybe saying afternoon. So your assumption will be maybe from afternoon till he come to ED and so on. Try to find a way to uh, get some information. Looking to the clinical features and um, try to uh, put it in a one or two syndrome if you can, and looking for the progress. Because um, after knowing the agents and those, now you can talk to your poison center or doing your research, and now you know the progress of this. Some of the drugs you will expect in this patient may end up with intubation in a few hours. So I may be intubating um, initially or this patient likely will get uh, better in a few hours. So you know the progression of the disease. Patients taking, for example, turnidine, you're now expecting this patient will be more pedicardic and more hypertensive. So patient need to have a lots of fluids and start to vasopressors and ICU friends get patient admitted and so on. So from your agent and those being taken, now you can expecting, and this is the ED, expecting the progress of the disease. Looking to the factor of patient factors, what the weight, what the other comorbidities, which is can affect your uh, management. So <clears throat> let's put all together and start with this exercise. So we have two patients, um, post patients taking paracetamol. The first one is 45 male. He's been taking 15 grams of slow release paracetamol. He's taking this seven hours ago. And now he's complaining from some nausea and right upper quadrant pain. And on the same shift, you are lucky enough, you have another lady, she's same times coming with, um, maybe she said, I'm not sure exactly how much I took, but maybe 10 grams, uh, but I took it two hours ago and I'm completely fine. And it was intentional and now I'm quite uh, regret for what I've been doing. So post patients will be managed differently. The first one, as you know, NAC, which is the antidote of paracetamol. And again, as you know, paracetamol is quite serious and a silent killer um, because it's be asymptomatic initially or some just taking the medication, have some right, our conjure pain, maybe in the first 24 hours and then end up with permanent hepatic failure and the only um, <clears throat> treatment for this at this stage will be liver transplant. So it's quite serious drugs and it's really available. Anybody can take, get paracetamol from the over the counter. So I um, really do paracetamol liver for each patient coming with intentional overdose. So back to the patient. So first one, NAC should be given within eight hours as a maximum. So if you have this patient who's coming within seven hours and he's got 15 grams, which is toxic dose. Above 10 grams is a, is a, is a toxic dose. And the slow release, it means it's, it will stay for a while. And means he's maybe needing other dose of NAC, uh, based on your blood test and stuff. And again, it's beyond 
this call of these lectures. But these patients, I will start next straight away. I will get the paracetamol level, put the normal gram, which is coming back. I will um, get some uh, blood tests, mainly including AST, and see if it's above 50. And then definitely it's got some uh, hepatitis toxicity from the paracetamol level. Maybe adding some INR, um, liver function, kidney function, but it's based on your local policy. Um, but the, on the other side, this lady, I will, I will do nothing. I will wait for another two hours. So because the paracetamol level should be taken after four hours. So after another two hours in ED, take a, a paracetamol level. If it's normal, she can go home. If she's mentally, uh, uh, mental health assessment was okay. Um, or if it's high after four hours, I will start NAC. So from your risk assessment, now you differentiate between two patients having the same drugs, but one of them need an urgent uh, uh, start of uh, antidote. The other one, wait and see and do some plot. Hopefully this is just explain what I meant with risk assessment. Um, in terms of the supportive treatment, care and investigation, supportive treatment mainly <laughs> giving some fluids if the patient needs, giving some analgesia and antiemetic if he has vomiting or nausea. If the patient is compatible, he needs sedations. Um, if the patient is intubated, he needs to be head up. If the patient is uh, ultra mental status, which is quite common with GHP, uh, um, some PENZO, but still maintaining his airway. So all you need with this patient is just observe. Um, so I will put the patient in a, a recovery position put in tidal CO2, pulse oximetry, telemetry, and just observe. Uh, if everything's changed, you just need to intervene. Um, also, tight blood glucose control. Um, patient, most of the time, you will have some anticholinergic effect from some drugs or uh, recreational drug medication. So make sure the patient having a blood scan and make sure the patient doesn't have any ear retention if he's uh, not fully awake. Uh, NGT is indicated if the patient have intubation. Um, again, um, temperature control, psychological support, of course, if the patient needs um, uh, mental health assessment. Um, and again, again, always check the bladder. Uh, many patients will end up with their attention and don't know. And the only way to know is to palpate his supervivic area or get a blood scan and uh, assess his blood. So what the investigation? So in terms of the investigation, you can, um, um, the bit, uh, bedside test you need to do straight away for any patient suspected of those is ECG, blood sugar, blood gas, and drug level. And paracetamol, you should include it in any patient coming with overdose, uh, whether she's taking paracetamol or not. Because again, patients can sometimes hide the information from you. So ECG, looking for conduction from any uh, kind of heart block, um, looking for uh, ACS criteria of patient having cocaine, looking for any kind of IRC. And this is what you're expecting. So if the patient having some sort of surgery on sharp blockage, you're expecting QRS is more than 100 uh, milliseconds. And you have a terminal R wave, which is, this is the terminal R wave in AVR. And it's very passive mnemonic uh, for uh, TCA toxicity. Um, so it's made TCA, uh, propranol, uh, local anesthetics, carbamazepine, most of the antipsychotic and antidepressants have some uh, sodium child blockage criteria. So make it easy for yourself. And there's overlap between sodium child blockage and calcium child blockage. Uh, calcium, uh, sorry, potassium um, blockage is prolonged QT and end of stress de poids. Um, and psychotic TCA, propanol, antihistamine, um, anti RS medications, some of the antibiotics, all can cause uh, prolonged QT. So, looking to QRS, are we in terminal AVR, looking for the QT and um, looking for the um, any kind of AV block which is could be the joxin, patient is pericardic or every kind of AV block also have a calcium channel or beta blockers. Um, QT, I um, uh, prefer to go for the actual QT, not the corrected QT. Um, with actual QT, you get the normal gram 
and plot the QT based on the heart rate on the uh, nomogram. If your QT is above this line, at the, according to the heart rate, this is likely um, patients will end up with Um So now we're going to talk about the decontamination. Um, so with decontamination, um, there is nothing called uh, induced emissions. There's nothing for gastric lavage. All these are obsolete now. Uh, what you need is activated charcoal or whole power irrigation. Um, with activated charcoal, no uh, activated charcoal for MAC, which is metal alcohol corrosive. So if the patient having metals or alcohol or any corrosive, there's no rule for activated charcoal, simply because they don't find to activate charcoal. Um, with activated charcoal, the um, problem is sometimes people get very, very um, keen and uh, enthusiastic to get some uh, activated charcoal to the patients. Um, however, this is, can distract you from um, um, uh, these stations. Also, um, um, if this uh, creature called uh, reach the lung, it's a lethal and fatal. So make sure you don't give any creature call for any patients who's um, not cooperative, or funded, or alternative. Uh, a threshold call should be given within one to two hours. The dose is 50 gram or um, as a maximum. Hot power irrigations, um, it's indicated for iron. Really? Uh, slow release. Uh, <laughs> You hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, Doctor. Yes, Doctor Mahmoud. Okay. So the whole power irrigations is um, indicated for iron, potassium, uh, calcium trap blockage, or body patterns. All right. Um, can you give me a sack, please? Can somebody meet me for a sack? Hello? Yes, doctor, what you need? Yeah, I just did one second break. Sorry. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, Hello? Yes, go ahead, Dr. Mohammed. Sorry, my kids was quite crying. So. That's okay. That's <laughs> okay. So, um, back to whole bio irrigations, we indicated for iron, potassium, and calcium shop blockage, and body packers. Uh, simply, what you need to do is putting, again, patients should be very uh, cooperative, awake, putting NGT uh, using any big. Um, Move your should be fine. And mix it with around four liter of water and starting two liter per hour. So nursing can give it with syringe every few months and your endpoint. Again, every medication you need to give, you need to have an endpoint. The endpoint is to have a clear uh, fluid. 
<clears throat> so uh, again, one of the other elimination of the drugs is enhanced elimination. Um, you have three things you can do to eliminate these drugs is um, multi-dose activated charcoal, which is MDAC. It's simply you give uh, one dose of activated charcoal, 50 gram, and then after two hours, you give another 25, another two hours, 25 as a maximum. This is indicated in certain drugs like carbamazepine, phenobarbital, or thiophilin. Urinary alkalizations, mainly for salicylate. If you're suspecting salicylate overdose and you did a level and was quite high, so you can start your alkalizations by giving sodium bicarb polis of um, one to two millimole per kilogram IV, and then start infusion. Your endpoint is your uh, pH is more than 7.5. Um, the last one is hemodialysis, indicated for. Uh, again, some medications, if you fail all the measures, um, toxic alcohol, salicylate, thiophilin, um, metformin, and it's quite common, and lithium. Antidote, again, I'll not go for each single antidote. It's, uh, there are a lot, um, but my advice, you will have some time to figure out what is the antidote. Um, if you know the medications, it's simply you can call the poison or you can uh, search it and you will find the antidote and you can then get the antidote with the proper dose and give it. But oh, what you need to remember all the time is the thing you can do straight away, like dextrose, naloxone, sodium bicarb, um, did you bind? This is need to remember calcium, uh, yeah, and high dose insulin. This is the most common antidote you're going to use in ED. Think ahead about your dispositions. <clears throat> if you are working in a remote area, and for example, you have a, a patient with intentional overdose of metformin, especially with dialysis. And of course, you're less likely to have a dialysis unit in your hospital. So once you um, know this patient having a metformin overdose, so you need to start your measures, give you some bicarb, but you need to get this patient uh, retrieved to a specific hospital straight away. So you need to do your phone calls very early, arrange your transfer so the patients can survive. Other than this, the option is patient can stay for an ED in a short stay for a few hours, up to 24 hours, if your ED have capability of short stay for most of the drugs and medications. Most of them, the drugs need like six, eight hours, 12 hours uh, telemetry and observation. Of course, if the patient is intubated or need um, vasopressors or high risk uh, or high alert medication infusions. This patient will be in ICU. Um, again, based on your facility, some, some patients can be admitted to the medics or um, acute medicine or HDU. Uh, so think which is a private environment this patient needs to be. Think about retrieval early as possible. And of course, uh, any intentional overdose in the psychiatric review to make sure he's been um, probably reviewed and assessed. So let's go for this second exercise. Um, we have a 23 female, she's um, around 100 kilogram. She's brought in by ambulance uh, after intentionally ingesting a 48 tablets of 50 milligrams uh, amitriptyline. It's around two gram plus. Um, she took it one and a half hours ago. She comes ED. She's blood pressure is fine, 150 over 80. Um, respiratory rate is 40. Oxygen saturation 96. And uh, she's slightly drowsy. You did your ECG and it shows sinus tachycardia 126 uh, with dominant R wave and AVR and QR is prolongation and QT is 118. So with this, she's confirming that she's definitely having the amitriptyline. You've got some uh, pathognomic ECG changes. Now you go for RR as I did. So put all together, recess. First of all, this patient is 
slightly drowsy. Um, but blood pressure is fine, heart rate is slightly tachycard, exaggerating well, but she's tachyblic, uh, maybe she's acidotic. Um, so nothing to be done for airway, nothing to be done for breathing or circulation. Um, and this IPT is slightly drowsy but maintaining her airway. So you think about detect and treat. So first of all, you need to make sure blood sugar is fine. Um, you get blood gas to look at the acid base and uh, give the rhesus antidote. Well, the rhesus antidote for this is sodium bicarb. So this patient need to have a sodium bicarb. I'll start with one to two million more per kilogram IV. And then once you're doing this, you're doing uh, again your risk assessment. This is the second R. She's having more than 10 milligrams per kilogram, and we know more than 10 milligrams per kilogram for uh, TCA is quite toxic. So these patients may end up with seizures, may end up with VF and VT. If the QRS is continuously progressing, she's just having this one half an hour ago. So we still will see, we're expecting now more symptoms and signs will appear in the next few hours. Um, so now I'm, I know this patient definitely needs an ICU. Um, supportive care, she may need some antiemetic if she started to vomit. She may need some fluids if she's dry. Um, she's still awake, so I can put her in recovery position if she's maintaining his airway. Investigation, again, parastomal level, it's a silent killer. Pregnancy test, any uh, child being paired lady coming with toxins or suspected overdose, you need to check your pregnancy because you need to make sure the kids which is coming is safe. Like if you discover she's pregnant and she's um, having a major depression and uh, uh, suicidality, you need to make sure she's, this baby is, child protection is aware and this patient, these kids will be okay. Decontamination, okay. So now one of your colleagues come and said, yeah, I think this patient is coming with one and a half hours. She's having a toxic dose. Let's give her activated charcoal. My answer would be no, because she's drowsy and you need a fully cooperative conscious patient to get the activated charcoal. This patient likely will be intubated because you will need to hyperventilate this patient. Once you get the intubation and uh, airway is protected, now you can get some activated charcoal in NGT. There is no rule for enhanced eliminations. Antidote, we we'll talk about sodium bicarb already. These positions, we said, yes, this is a very high toxic dose. This is likely to be admitted to ICU. So I talk to the poisons. I get some advice. I talk to my ICU um, team if I'm in which area. So I need to transfer a patient for high-level care hospital. And this is this is RRSI did, which is easy um, uh, approach to get patients uh, treated. So my take home points is, uh, again, trust yourself. You are the best one to can deal with toxicology in a hospital. Uh, think patient, resuscitation first. If the patient needs a resuscitation, if it's undifferentiated, resuscitate first. Try to support the hemodynamics. If you patient is stable enough, you get time to risk assessment, call your points at center, get some advice, get a senior doctor to help you. Think all the time about what the worst case scenario could be in this case and think ahead about the disposition. My last thing is, this is a pretty handy uh, application, which is free. Um, it's called Austin Health uh, Toxicology. It's very easy and it's, it's, it's made of like a flashcard for um, most of the uh, toxins and drugs and medication you can use in AD. Um, yes, it's, it's mainly Australian versions, but some of this can still be applied overseas. Um, and yeah, thank you. Any questions? Hey, okay. uh, thank you, Dr. Muhammad, for this uh, amazing uh, uh, presentation. Um, toxicology, what makes emergency is emergency because it's a unique area and um, hopefully uh, we, we are considered to be the experts here. I have one question here that says, uh, if a patient comes with a history of multiple drug ingestions 24 hours ago and comes to uh, your ED, after 24 hours, virally stable. Do you do they need to admit? Will you admit a patient with polypharmacy ingestion 24 hours ago? If you have lucky enough to know what's these medications, and 
you do your research or you're calling the poison center because more than 24 hours, more likely all the medication already were off. And now you need to ask why he's coming to ED, like after 24 hours. Um, if it's an intentional overdose, I will get psych review first. Um, get a, uh, my observation done, an ECG done, a blood gas done, and everything's fine, that's okay. So it's not an easy answer, yes or no. Uh, 24 hours is enough for most of the drugs to wear off. So like you will find the patient stable. Yes. Um, uh, unless it's a longer acting medications and yes. uh, the, the, there's a concern about the, uh, it's a case by case scenario, but uh, the, the, norm, the norm is no, as long as everything is stable and her labs and ECG is normal. Yes. Uh, a second question, how long uh, would you monitor a patient with benzodiazep acute benzodiazepine overdose? How long will you monitor them? I will monitor them Till they are fully awake and conscious and can walk in ED and eat and drink. So, few hours, six hours, eight hours doesn't matter. Um, once the patient is fully awake, can walk, can eat, can drink, I will discharge. But again, um, what the causes for his presentations? Okay, okay. Um, I would just I would like to add one thing: is that uh, benzodiazepines are short, intermediate, and long acting. So as long as the the high flap is already passed, so they are uh, uh, basically clearing out and uh, yeah. accordingly. You, as you said, uh, you can monitor them for between two three hours up to eight hours. It depends on which type of benzodiazepine has been ingested. Uh, let me add a few tips here and uh, advices uh, since we have some gathering here. Uh, it's purely based on an experience. Uh, toxicology cases uh, are always uh, surrounded by drama and emergency. Mm -hmm. You've got the family members, police, people, investigators coming in and out. So please, and you, they usually arrive, arrive late and uh, you rarely would know what kind of medications has been ingested. This is from experience. So make sure to take, you know, as much as investigations as possible. Like um, if you finish your basic labs, you know, the, the CBC, the chemistry, the LFT, the troponin, everything, take a couple of few red top tubes, uh, okay? And, and take any body secretions you can obtain, the, like a urine sample, uh, if you would intubate the patient, get a gastric, uh, you know, aspirate just to kind of keep it on the side because uh, it might unfold later on and you get the police and the uh, law force enforcement asking you what happened to this patients because they usually don't do well and it, it has its own seasonal um, um, seasonal I, I would call it uh, a height where you know in, in a new year or uh, any um, major um, uh, occasions you, you got a lot of uh, teenage with uh, all the goodies and, and the overdoses. Uh, one thing more I would like to add is that the pediatrics, they do have different uh, body weight distribution and they do have different, uh, you know, physiology. So uh, what uh, could kill them is much, much lower than what could kill an adult. So in pediatrics, you get the uh, parents, which are very concerned. So you, you got to be very cautious and, and, uh, and uh, basically uh, passionate when, when you approach pediatric patients. Last thing uh, is that if now we have um, a toxicology uh, poison control center and toxicology hotlines. So make sure uh, you call them just to document that you have a, a, such a case that you need to, even though you have done what need to be done, uh, basically, you, you just take a second opinion and document it in the chart. Uh, just uh, came up to my mind, um, uh, our regulations in MOH, they uh, mandate all of us to document uh, thoroughly in the chart and fill up the uh, Poison Control Center uh, form because uh, it's uh, one of the uh, reportable cases. Uh, thank you very much again, Dr. Mohammed, uh, for this yeah. insightful um, 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 presentation. Our next speaker is Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Abdaziz Shehri. Uh, is one of our uh, senior emergency consultants from Medina region, Saudi Arabia. He will speak to us about snake bites and scorpion uh, uh, stings. So, Dr. Abdaziz, please. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much and appreciate uh, this uh, uh, involving me in the symbolism of uh, Saudi Germany uh, uh, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, 
uh, appreciate uh, your attendance. And usually, I, I usually I like uh, the attendance, physical attendance in the lecture because I want it uh, and reactive and hyperactive lectures. Nowadays, it's a virtual, and I need uh, Dr. Muhammad Talat, please, if you can help me to share the the lecture and also uh, some some interaction during the the, the lecture. Uh, we will talk today about snake bite and scorpion sting. Uh, it is. Uh, we will start by this picture. Dr. Mohammed, can you share? Did you hear me? There is, there, there is a sharing, uh, Dr. Abdul Aziz, at the end of at the bottom of your uh, screen. I'm Just trying, to, but uh, not coming with me. Already, I yeah. tried to check Dr. Tarat for that. Right. Let me try again. Okay, sorry for that, but there is a problem in the bottom. Doctor, send it to me, please. I sent it to what's to send it to me. Okay. I will send it to the symposium. Okay, send it to the group. Did you get it? Yes, Doctor, one minute, please. We'll talk uh, till we get uh, the, the slides on. Uh, snake bite and scorpion sting. We see some cases coming to our emergency department and uh, unfortunately our physicians are hurry to give antivenom for the patient without making sure what is the type of snake and is it venomous or not. And also uh, scorpion nowadays uh, actually, in Medina, we, we see a lot of, of uh, uh, scorpion sting more than uh, uh, snake bite. Dr. Abdul Aziz, uh, you can start now. The, we shared that slide. Okay. Please, Mr. Fassel, make it uh, 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 Okay. Make it with the full screen, please. Full screen. Not coming with me. Really, I have no experience with that. It's coming, coming back. Sure. Share screen. Be there for you. What about the crisis? Uh, مشكلة ما جت معي في الشاشة as a full يعني. I don't know why. Back, back. Okay, fine. Uh, the first thing, so we will talk with the epidemiology of uh, snake bite. Uh, it's it's uh, getting uh, around to uh, 10,000 emergency department visit. Uh, according to the report, it's collected from 2001-2004. And uh, actually, third of that, it's a venomous uh, uh, snake. And uh, 59 of that cases, it is resulting in admission. 
ريتل سنيك اتس وان اوف ذا فينوموس سنيك اند اكشولي ات از ذا موست كومن كوزنج فور ادمشن اند ذا ريت اوف ادمشن اتس هاي وذ ذات سنيك اند ذا لينف اوف ستي ات از تو تو ثري دايز سنيك بايت سيفيريتي I'm trying to to go down with the with the slide, but it's not coming. I don't know what is the problem. Uh, say next, please, and uh, this link will 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 go to the next slide. Say next, please. Next, uh, snake bite severity. Uh, the factors of the of the uh, the severity of the snake bite. Uh, uh, it is uh, from the amount of the venoms injected, the composition of the venoms. And also uh, the uh, uh, victims, the the size of the body and the pipe location and the comorbid condition. Next, uh, we have uh, two family of the venomous uh, snake. It is uh, the first one is uh, Cortarina family, uh, which is uh, bit fibers. اللي إحنا بنعرفه في السعودية هنا أبو جنيب واحد منهم اللي هو bit fibers. where uh, also uh, rattle snake or cotton mouth it's one uh, members of that family uh, how we can detect this is it's a venomous uh, uh, snake or not uh, we can if we can take uh, take that snake kill him and bring him to the emergency department we are we are uh, so lucky to see it as a physician to detect this is a, a venomous uh, snake or non venomous Uh, from the size uh, of uh, and shape of the body, shape of the the head, triangular or uh, triangular shape of the head, and also elliptical eyes uh, shape, tails is rattle, uh, non venomous. Uh, it is round head and round eyes and no rattle there. Uh, Elabida family, uh, which is coral snake. Uh, that's one. It is uh, coming from a labida family. It's coming colored. It's a very nice color, but it is no uh, about its bite. It's not that uh, you will not be happy if such uh, snake biting you. Uh, how we can differentiate it from uh, non venomous one? Uh, the color, uh, if the uh, yellow color coming. Uh, Directly uh, after the uh, red color, it's uh, it's a venomous one, and uh, it is uh, the, there is a special sentence on that. Uh, red next the yellow kill the fellow. Okay, we'll go to the coral snake. Usually, I have problem in in my. Okay, next next doctor. Okay, next. Next, more. The next slide. Okay. Bree Hospital. Bree Hospital Care. Uh, actually, uh, there is no any uh, special measurement recommended to be taken in the field, and there is no any actual uh, evidence for the the effective effectiveness of this all measures taken before transporting of the patient because that. Uh, don't delay the patient transportation to the uh, next facility. Uh, uh, there is uh, something called the pressure immobilization, which is as pre uh, dressing, pressure dressing, uh, put it on the pipe area and going proximally up with uh, splinting of the extremity uh, uh, at the side of the pipe. Uh, uh, in Australia, because the healthcare facility a little bit away from uh, the 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 hospital facility, the site of of what is getting the 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 field of uh, snake bite, they are using the tourniquet. In in America, they uh, they didn't use it because it is nearest and short time for transportation. Because that the the recommendation from Australia. They said put a tourniquet and take the patient to the hospital, but in America they are not going with this recommendation. Uh, at the end, uh, the most important things, it's uh, treatment provided at the field, not showing uh, any benefit because that don't delay the transportation 
to the hospital. Next, emergency department evaluation. Next, please. As usual, we have to start with ABC, airway, breathing, circulation. It's the most important in, uh, for any patient coming to the emergency department to deal with him, to make sure about potency of the airway, about his breathing, about circulation, put the patient on a bed, make sure about his uh, vital sign, uh, make sure the patient is not in shock. And uh, uh, after that, you can marking and timing the leading edge to detect the severity later on and the grade of the severity according to the scale of severity. Circumferential measurement above and below the bite. Antivenom will not reserve anaphylaxis. If the patient is coming in picture of anaphylaxis shock, try to treat him uh, as anaphylaxis. Uh, don't depend on antivenom to reverse the anaphylaxis for the patient. Next, history. History is very important uh, to take the history as the, the regular history, but there is some point you have to, uh, to, to add it. It is uh, tetanus toxoid status for the patient. Uh, history of brief snake bite is very important because it's, uh, the patient uh, may be his predisposed for anaphylaxis uh, reaction via the immunoglobulin taken from the venous from the brief exposure. Uh, description of the snake and the shape of the snake, it may helpful at some point, and you are lucky if they bring it with them or uh, they have a picture for them. Uh, some uh, snake uh, make a metallic test, metallic test, uh, which, which is uh, Abu Janib. Usually the patient is coming with metallic test and pulses of the tongue, uh, uh, which is bit fiber uh, snake. And uh, this is it's very important uh, to can, can guide you to the type of the snake. Next, physical examination. Standard uh, physical examination should be performed for patient. Uh, start uh, with, with examination, but you have to stress more in cardiovascular, respiratory, neurology, hematologic, and dermal and musculoskeletal. Uh, serious symptom is very important, like syncope, shock, and the respiratory failure, and can be occur at time of attendance. Next, please. Cardiovascular effect. We see it a lot with bit fiber. Bit fiber cause hypotension. What is the cause of hypotension in, in bit fiber? Uh, type of snake bite uh, in, uh, it is affecting in mainly the bit fiber, it is affecting on the hematological cause bleeding and the other thing increase membrane permeability and increase uh, third space fluid accumulation and because that uh, decrease the intravascular volume and causing hypotension. Uh, the best intervention or the inotrope or vasopressor in such condition is epinephrine. Respiratory effect, it is rarely happened. We saw it more with the stain, but we can see it in respiratory, direct respiratory effect. Uh, pites in the neck and the head, it is rarely found less than 1%, but can uh, obstruct the airway and early intubation. We have to anticipate uh, uh, the, the airway uh, problem and we have to intubate the patient early. And unfortunately, the antivenom will not re reverse the respiratory failure in, such, in, in any patient coming with respiratory failure. Uh, neurological effect, it's coming with the coral snake or uh, Majala uh, rattle snake. Neurological examination at essential assessment. And we have to frequently repeat neurological examination. And uh, we can see a patient with neurological effect. Uh, can uh, the symptom will start after 12 hours of the bite? Because that we have to repeat examination of the neurological system. Hematology, 
when the bit fiber, as we said before, decrease fibronegin and thrombocytopenia from and increase platelet cons consumption at the site of bite. Next, please. Musculoskeletal effect. Next. Uh, musculoskeletal effects happened from rhabdomyolysis. Significant rhabdomyolysis has occurred after coral envenomination. Next, please. Next. Okay. Okay, after uh, coral snake envenomation, severe diffuse fasciculation can occur to uh, muscle breakdown and cause for us rhabdomyolysis. Diagnostic study, uh, all uh, recommendation, uh, there is no, no specific recommendation for a specific type of test or blood test in the emergency department, but you have to direct your uh, investigation and imaging also according to the uh, uh, clinical examination, sign and symptom, you found it in your patient. Uh, next, please. Next, please. Coagulation study. Bit fiber envenomations should uh, undergo coagulation testing. Coral snake, uh, uh, Not we will not uh, go with coagulation study because it's not uh, useful as it is not causing uh, any uh, problem in uh, in coagulation profile and not causing uh, any bleeding. Monitoring and observation. Next, please. All patients with suspected of pit fiber should observe for eight to 12 hours to monitor development of symptom induced clinical effect. A leading edge, what we said about the leading edge, it is you have to mark it uh, to see the site of edema, erythema, swelling, and also the compartment syndrome. And you have to frequently measure it Q15 to 30 minutes. Next, please. Treatment. Uh, treatment uh, of snake in emergency department, snake bite in the emergency department, uh, determined by three categories. Determine whether the envenomation has occurred, over antivenom treatment is indicated by history and signs, symptom, and laboratory test. Disposition of the patient according to response to the therapy and also sign and symptom during the observation time. Next. Antivenom. Uh, usually it's going with bit fiber. The first uh, study is going with the bit fiber, uh, venom and antivenom. And more than mammalian local, uh, minimal local swelling, uh, rapid progression of the swelling, uh, it's causing for us to start uh, antivenom. Evidence of hematotoxicity, elevated BT, low fibrinogen, thrombocytopenia, systemic sign of toxicity, hemodynamic compromise, or neurological toxicity, late or recurrent new onset, uh, there is a special things regarding uh, the scoring of sign and uh, sign of, of uh, uh, snake bite. Uh, uh, unfortunately, there is no uh, uh, clear evidence for scoring of symptom or sign coming with the, uh, with with your evaluation for the patient. Uh, a lot of uh, treatment aspect, it is coming by uh, expert the, uh, uh, and mild to moderate evidence. No strong evidence saying we have to do this. Next, please. Antivenom, when we are giving the antivenom to the patient, 
we have to give him a polar doses from four to six files. This is by recommendation to control the initial symptom. What is the meaning to control? If there is pain, resolving the pain. If there is swelling, to stop the swelling, not to progress more or do, to decrease it. If there is any symptom of bleeding, to stop bleeding. If there is uh, any uh, sign of uh, third space fluid leak, we have to, to control that. Uh, this is what's the meaning of controlling of initial symptom. Patient with life-threatening uh, condition like cardiovascular collapse and shock, uh, we have to load him with a uh, high amount of files from 8 to 12. Uh, and uh, then uh, regardless uh, the age of the patient and regardless the body weight of the patient. Uh, after that, we have to, this is the loading dose, the maintenance dose, it is two vials, Q6 to three uh, hours, to, uh, this is by recommendation, to prevent the recurrence of the symptom. Uh, if the control symptom does not occur after the first loading dose, you have to load the patient again and give him a, a, another four to six vials, uh, this is uh, by recommendation. Uh, unfortunately, as we said before, the antivenom, it did not reverse the neurological symptom, not reverse the, the necrosis happened to the skin, and it is not affecting uh, on treatment of anaphylactic or anaphylaxis happened from the snake bite. Uh, next, please. Contraindication. There is no uh, there is no true contraindication for antivenom, and uh, there is some uh, side effect or reaction to antivenom, which is called serum sickness. Serum sickness. It's fever, uh, arthralgia, uh, arthritis, and it is can be treated by uh, uh, IV uh, corticosteroid and, and IV antihistamine. Uh, there is a special uh, population, uh, like a pregnant lady. Uh, what about antivenom in pregnant lady? It is uh, grade C type of medication. And uh, uh, actually, we have to wait the risk and benefit but there is no clear contraindication to give it to pregnancy apart from it is grade C. You have to uh, see uh, the, the risk and benefit, and usually uh, we have to give. About the pediatric age uh, also, uh, there is, uh, we have to give it to the same dose of adult. There is no difference in the dose because you are giving it against the venoms, not regarding the body weight of the, the, the victims. Uh, also, there is a special concern about patient who is an anticoagulant. Patient in anticoagulant, uh, unfortunately, uh, according to the report, they are showing more uh, serious side effect or more serious complication after snake bite. They are getting more. Uh, but, uh, they are getting more easy to to uh, lose blood, and they are more easy to hemorrhagic shock uh, because that uh, any patient uh, he is going hematological symptom. He need uh, close follow up even after discharge uh, to do for him coagulation profile Q4 to uh, Q2 to four days to make sure about uh, his coagulation profile and hematological, resolve his hematological symptom. Uh, this is about snake bite. We'll go to the scorpion sting uh, quickly. Scorpion sting, we see it a lot. Next, please. Next. Yes, I like this picture. Scorpion sting, uh, it's, it's uh, more common. Uh, we see it in our emergency department more than a uh, snake bite. And uh, the victims, 
coming with the symptom, usually pediatric patient, and uh, they are coming with, with a really uh, serious symptom. There are more than uh, 1,000 species of scorpion, about 100 species are found in India, and uh, venoms of, of uh, scorpion is clear and colorless. Uh, it, it's uh, classified to neurotoxic and hemolytic, also like snake bite. Toxicity sometimes is more than snake, but it is in small uh, quantity of injection, and it is potent because it is uh, addressing the adrenal and uh, releasing a lot of catecholamine. The mortality uh, it's it's more high in children. Uh, it is, it's uh, how we can differentiate. There is patient come to our emergency department and saying uh, that I feel something stinging me. It is a sting, it is just a point and some redness around it. Apart from snake bite, it's you see the fang to, 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 to uh, opening on the skin. Uh, the symptom it varies from nausea, vomiting, ex extreme restlessness, fever, paralysis, convulsion, coma, cyanosis, respiratory uh, distress, respiratory uh, distress uh, related to pulmonary edema. Death can be occurred in hours after pulmonary edema is uh, in, in, in the patient and also can cause cardiac failure. Uh, the treatment of uh, scorpion, uh, we are using nowadays the antivenom, the same as snake bite. There is no specified antivenom for snake or, or, or scorpion here in our MOH facility. But uh, outside, uh, uh, I think there is, if, if anyone has this information, but for uh, uh, Snake, we can we can we can use the the both uh, anti the the same antivenom for all snakes. Th thanks so much and uh, appreciate uh, your uh, listening to my lecture. And if there is any question, thank you very much, Dr. Abdelaziz. Um, if we do have any uh, questions, please and the question and answer. Um, <clears throat> I don't see uh, actually anything. Um, just one hand uh, raise. So um, I would like to thank you, Dr. Abdelaziz, for your uh, nice lecture. Um, I would I would rather prefer the lectures to be written in the question uh, Q and A, please. Um, if you can write any questions for Dr. Abdelaziz in the Q and A, please Q and A section. That will be great. Okay, uh, for the sake of time, um, are we, uh, can we take uh, one more before the break, Dr. Muhammad? Yes, Dr. Yes. Okay, thank you, Dr. Abdelaziz, very much. Appreciate your uh, lecture. Uh, next um, lecture will be presented by Dr. Ahmed Ghanim. It's about intubating the hypotensive patient uh, in emergency. Uh, so the floor is yours, please, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you, Dr. Rahani. Uh, my voice clear? Yes, yes, please, go ahead. Uh, dear my friends and colleagues, it's an honor to be with you today uh, in this uh, symposium of the emergency medicine. Uh, we will talk and we'll discuss about an important topic, which is a rapid sequence intubation of the hypotensive patient in emergency department. This moment is very scary when you see a patient who is hypotensive and uh, uh, shocked and you need to do rapid sequence intubation to him. This is a very scary and very challenging because this scenario may lead to cardiac arrest of this patient on the spot. Why? Be because of a lot of things, which is first, this is the first thing is the underlying disease and the inadequate resuscitation. Also the cardiodepressant effect of the induction agents. Also the decreased venous return due to the increased intrathoracic pressure resulting from the positive pressure ventilation. 
and also the hemodynamic effect and of worsening acidosis during apnea. In this, sorry, in this picture, you can see with me when the patient put on the post-pressure mechanical ventilation, the, in, the intrathoracic pressure will increase. This will lead to decrease the preload. So the blood which is pumped to the lungs will be decreased. So the blood which is returning to the left side of the heart will be decreased. So the left uh, ventricle filling will decrease, resulting in circulatory collapse. This circulatory collapse will lead us to cardiac arrest. So what we need to know now today is the, our objectives to know what is the indication for intubation in the emergency department of hypotensive patient, what is the steps of the rapid sequence intubation, and the HOP patient, what is the meaning of it, and the three, three steps of intubation of the, the hypotensive patient, which is resuscitate before intubate, pre-treatment the medications, and post-intubation. First, we'll go to the indication of intubation. Indication of intubation, when there is airway problem, when there is a failure of airway maintenance or protection, or when there is a failure of ventilation and oxygenation, and if it is anticipated in the clinical course of the patient, if the patient with uh, head, severe head trauma and he is uh, vomiting and we uh, afraid of aspiration, so we need to do the intubation. But what is the steps of rapid sequence intubation? The seven Bs, the uh, famous seven Bs. First, preparation. Second, pre-oxygenation. Three, the pre-treatment. Four, positioning. Five, paralysis and induction. Six, place the tube and the proof of placement. Seven, post-intubation management. Then we will go to the HOP patient. There is three patients who we are scary of intubating them in emergency departments. First, the hemodynamically unstable or the hypotensive patient. This patient who is in shock, best measured with the shock index, heart rate uh, divided by the systolic blood pressure, when it is over 0.8, this patient does not tolerate the medication of rapid sequence intubation well. And often they compensate once the thoracic cavity is pressured and venous return falls quickly followed by cardiac output. The second patient, is oxygenation or oxygenation. When, the, when we start the rapid sequence intubation with the BO2 below or SCB2 below 93%, this patient has less apnea reserve. Okay, the, the third patient is the pH when the patient is acidotic. Our lecture today to talk about the hemodynamically unstable or the hypotensive patients. First, we'll go with the resuscitate before intubate. Preparation, prepare well, get all your stuff together, the most senior who will take care. Everyone briefed on the goals and the steps of uh, what we are doing. Medication are available and being drawn up. And your plan B is ready, the surgical airway is ready, the bougie is ready, style it everything, the LMA, whatever you may need, you have to prepare it before you start. Pre-oxygenate, pre-oxygenate this patient well before you start, give him reserve for the apnea time, and with non repressor mask, a 30 liter per minute if available, uh, plus the nasal cannula at 15 liter per minute. Yeah, minimize the use of the non-invasive ventilation because it will pressure the thoracic cavity and exacerbate the hypotension before you intubate. Pre-treatment, this is the main area where one delays the intubation before it. We need to concise and be meticulous in this area. Why? In pre-treatment, we need to establish two IVs 
a lot wide poor IVs. If not available, insert the IO. And if time permits, put a, a crash central line off in the femoral one and give fluid. Give the patient fluid before you intubate and give the uh, pretreatment and the induction and the sedative uh, medication. Give him reserve to circulate. Uh, also, if the patient is hypotensive from hypovolemic shock of blood loss, the patient come after trauma or something like that, give him blood. Even a small amount will differ for this patient. Okay. Then, the pressure. So, we inserted the IV cannula. We gave him the pre-oxygenation. We started the fluid or the blood then it is time for the pressor. Pressor will give us reserve for not to be hypotensive during the induction of intubation, uh, of that uh, medication. Uh, infusion of a bolus of isotonic fluid would be prudent period to starting the pressor. Norepinephrine is the most commonly recommended pressor in both a septic shock or the undifferentiated shock. Epinephrine is typically the second pressor recommended, and if there is severe tachycardia happened, we may use the uh, phenylephrine. May need to give a push dose pressure. I want to talk about here about something. The peripheral use of the vasopressor. Studies shows that 90% of the complication happened from the infusion of vasopressor in the periphery, periphery happened after four hours. And also 85% happened when it is inserted below the anticubital fossa. So if we inserted an IV above the anticubital fossa, so either anticubital fossa or in the external jugular, and minimize its duration below four hours, so we will minimize the complication. So don't be afraid to give the vasopressor in the peripheral line. This is the, uh, the vasopressor infusion. Second thing, if you can't do or something like that, you can give the push dose pressure. What is the push dose pressure? Push dose pressure, we can, it have to be in hand once you start the intubation process. Take one ampoule of epinephrine and nine cc of normal saline with you, and we can, you can give push doses of epinephrine to give your patient a push before you give the sedative and the uh, muscle relaxant. And you can, the, action, the recommended dose is one to four cc every 30 to six seconds will be typical. Second, next, we will go to the positioning. Positioning of the patient would be as usual in the rapid sequence intubation. Except in the, the obese patient, we will put the patient in the ramping position, ear to the sternal notch position with head elevation. And then induction and paralysis. Ketamine is the induction agent of choice in shock patients. Uh, we may use the etomidate, but because of the adrenal insufficiency effect of this etomidate, we may prefer, we prefer ketamine over etomidate. We use the low sedative, high paralytic protocol. We give low sedative uh, doses of ketamine or etomidate if we uh, use it, and high paralytic dose because we studies show that when we give high doses or the recommended doses of ketamine, the patient experience hypotension and circulatory collapse. The shock patient. we are talking about the shocked patient. We start ketamine with 0.5 mg per kg or 1 mg per kg, and it may repeat the 0.5 mg per kg uh, if the patient needed or not sedated well with the uh, first dose. And if we use etomidate, we use etomidate with 0.15 mg per kg, not the recommended dose is uh, the 0.3. Because shock is a natural anesthetic, the patient 
always who is shocked will come with confusion and disturbed conscious level. Right. Okay, then we'll go to the paralytic agent. We have two paralytic agents, the chromium and the succinylcholine. At uh, is, the shock stage will increase the onset of uh, start of the either the chromium or the succinylcholine. So we, we, we give the paralytic agent in high doses. We give the chromium in uh, a large dose with 1.6 mg per kg or succinylcholine with 2 mg per kg. Two, uh, the chromium is better than succinylcholine in the shocked patient because in this high dose, the onset of chromium is as the onset of uh, succinylcholine, but it gives us a long, uh, uh, more time of apnea. So it is better to use uh, chromium. First, it was presented at the social media and the critical care conference in 2013. Cliff Reid called this combination of low dose ketamine and high dose rocronium rock ketamine. So, the induction and the biases, we prefer ketamine in a low dose 0.5 mg per kg, and we use rocronium in a dose 1.6 milligram per kg. Next, we will go to to place our tube, wait at least a full minute before attempting, attempting to intubate and, and to allow the paralysis agent to fully work and provide the best intubating conditions with a fully paralyzed patient. Verify blue, uh, the tube placement and with end tidal CO2 detector or continuous uh, end tidal CO2 monitoring, auscultation, and chest x ray. This is before the intubation. What after the intubation, what, uh, what is the setting of the ventilator? The ventilator setting is very important because it, any increase in the intrathoracic pressure which will, which will happen may lead to decrease the uh, preload and decrease the left ventricular filling and circulatory collapse. So the ventilator setting is very important. We start the tidal volume with low tidal volume, 6 ml per kg. Uh, we don't want to the destination of the lung because it will impair the venous return. And we will start FI2 if the patient is, was hypoxic before intubation, we will start with uh, 100%. And we may decrease till we uh, uh, reach the 30 or 40%. The beep, the positive end expiratory pressure. Start with zero. We don't want to increase the intrathoracic pressure. We don't need to decrease the venous return. So start beep with zero. Hopefully, when if the patient uh, yeah, add pressure and uh, gain pressure, so we can add the beep uh, accordingly. Respiratory rate, we're starting with the 14 or 16 minutes is a reasonable starting point. Look for the flow time curve and the plateau pressure and adjust accordingly. o 2 what is the o 2 What will happen? Normally, as you see in this uh, graph, this is the flow over time graph. The normal patient is in the dotted graph. Patient take inspiration, then he fully expirate, then he starts the next inspiration. But if there is air trapping, what will happen? The patient will take the inspiration, and before the patient fully expirate, the next the next inspiration will start. Mm -hmm. What will happen? That will happen lead to air trapping and increase the positive end pressure. Uh, and expiratory pressure, increasing the intrathoracic pressure, decreasing the preload and the circle and the circulatory collapse. Top. Okay, what we will do? What we will do is to first decrease the respiratory rate and or one can increase the expiratory time by giving the patient more time to expire by changing the IE ratio from one to two to one to three or one to four, giving the patient time to fully expirate before the beginning of the next inspiration. 
this will lead to decreasing the air trapping, decreasing the O2 beep. Then we will go to the plateau. Plateau pressure, we, this is, represents the alveoli pressure. We will put the patient, when we put the patient on mechanical ventilation, there is an inspiratory pose put on in the uh, ventilator. After we push this inspiratory uh, pressure uh, uh, button, the patient, the ventilator will measure the pressure, the plateau pressure. This is after the inspiratory hold, patient, after he's taking his full press, push the button, it will decrease a slight bit, then it will be stationary. This is the plateau pressure. Plateau pressure, as we said, it represents the alveoli pressure. The pressure drops a bit from peak inspiratory to plateau pressure. That correlates off with the alveolar pressure. The goal is to be below 30 centimeter water. If the plateau pressure is more than 30, one can be excessive distending the alveoli and worsening the venous return. This is a serious problem and we have to solve it. So what to do? What to do? Reduce the tidal volume. If you are starting with 8 ml per kg, go for seven or six, remeasure the uh, pressure plateau, the, the plateau pressure, keep reducing until the plateau pressure is below 30, or you hit a four ml per kg then you may need to accept some permissive hypercapnia. To sum up, it is a very challenging skill. We need to prepare well. Don't forget the three phases of intubation, the hypotensive patient. Phase one, before intubation, resuscitate before you intubate. Insert the two IVs or IO, if time allows central line, Start the fluid bolus uh, or the blood component. Start the vasopressor infusion or the push doses. Then phase two is the induction. Use the low sedative, high paralytic protocol. Ketamine 0.5 mg per kg, rocronium 1.6 mg per kg. Also, after intubation, the ventilator setting, start with tidal volume 6 ml per kg, B zero, respiratory rate 14 to 16, avoid the auto beep and avoid the high plateau pressure. If any questions? Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for this uh, interesting uh, lecture. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I, I don't see any questions or any raised hands. So uh, uh, thank you very much for this insightful uh, targeted lecture. And uh, let's break up uh, for prayer and for rest okay. for 20 minutes. Okay. And uh, we'll reconvene at, um, <clears throat> at 6.35. Uh, so back okay. at 6.35 with the next lecture. Thank you so much. Okay. Dr. Dr. Ahmed and Prof. Hani, at the end of this of the session, I want to thank uh, uh, all our uh, uh, doctors and speakers. Uh, we are honored by having you. And I want to big thank to Dr. To Prof. Hani to moderating this session. Thank you, Prof. Hani. Thank you very much. See you soon.
Hello. Hello. I'm sorry.
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Welcome back everyone. Now with Dr. Hisham Ashraf, he uh, emergency of uh, in, consultant of emergency medicine in UK. Uh, welcome uh, Dr. Hisham with uh, uh, the topic of uh, undifferentiated uh, shock, the secret receiver. Go on, Dr. Hisham. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ahmed, for the introduction, and thanks a lot, everyone, for the invitation. Uh, as always, it's a great honor to uh, to be included in your uh, symposium. Uh, can I just check? Can you all see my screen as full screen? Yes, Dr. Yes, 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 yes. Dr. Amazing. Thank you so much. So, um, so to start with, um, uh, my name is Hisham Ibrahim. I'm one of the emergency medicine consultants in uh, Hampshire hospitals in United Kingdom. And um, today I've been uh, given the task to try to cover shock in less than 50 minutes. So I'll try to do my best, uh, but that would be a big challenge because shock is a massive topic. So what I will try to do during the next um, half an hour to 50 minutes is to uh, cover some, um, some pathophysiology of the shock to get some more deeper understanding of, uh, of how shock happens and what happens exactly there. Uh, so we can have a general approach about how to handle shock when, when those patients present um, undifferentiated. So um, plan is um, a bit of chat about the shock itself. Then at the end, we're gonna cover a couple of cases so we can apply what we've uh, talked about during the day. So let's have a bit of an overview about shock first uh, before we move on. The, the first question to be asked is, do you really think that it is important to, uh, to talk about shock now? Is it important to know about shock? If you're not really sure about the answer to this question yet, uh, all what I'm gonna say is uh, I've been following the talks um, of the symposium since yesterday, and I don't really think that there was one single talk that the word shock has not been mentioned in. So this is how important shock is. Shock is a very common presentation in ED. You cannot really practice emergency medicine without really yeah. mastering how to <laughs> shock patients. Uh, sorry, can I just ask for everyone to be... <laughs> Okay, so let's move on. So uh, shock is, is the final common pathway before cardiac arrest generally. So every cardiac arrest patient that you're gonna see probably have been through some sort of a shock before arriving uh, to you and reaching the cardiac arrest state. And if you do not treat shock, then the next step is gonna be multi-organ failure then death. But the good news is it is a reversible condition. So if you can detect it, um, early enough and you start treating it appropriately, then uh, you can reverse it back. So to start with, let's start with the definition of shock and see what shock means. Shock is basically a circulatory phenomena. It is a failure in the circulatory system. It is an abnormality in the circulatory system that results in an inadequate organ perfusion and uh, tissue oxygenation. So you've got a failure in the circulation resulted in inadequate perfusion to the organs and, uh, and loss of uh, tissue oxygenation. And this in turn will result in failure of the aerobic metabolism and uh, the start of anaerobic respiration at cellular level. And this will result in lactic acid production. And then this will uh, progress to cause cell death and multi-organ dysfunction. How to recognize the shocked patient? This is it might sound like a silly question, but actually this is a really hard question to answer. Shock actually may um, really be, may not that easy to, uh, to spot uh, all time. And sometimes to, uh, to diagnose a case of shock, it is not always that simple because there is no single vital sign or lab test on its own that can definitely diagnose shock for you. So for example, shock can present uh, typically with hypotension and decreased cardiac output, but in some types of shock, the blood pressure will be normal and the cardiac output may even be high uh, and it is still a shock state. So this is, the, this is the hard bit about diagnosing and spotting the shocked patients. 
So shock can be broadly divided into two big groups. The first group is shock with an impaired cardiac output. So the heart itself is not pumping enough blood peripherally. Or it can be with an impaired systemic vascular resistance. So the heart is producing, is pumping enough blood, but actually because there is a significant vasodilatation, the, the, the whole circulation is just pulled peripherally away from the heart. Those ones with an impaired cardiac output can be because of either decreased preload, so the venous return to the heart is decreased, or decreased myocardial contractility. There is a good preload, there is a good venous return, but the heart is unable to push hard, or actually the heart is doing the best, but there is a significant resistance afterwards. There is an increased afterload that is causing the shock. Regarding this one, where the other one with the impaired systemic vascular resistance, actually the severe vasodilatation is the reason uh, for the significant reduction in the afterload. And that's why those patients are shocked. So let's give it some examples to make it more um, understandable. The examples of shock with impaired cardiac output. First one, as we said, the first reason is to decrease the preload. This can happen with hypovolemic shocks, uh, whether you've lost blood, like what happens in trauma patients, for example, or you've lost fluids, uh, like the patients with diarrhea and vomiting or patients with burn. Um, so with those ones, you get the shock secondary to hypovolemia, secondary to decreased uh, the preload. The second cause is decreased the myocardial contractility, which can happen in cardiogenic shock, like what happened with massive MIs, for example. And the third cause is the increased afterload, which can happen with the obstructive shocks like massive pulmonary embolism or tension pneumothorax or cardiac tamponade. So as a general rule, shock patients with impaired cardiac output, they are usually called peripherally due to the cutaneous basal constriction. So just bear that in mind as an important clue for your shock patients. The other group, uh, is the shock with an impaired systemic vascular resistance, the severely vasodilated patients. And we call this type of shock the distributive shocks. The first example of this is sepsis. Uh, so septic shock patients are severely vasodilated uh, in association with severe infection. And the anaphylactic shock, where they are severely vasodilated secondary to a massive histamine release, or the neurogenic shock when they're vasodilated because of a loss of a sympathetic tone. So these are the three examples of the distributive shock. And again, as a general rule, shock patients with impaired systemic vascular resistance, they're usually presenting with warm peripheries due to the cutaneous vasodilatation. So that is another important clue that you can use to differentiate the type of shock. Okay, so commonly affected organs are, and, and those are the organs that you're gonna focus on in your clinical assessment. So skin, is an important organ here. The skin is usually cold, but it can be warm, as we said, and, um, and it will be sweaty. Kidneys, uh, usually with shock, there will be a renal shutdown. And if the urine uh, output is less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour, be worried. This is a bad sign. Next is the heart. So the circulation, as we said, you can have hypotension with tachycardia but this is not um, an absolute uh, thing. You can, uh, you can have shock without this. And, uh, and you might get chest pain uh, with your patients if they hypoperfuse the coronaries. And lastly, the CNS, the brain, those patients can present with disturbed conscious levels secondary to the circulatory failure. How about the shock index? So shock index is an important term, an important tool that you need to know about because it will help you a lot diagnosing shock patients. Basically, you need to divide the heart rate by this systolic blood pressure. So you're not using the heart rate only, you're not using the systolic blood pressure, or you're using both together. So let's assume that your patient has got a heart rate of 70 per minute and a systolic pressure of 110. If you divide them by each other, you will get 0.6. Your shock index is 0.6. Normal is from 0.5 to 0.7, so you're fine here. What if the heart rate goes up like what happens with shock and the blood pressure goes down? This total number will go up, and this is bad. 
So let's assume that your patient's heart rate now is 100 divided by a systolic pressure of 100. If you imagine this patient, 100 of heart rate is not that bad, not that worrying. Systolic pressure of 100, again, not that bad. It is not ideal, but it's not too bad. But if you put them over each other to get the shock index, the shock index is going to be 1. 1 is a bad shock index. Anything above 0.8 is bad. So actually, this is far more sensitive uh, to spot shock uh, rather than isolated vital signs. So that's the whole point. This is a very useful tool to understand the tachycardia within the context of blood pressure. And it's shown to be more sensitive uh, than vital, or vital signs alone in diagnosing occult shock. And as I said, a shock index above 0.8 is bad. So let's, uh, let's move on to some pitfalls in diagnosis of shock. So relying solely on the systolic blood pressure as an indicator of shock, this can delay the recognition of shock because it can take long time for the blood pressure to go down. And it might be uh, just before the cardiac arrest when you get the significant drop in the blood pressure. So waiting for this to happen is not a good idea. Never underestimate the shock index. Take it seriously because it will uh, give you better sensitivity in diagnosing and spotting those patients. And tachycardia and skin vasoconstriction uh, are the earliest measurable circulatory signs of shock. So I always say this to my uh, junior colleagues, always feel the hands and the feet of your unwell patients. You will, you will spot a lot just by doing this. And lastly, never underestimate sweaty patients. So as a, as a general rule in emergency medicine, um, sweating in ED is bad. I've, I've never come across a sweaty patient in the emergency department and it was a, a benign thing at the end. Um, so it will be a, a heart attack, it will be NMI, it will be a sepsis, it will be shock, it will be thyroid storm, it will be something bad. I know I work in, in, in United Kingdom and the weather here is, uh, is a bit cold, uh, but even in Egypt, I worked there for years and sweating in ED is bad. So I always say, if your patient is sweaty, you should start sweating. So early, uh, So elderly patients may not present uh, with tachycardia at all for various reasons, whether this is a decrease in the physiological reserve or because they're already on medications that will stop their heart going up, uh, the heart rate. So by all means, don't wait for the tachycardia in elderly patients to recognize that they are unwell. And uh, massive blood loss may produce only slight or no decrease in the hematocrit and the hemoglobin concentration. So we sometimes get this from our junior surgical colleagues when they always ask in trauma situations about what's the hemoglobin doing? And actually, if you think about it, the hemoglobin is measured as milligram percent or milligram per deciliter or uh, 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 gram per liter. So it is a ratio of the amount of hemoglobin you have in your body in relation to the uh, plasma volume. When you lose blood, you lose whole blood, you lose the same amount of hemoglobin and the same amount of plasma with the same ratio. So if you measure the ratio that's remaining in the body, actually it will be the same. Then the body will try to correct itself during the shock state and will not be able to produce hemoglobin, but will be able to produce some plasma and you will start giving some fluids and that will dilute the remaining hemoglobin. So the drop in the hemoglobin and the hematocrit will happen late in trauma, will not happen early. So do not be falsely reassured by having normal hematocrit in a shocked trauma patient. So next is investigations for shocked patients. There are some general rules here. So investigation should be guided by the suspected underlying cause. So it is all about finding the reason for the shock rather than diagnosing the shock itself. So you do an ECG for the suspected MI, you do an ultrasound or CT for your trauma patients, you do an echo or CT for your massive PE, you do septic screen for your sepsis, et cetera. And there are certain investigations that are generic. You will do them for all types of shock because they are important to assess the severity of shock and to monitor the response to treatment, like the full blood count, the renal functions, and more importantly, the lactate which we'll need to focus on for a couple of slides. So talking about the lactate, lactate elevation suggests shock, but actually it, it is not uh, 
inclusive for shock. There are so many other things that can increase your lactate level. And that is without shock. Like, for example, being on metformin um, in diabetic patients or, um, or drinking alcohol, for example. So lactate doesn't always reflect tissue hypoxia. There are so many other reasons for the increase in lactate. And elevated lactate levels, generally speaking, uh, above four, um, this is associated with increased ICU admissions and mortality in sepsis, not in general. And normalizing the lactate in trauma patients and in post cardiac arrest patients, this is a really good way to monitor uh, response and it is associated with improved survivability. So a bit more about lactate. Elevated lactate shouldn't actually, uh, should be interpreted in um, to respond to shock and, and some other impending disaster. So when you see high lactate in an unwell patient, badness is happening. Do not underestimate elevated lactate in an unwell patient. This is either shock or is something else bad that is happening and you are missing. And we will come to this towards the end of the talk. So the other thing is normal lactate is not necessarily reassuring. There will be situations where you're gonna face shock patients with normal lactate. Don't be falsely reassured by this normal lactate in these situations. And lastly, having serial lactate can be very useful. What I always say to my juniors as well is, so it is like in ECGs, one ECG begets another, one lactate begets another. When you get one lactate, I would want to know what's the next reading. Is the lactate getting better? Is the lactate getting worse? An isolated number is not that useful per se. So again, some pitfalls in diagnosis of shock by lab. Uh, so labs can only suggest shock, but never exclude it. There is no single test that you can do and say, okay, test is negative, no shock. There is no such thing. A normal lactate is not necessarily reassuring because it can occur in some uh, cases of shock. And now we're gonna move on to the management part of it. So this will be my suggested approach to any undifferentiated shock. To be able to manage an undifferentiated shock, you need first to recognize it. If you do not recognize what you're dealing with, you will fail to treat. So first, recognize that you're dealing with shock. And second, support the ABCD, just like what we always do in, in the emergency departments. And the third step is to identify the cause to be able to treat it. So generally speaking, management of shock should be directed at treating the underlying cause and uh, to correct the physiological derangement. Regarding the ABCD approach, it is the same like any unwell patient. We're just gonna focus on a few things. So with the AMB, you would always give high flow oxygen. Remember that part of the shock problem is, um, is that the tissue are uh, not utilizing oxygen, not getting enough oxygen. Give them more oxygen if you can, and consider intubation and positive pressure ventilation, because that will dramatically reduce the work of breathing and decreases the oxygen consumption. But remember, we've just listened to Dr. Uh, Dr. Ghanim talking about intubating uh, shocked patients. It is not that easy. It is, a, a, it is a high risk procedure that you need to be very careful when you do it. Regarding the circulation, two lines of treatment. You give fluids, whether you're gonna give blood or crystalloids, depending upon uh, the situation, and, uh, and you consider vasoactive drugs. And vasoactive drugs are two big groups of drugs. They're either vasopressors or inotropes. The inotropes are the drugs that will increase the myocardial contractility, will act on the heart muscle to increase the contractility to improve the stroke volume, while the vasopressors are the drugs that will increase the systemic vascular resistance. These are drugs that will cause peripheral vasoconstriction to improve the blood pressure. To understand how they both work, you'll need to understand the receptors that they work on. And these are the common receptors that we need to be aware of to, be, to understand the actions of different vasoactive drugs. So we have the alpha-1 receptors, and any drug that works on the alpha-1 will get vasoconstriction as an effect. We've got the beta-1 receptors that, that are in the heart and um, in the cardiac muscles, and drugs working there on the beta-1, they 
The result is inotropic effect. So they will increase the contractility, will improve the cardiac output, and uh, they also have a positive chronotropic effect. So the heart rate will increase as well. Beta-2 receptors, they are uh, in the vessels and drugs acting on them will cause vasodilatation and bronchodilatation. And lastly, the dopamine receptors in the renal vessels and uh, drugs acting on them will result in splanchanic and renal vasodilatation. So these are the important receptors that we'll need to be, aw to be aware of to understand the different actions of vasoactive drugs. So let's talk about the inotropes. What inotropes do we commonly use in, in the emergency departments for shock patients? Commonest one is adrenaline. We also have the dopamine and we have the dopamine. These are the three common agents that we use as positive inotropic drugs in the emergency department. The adrenaline works by stimulating the alpha and beta receptors. So actually it has an inotropic action because of the effect on the beta, beta receptors and a vasopressor action because of the effect on the alpha receptors. The dopamine stimulate the dopamine and the alpha one and the beta one receptors. So again, it has both inotropic and vasopressor actions and it also releases noradrenaline from the adrenergic cells. So the dopamine is a bit of a special one. It works only on the beta receptors. So it acts on beta one and beta two. And the beta one action increases the heart rate and the force of the contraction. So it's a good inotropic drug, but the problem is the effects on the beta two, it will cause vasodilatation. So this might drop the blood pressure. So that's why this is a very good drug to use in low cardiac output states, like the post MI patients, for example, when the vasomotor tone is okay. So the problem is not vasodilatation because this will not fix it. And also that's why we usually combine it with noradrenaline infusion because the noradrenaline is a strong peripheral vasoconstrictor. So this will override the effect of the dopamine on the peripheral vessels. So these are the important inotropic drugs that you will need to be aware of. Moving on to the vasopressors, we've got three. We've got noradrenaline, and we've got the phenylephrine, and we've got the metraminol. The noradrenaline works on the alpha receptors, so it will cause severe peripheral vasoconstriction. That's why it's a great drug to use in hypotensive patients secondary to vasodilatation. That's why it's the drug of choice for sepsis. But the problem is excessive use of it will increase the afterload and decrease the cardiac output because you're increasing the resistance against the heart. This will also decrease the renal blood flow and decrease the splanking blood flow and impair the peripheral perfusion. Regarding the phenylephrine, it stimulates the alpha-1 receptors causing peripheral vasoconstriction. The metraminol, I'm not sure if it is available in Saudi Arabia or not, but it is a very commonly used drug in uh, in United Kingdom. And the beauty about it is it works on the alpha receptors causing peripheral vasoconstriction. So it supports the peripheral circulation and improves the blood pressure. Uh, but the bit about it is it can be given peripherally safely. So it's an easy drug to give and you can give it peripherally. You don't need a central line to give it and it works quickly. So that's why it's one of the preferred drugs uh, to be used in UK as a positive um, vasopressor agent. So generally speaking, my preferred in a shocked patient, if you're not sure what's going on, is adrenaline. Get dilute adrenaline and give it peripherally. It can be given peripherally. You don't need a central line for this. And it's got positive inotropic effect and it's got positive chronotropic effect and it's easy and quick to prepare and it's available in every single emergency department. So please familiarize yourself with adrenaline IV because it is a lifesaver. Some quick pitfalls regarding management of shock. So inotropes and pressors should not be used as a substitution to, for adequate fluid resuscitation. If your patient is empty, there is absolutely no point trying to squeeze them. Give them fluids. So fluid resuscitation first, and then start using the uh, inotropic drugs. So please ensure that your patient is adequately fluid resuscitated first, and then feel free to use your inotropic or pressors agents um, afterwards. So this was about the, the science, the scientific part of the talk, which I personally think is less interesting. Let's move on to what we do every day. We see patients. Uh, so let me take you through a couple of patients that I've seen 
over the past few years. And let's see what you think about those ones. So this is case number one. This was a lady who was 85 years old. She's been treated by her GP for four weeks because she's had shortness of breath, diagnosed by the GP as lower respiratory tract infection. Then after four weeks of antibiotic, the patient started going downhill and started to feel unwell. So the GP decided to ring the ambulance to refer her to the hospital for admission as sepsis secondary to a respiratory uh, infection. So the ambulance crew took the patient from her home and on their way to the hospital, the patient dropped her blood pressure. So they decided to change their destination rather than to go to the medical ward to come to the emergency department resource room to be assessed and treated by the medical team as a medically expected patient. The patient arrived to resource room. I was dealing with a patient in the cubicle next to her cubicle. Uh, I've been told by the nurses, she's here. We've informed the medical registrar. He's on his way to see her. We've just uh, cannulated her, took some bloods, and we did an ECG for her. Would you please have a look at the ECG uh, while we're waiting for the medical registrar to come? And this was my only involvement with this case. And just having a quick look at the ECG was enough for me to know why this patient dropped her blood pressure and what's the reason for her shock now. So I'm going to give you 10 seconds to have a quick look at this ECG and to say it out loud, what's wrong here? Okay, 10 seconds is too long. I'm not doing this. Let's have a look. The abnormality here is we've got a T wave invergence in addition to many other, other abnormalities, but the main ones are T wave invergence in the inferior lead, so 2, 3, and AVF. We've also got T wave invergence in the anterior leads, so V2 uh, to V5. When you see simultaneous T wave invergence in the inferior leads and anterior leads, in the same time, in a patient who's coming to you with this presentation, there is usually one thing that will cause that, which is acute pulmonary hypertension. And in the emergency medicine language, that will be massive pulmonary embolism. So this lady was found to have a bilateral submassive pulmonary embolism in her CTPA with right heart strain. And uh, it was a long discussion uh, with the respiratory team and um, between the respiratory team and the emergency medicine team regarding whether we thrombolize or not, but she responded well uh, to the IV fluids. And because of her age and her other comorbidities, the decision was not to thrombolize. And uh, actually she did really well and, uh, and she survived to discharge this event. So this is our first case that we're gonna talk about. So nice and easy. This is the CTPA of this lady. And as you can see, a nice, beautiful, big blood clot in her uh, left pulmonary artery. And actually there was another one in the right uh, pulmonary artery. This is quoted from Life in the Fast Lane, which is a really, really important uh, website that I would encourage everyone to look at. So they said there that the simultaneous T1 inversion in the inferior leads, 2, 3, AVF, and right precorded leads V1 to V4 is the most specific finding in favor of pulmonary embolism with reported specificity up to 99% in one study. If you do a quick literature review about pulmonary embolism uh, in relation to the T-wave inversion, you will find loads. This is one of the uh, articles that talked about this, talking about simultaneous T-wave inversion in anterior and inferior leads as an uncommon sign of pulmonary embolism. And if you focus here, one of the authors of this paper is the famous Amal Matu. Here is another one talking about acute pulmonary embolism with ECG changes mimicking acute coronary syndrome. And actually they reported a case of T-wave inversions in the inferior lead and anterior lead. And they've done a literature review about this. So that's an interesting read as well to uh, have a look at. Here's a third one coming from the American Journal of Cardiology uh, talking about the ECG differentiation between acute pulmonary embolism and acute coronary syndrome on the basis of negative T waves. So plenty of articles talking about this. Personally, I've seen it about six or seven times, and each time uh, it saved me. Uh, those are patients that can easily go down the route of acute coronary syndrome while they are actually having a massive pulmonary embolism. And this was our first case. Case number two is 
I think, more interesting. Case number two is by far, I would say, one of the most challenging cases I've ever had in my whole career. So, 90, so that was a 39-year-old male patient presented to Southampton University Hospital Emergency Department with one week history of feeling just generally unwell, seen by the GP, diagnosed him as having some sort of a non-specific viral illness. And uh, then he's had some diarrhea and vomiting for a couple of days. He walked into the department, didn't come in via an ambulance. He's had no past medical history at all. Looked unwell to the receptionist who saw him. So she felt that, oh, something is wrong here. So she called one of the senior nurses to see the patient. Um, and the nurse took the patient to the assessment room and took some ops. And the ops, the observations were, as you can see, so the patient was tachycardic and hypotensive. So the nurse felt that, felt really concerned and moved the patient immediately to the recess room. I was in recess that day. And uh, what we did immediately was we've got an axis and we've taken some bloods and, um, and we've sent a sample to, for a venous blood gas in addition to so many other tests, as you would imagine. The blood gas came as this. So this is the actual blood gas of this patient. And as you can see, the patient was acidotic with a pH of 7.16. The pCO2 of the patient is 7.4 kilopascals, that is 53 uh, in millimeter mercury. So that, will, uh, that means that the patient has got an element of respiratory acidosis. But remember that this is a venous sample, so it might, not be that high in the arterial one, but the, the bicarb is 18.2. The base excess is minus 10. This patient has got definitely a metabolic acidosis here. In addition, the blood sugar of this patient, the glucose was 11.7 .7 millimoles. So that is 200 millimeter, uh, milligram per deciliter. And look at the lactate. We've got lactate of 12 here. So, Seeing this was really scary to me. This is a patient who's got something bad going on that I'm not sure about yet. Looking at the gas, so a few things that I spotted. We, we know that we've got metabolic acidosis here because we've got low pH, we've got low bicarb and, and, and minus 10 base excess. We've got a blood sugar that is above 11, which is the cutoff to start thinking about DKA. So actually DKA was the first in my differential. So I've asked immediately for blood ketones. And we did the blood ketones and they were normal. So not a DKA case. Let's move on. The initial impression after DKA was that, okay, he's been having vomiting and diarrhea for two days. Maybe he's severely dehydrated. And to be honest, he looked dry to me. Uh, so probably he's got pre-renal failure that caused this blood gas to look like this. So I've immediately started some IV fluids and I've given some antibiotics in case we're dealing with a possible sepsis uh, because things was, were not that clear at this point. And, uh, and I started having taking detailed history and doing a detailed examination. Nothing in the past medical history, no travel history, no other findings on examination, no fever. He denied any chest pain or shortness of breath or abdominal pain. So literally I found nothing. He said that he vomited two to three times in the last 24 hours and opened bowel and had diarrhea about three times in the last 24 hours. And that was really weird because this is not enough for a 39 year old male to be dehydrated to the point of having a lactate that is that high and to have a pre-renal failure. So when I hear this, I started scratching my head thinking, I'm missing something here. So anyway, he also started complaining of lower back pain while he was with me in ED. So I've done a full spine examination and full neuro examination, thinking it might be a discitis, it might be a paraspinal abscess, and I found nothing. Everything was completely normal, not even tenderness over the spine. And this was the biggest surprise. Renal functions came back as normal, and I was like, okay, badness is there this patient is going in the wrong direction. I am definitely missing something here. So what I did was I decided that I will repeat the blood gas after one liter of fluid and recheck 
the lactate. And that was the biggest surprise. Lactate has gone up from 12 to 14, despite the IV fluids I've given, despite the antibiotics I've given. And at this point, I was really scared. At this point, I decided that, okay, I'm completely missing it. I'm losing this patient. I've asked one of my um, registrars who was with me in that shift uh, to come and have a look. He checked the patient with me. We both gone through, we've Googled all causes of high anion gap metabolic acidosis. And we've asked the patient about every single one of them. No toxicology, um, no history of alcohol, no, no nothing. We couldn't really find anything that would justify what is going on there. So my decision was two more tests that are still pending. I will get them and then I will involve every other hospital member in this case. I will call all the seniors in the medical and critical care teams because I'm losing this patient and I don't know what's going on. The two tests remaining were chest X-ray and an ECG. This was the chest X-ray that gave me the first clue about what was going on. So uh, this was an AP film. So I was expecting some cardiomegaly, but to be honest, not to this extent. This was just too big uh, for me to ignore as uh, in terms of the cardiomegaly, the cardiothoracic ratio. So that was the first clue. And the second clue and the final clue that gave me the answer to what's going on was in the ECG. So this was the ECG of the patient. So again, 10 seconds for you to have a quick look and see whether you can say it out loud, what is going on here. Okay, again, 10 seconds is too long. We're not gonna wait. This ECG has got three abnormalities that if you find next to each other, you should come up with one single diagnosis. The first problem in this ECG is the voltage. This ECG is of low voltage, as you can see here. Everything is tiny, despite the normal calibration of the ECG paper. So that's the first abnormality. Second abnormality, look at the rate. This patient is running too fast. So we've got tachycardia, we've got low voltage ECG, and we've got this, let's make it bigger. So if you look at the complexes in this ECG, they look really weird. Big complex, small, big, small, big, small. And that keeps happening. Big, small, big, small. Actually, this patient is probably in an SVT looking at this rhythm strip. So you've got a triad of low voltage ECG plus tachycardia plus what's called electrical alternance. When you see this triad, there is only one single diagnosis here, which is massive pericardial effusion. So uh, I've taken the echo probe at this point um, and I echoed this patient myself. And, um, and it was the biggest effusion I have personally measured. I've measured about four centimeters uh, of uh, big pericardial effusion in this case. So let's quickly cover the electrical alternance because it was the clue in this case. So electrical alternance is basically when you get normally conducted complexes with alternate height, as you've just seen. And it's produced by the heart is just swinging backwards and forwards within a big fluid filled pericardium. And it is seen in about 30% of patients with cardiac tamponade. So have a look at this. This is not the patient, but if you imagine that your probe is here, your electrode is here. When the heart moves towards the electrode, then that will give you a big complex because the distance is not big and there is no effusion in the middle. When the heart moves away from the electrode like in here, then you've got farther, far distance and you've got fluids in between. That will give you a small complex. And the heart, as you can see, it keeps doing this to the electrode, big complex, away from the electrode, small complex, and that keeps happening with every single beat. So that's the explanation of why we see this. So let's go back to our case and find out what happened. Few questions to think of about at the moment. First question is, okay, this patient has got an SVT. Can SVT per se, can SVT alone cause electrical alternance without pericardial effusion? The answer is, Yes, 
SVT can cause what's called pseudo electrical alternance. So you will see the exactly what you've seen, the electrical alternance that we've seen just with SVT without effusion. But SVT will not cause low voltage uh, in the ECG and it will not cause cardiomegaly in the chest X-ray. So uh, yeah, so we cannot really consider this the cause in here, even, uh, I mean, before the echo. Second important question here was, so this patient is now in a decompensated SVT. So shall we electrical cardiovert this patient? Shall we consider DC cardiovirgin? Because technically he's in SVT and he is hypotensive. Again, that was a big question that I have asked everyone in the team, including the cardiology consultant and the emergency medicine consultant who was there. And we all agreed that this will not be a good idea. We know that the SVT is probably because of the big effusion and because of all what's going on in the heart at this point. So the, and, and we know that the patient is shocked. So actually trying to sedate to cardiovert is not gonna help. What's gonna help is actually getting the fluids out. So we decided not to cardiovert this decompensated SVT. And the third question was, okay, shall we do the pericardial synthesis in the emergency departments or shall we take the patient to the cath lab to have it in a more controlled environment? And our decision was he survived a long time within the emergency department. Why don't we just push him quickly and take him to the cath lab and get it done in a more controlled environment um, with a caveat that if anything happens on the way, we will just stop and do it. So we all felt that the best place for this patient to be in is the cath lab and we decided to move. So I took the patient myself to the cath lab, transferred the patient there. On the way, the patient self cardioverted uh, his SVT back to sinus tachycardia, but he was getting just runs of non-sustained VT. I think I got older that day uh, and I've had, I've developed some extra gray hair with that patient. So uh, successfully we reached the cath lab, pericardial synthesis was done there and immediate one liter of hemorrhagic effusion came out and three liters were drained over the next 24 hours. Interestingly, uh, the lower back pain that the patient had in the emergency department improved to completely gone just with the fluids coming out of the pericardium. Until today, I do not have any clear explanation for this. It was a lower back pain, wasn't an upper back pain. And um, yeah, it just improved. So moving on, this patient had multiple investigations, including echo, CT, and MRI. He's had loads of blood tests, including HIV markers and autoimmune tests. And the outcome was he's developed cardiac sarcoma. So actually this was my first ever interaction with cardiac cancer. He's had a cardiac myosarcoma and he was also found to have liver, lung and bone metastasis. And this is a very rare condition. You can see the incident here. How, how low the incident is. Remember, we're dealing with a 39 year old male, normally fit and well, not on any regular medicine, no previous past medical history, and two young kids at home. The life expectancy with this tumor when it reaches that far is a maximum of six months. So this patient, I, I, I failed to follow up uh, to find out what happened later uh, to him. And I, to be honest with you, I intentionally tried not to follow up anymore um, because I didn't want to know what happens. Uh, but thinking about it now, I think this presentation was really confusing and challenging to diagnose. There was no clues anywhere in the history that I could use to expect that I'm going to end up sticking a needle into this patient's chest. And uh, this case was also very challenging to treat from the ED point of view because, all of the, because of all the complexities associated with the arrhythmias. So he's been in SVT, he's been in uh, non-sustained VTs, and that was all because of the precardial effusion and the myocardial tumor that was causing all this uh, myocardial irritability. Uh, and also because pericardial synthesis is not a procedure that we see or do that frequent in the emergency department. So when it happens, when you need it, you're not gonna find yourself skilled enough to do it 
because you don't do it that frequently. So it was a very challenging case uh, that I wanted to share with you just to give you an idea about how shock can sometimes be tricky when they present. So this is my learning points from this talk. I think shock is a very common presentation in ED that you must know about, and it can sometimes be really hard to diagnose and treat. And shock patients with impaired cardiac output, they usually present with cold peripheries. So please spend some time feeling the peripheries of the patients. And shock patients with impaired systemic vascular resistance can present with warm peripheries. So relying solely on systolic blood pressure is an indicate, as an indicator for shock can delay your recognition uh, of shock and can mislead you. So please use the shock index as a more sensitive parameter to uh, diagnose occult shock. And uh, remember that lactate elevation suggests shock, but this is, uh, it has a big differential diagnosis. It is not just shock. And remember that normal lactate is not necessarily reassuring. Don't forget that management of shock should be directed to treating the underlying cause and correction of the physiological derangement. And remember that inotropes and vasopressors should not be used as a substitution for adequate fluid resuscitation. And lastly, I'm a little bit biased because I like ECGs, but I think the answer is always um, in the ECG. We just underestimated. Uh, we just underestimate the ECGs. And that's been proven in the last two cases that I've shown you. And uh, this is it for me talking, and I'm now open for your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sham, for this valuable and uh, very informative uh, uh, lecture in a very challenging point. Uh, I don't see any questions. It's clear and uh, to the point. Uh, there is one question now. Uh, Still shock index dependable in old patients or who on beta blocker? So I, I would say this is, sorry, anymore? Yes, yes, go on. Yeah, so I, I would say, um, of course, any, anything uh, is, is dependent on the, on the situation. And in elderly patients, they have less physiological reserves. Uh, their ability to produce tachycardia is less. And they're usually on medicine, usually beta blockers um, that will stop the heart going up. So I would say it will not be that useful in these ones. So, uh, so you will need always to use your tools in the right context. And I would say just using the shock index in isolation um, in these cohort of patients will mislead you as well. But thanks for the question, it's a good one. Thank you, Dr. Hisham, uh, thank you. Let's go to Dr. Kausar. Thank you, Dr. Hisham. Thank you. Dr. Kausar, uh, our consultant of emergency medicine, uh, King Fahd Hospital. Uh, the talk is you. Are you with us? Ayo, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. You can Ayo. share your screen. Inshallah. Sharf, is she in or not? Ah, she in. Can you make it uh, full screen, please? Ayo. Ah, oh, yes. واضح كده. واضح واضح دكتور ابو شكرا شكرا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Uh, I am really honored to be invited to this uh, great uh, event the first uh, international symposium of emergency medicine uh, thank you uh, Dr. Khalid thank you Dr. Talat thank you uh, Mr. Ala for this uh, invitation and uh, I hope that uh, you will enjoy the topic uh, which will be updates in sepsis management in ED. The outline uh, of the presentation uh, is as follow, introduction, definition, initial resuscitation, uh, antibiotics in sepsis, hemodynamic management, additional treatment, biomarkers, and conclusion. Uh, I will start by reminding uh, you that in uh, 2017, almost 49 million sepsis cases and 11 million sepsis deaths were estimated to have occurred worldwide, accounting for about 20% of all global deaths. Unfortunately, sepsis remains uh, the most common disease related to high morbid mortality, 
in hospitalized patients contributing to about 33 to 50% of all inpatient deaths. The definition of sepsis. So what is the best definition of sepsis? As you can see here, we have multiple definitions which uh, were, were established by different guidelines and bundles. But the most relevant definition is that of the third uh, international consensus definitions for sepsis and septic shock, published in uh, 2016. Just uh, to uh, remind you that uh, 1991, it was the first consensus uh, conference, and for a long, long time, we spoke about SERS uh, sepsis, uh, which can um, progress to severe sepsis if it's associated with uh, organ dysfunction. And the ultimate step will be a septic shock, uh, uh, which is the sepsis induced the hypotension persisting despite adequate fluid resuscitation. These uh, definitions did not uh, change for uh, more than two uh, decades until 2016, when uh, SSC uh, sepsis 3 uh, proposed this uh, definition. Uh, sepsis now is known as a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response to infection. How to evaluate this, this, this life, uh, this organ dysfunction, sorry, uh, it's by using the SOFA score. If it is greater than or equal uh, to two, it defines that there is organ dysfunction. But in emergency department, it's not usually easy to calculate a SOFA score. For this reason, a new measure termed quick SOFA uh, criteria was, uh, was proposed and was also um, validated by many uh, studies uh, to identify patients with suspected infection who are likely to have poor outcomes. Quick SOFA uh, criteria are three, respiratory rate, uh, greater than or equal to 22, uh, altered mental status or a hypotension defined here as systolic blood pressure less than 100 millimeter of mercury. Septic shock is defined by persisting hypotension requiring vasopressors to maintain uh, mean arterial pressure more than 65 millimeter of mercury and also uh, having a serum lactate level more than two millimole per liter. Septic shock is associated with a very high risk of uh, mortality. This algorithm was uh, proposed by uh, sepsis uh, three uh, consensus uh, for patients in uh, ED. So uh, as you can uh, see from triage, if we have patient with suspect infection, we can calculate uh, rapidly the quick SOFA. If the score is more than two, we will calculate in the second step the SOFA score. If SOFA is uh, more than two, so we will uh, define uh, the patient as having sepsis. If, uh, if despite managing this uh, sepsis, uh, particularly with uh, giving uh, fluid resuscitation, patient uh, still hypotensive, and the lactate level is more than two. So here we are in the uh, definition of septic shock. But the problem is with this uh, sepsis three definition and algorithm is that uh, uh, they had lead to overdiagnosis, over treatment, excess cost, and also increase the rate of clostridium difficile infection. For that, uh, another update was was uh, published in 2021 by Surviving Sepsis Campaign, uh, International Guidelines for Management of Sepsis and Septic Shock 2021. Uh, uh, according to these new guidelines, it's uh, recommended to not use quick sofa alone to uh, assess the severity of infected patients uh, it must be uh, associated with other uh, tools like uh, SIRS, MUSE, NEWS, and also with physical examination. Uh, 
because it was uh, demonstrated that a quick sofa is less sensitive than having two of uh, four SEERS criteria. Also, quick sofa was demonstrated that it is less sensitive than MUSE or NEWS scores. Patient with sepsis uh, must be resuscitated rapidly and effectively. The transition of sepsis to serious illness uh, occurs during the golden hours. When definitive recognition of treatment, uh, definitive uh, recognition, sorry, of uh, the illness and starting treatment quickly and effectively uh, will uh, minimize the risk of complications. When we say golden hours, we will say early goal directed therapy. This uh, strategy or this protocol was uh, developed in 2001 by Rivers and all uh, after uh, conducting a single center randomized control trial of uh, EGDT versus usual care. And um, uh, at uh, this uh, moment, they demonstrated that the EGDT reduces the, the uh, hospital mortality by 16%. Here, just to uh, illustrate the algorithm of uh, EGDT, uh, uh, we have the pre-specified uh, targets. Um, we have the central venous pressure, the mean arterial pressure, the central uh, venous uh, saturation of oxygen, and uh, level of hemoglobin. Physician will uh, treat his patient according to uh, these uh, targets by giving fluid, uh, vasopressor, inotropes, transfusion, antibiotics, to, um, to, to try to be uh, uh, with, you know, with these uh, points of, uh, of algorithm. The early goal-directed uh, strategy uh, had been uh, adopted by several and multiple uh, institutions worldwide, but three strong studies and trials failed after to show lower mortality with EGDT. Hence, the appearance of this meta-analysis entitled Early Goal-Directed Therapy for Septic Shock, a patient-level meta-analysis, published in 2017 in the most prestigious journal, the New England Journal of Medicine. And this meta-analysis uh, included these uh, three subsequent government-founded uh, Multi-center randomized controlled trials process arise from minds. The goals for this uh, of this meta-analysis were to use pooled data from the three trials to determine the effect of EGDT versus standard care on 90-day mortality and also on uh, some uh, secondary outcomes, clinical and economic. From 2008 to 2014, uh, the three trials included more than 4,200 patients at 138 hospitals. Patient and care delivery characteristics were well balanced at baseline, as we can see in these tables. The primary outcome uh, was mortality at 90 days. And uh, as we can see in the kaplan meier curve, no difference between uh, giving EGDT uh, protocol or standard care according to this meta-analysis. Same also for secondary outcomes, no statistically significant difference between the strategy of early goal uh, direct therapy or the usual care. And the conclusion is uh, that uh, they confirm that EGDT as packaged protocol of care is not superior to usual care. But uh, we have until now uh, unresolved questions regarding um, the most effective fluid, the most vasopressor regimen, the role of hemodynamic monitoring in particular invasive, 
and appropriate targets in the resuscitation of septic patients. The new guidelines of uh, surviving sepsis campaign uh, established some answers for these questions. The initial resuscitation uh, should or is recommended to begin immediately when we are uh, when we have a septic shock or sepsis uh, suspected. It's uh, suggested to give the patient at least 30 milliliter per kilo of intravenous crystalloid uh, within th the first three hours. Uh, guidelines also suggest to use dynamic measures to guide fluid resuscitation. And one of these dynamic measures is the passive leg rising. We know that passive leg rising acts as a surrogate fluid challenge by rapidly returning uh, venous blood from the lower extremities to the central circulation, which will improve prelude and cardiac output. Passive leg rising was commonly used in ICU and emergency as method to predict fluid responsiveness in critically ill patients. This uh, systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized trials published in 2021 in the Journal of Intensive Care uh, Medicine uh, has as objective to determine if passive leg rising guided fluid resuscitation strategy improves mortality compared with standard care in septic patients. After screening, they retained five studies with a total of 462 patients in this review. And the principal or the main uh, result is that no uh, difference uh, significant uh, statistically between uh, using passive leg rising or not in the resuscitation of uh, ill patients. The conclusion is uh, that the passive leg rising guided resuscitation in septic shock patients may not result in a mortality benefit but uh, they, we need uh, most strong studies and uh, most large uh, sample to uh, establish a definitive uh, uh, st most strong conclusion. Let's move to antibiotics in sepsis management. Administration of antibiotics is a cornerstone of sepsis management guidelines. However, uh, there is considerable controversy in the target of uh, time to antibiotic therapy. So this uh, review published in, published, uh, sorry, in 2021 uh, entitled Impact of the Timeliness of Antibiotic Therapy on the Outcome of Patients with Sepsis and Septic Shock. And including uh, 35 uh, studies, two of them are randomized controlled, uh, controlled trials. Uh, the, uh, the, main, the primary outcome was uh, to compare uh, the uh, mortality uh, with giving uh, earlier or not antibiotic. So we have here uh, the longer the administration time, the higher the mortality the result is less clear when we uh, compare the delay of one hour. Also, it's not very um, established when we compare the delay of three hours. As a conclusion of this uh, review uh, meta-analysis, two thirds of studies included uh, reported the, an association between early antibiotics and mortality, but no robust time threshold emerged from these studies. Another uh, systematic uh, review and uh, meta-analysis that uh, appeared in uh, 2020 in the Annals of Emergency Medicine comparing mortality rate uh, in immediate versus early administration of antibiotic in uh, sepsis and septic shock. So this study was performed to analyze the association of immediate 
less than uh, one hour after onset versus early. So uh, between one and three hours after onset, antibiotic administration on mortality rates of patients with severe sepsis and septic shock. After screening, they retained 13 studies and the uh, main result is with pooling of uh, data, uh, they didn't show a difference in mortality between immediate and early antibiotic administration for all patients, sepsis and septic shock. For patients with septic shock, the same result, no significant difference between giving less than one hour or more. For severe sepsis, it seems that three hours is better, but uh, in the conclusion uh, for these uh, meta-analysis, for them, no difference in mortality between patients receiving immediate antibiotics for less than one hour compared with early antibiotics across patients, septic shock or uh, sepsis also. What does uh, this, the last guideline uh, say about this uh, point? Uh, it's recommended to administer antibiotic immediately, ideally within one hour, if we have possible septic shock with high likelihood for sepsis. For these patients, antibiotic should be given in the first hour. For patients with the possible sepsis, but without shock, it's recommended to conduct rapid assessment uh, for the likelihood of infection or non-infectious cause for this uh, critical uh, situation. For these patients with uh, possible sepsis without shock, uh, we start our uh, rapid assessment and also we should limit our investigation in uh, time. If concern of infection persists, the administration of antibiotic should be given within uh, three hours. For the third group of patients with low likelihood of infection and no shock, here it's recommended or it's suggested to defer antibiotics uh, while continuing monitoring of these patients. We decided to give patient antibiotic we try to choose the shorter over longer duration of antibiotic therapy. Uh, just to resume what I said, we have here shocked patients. The administration of antibiotic should be in the first hour. Patient is not shocked, we will assess the probability of sepsis. If it's definite or probable, Antibiotic should be given in the first hour. If it's possible, here we have time to uh, assess rapidly and to request some investigations. If we will decide to give antibiotic, it should be within three hours. Okay. Uh, another uh, point of uh, view is to compare Prolonged versus uh, intermittent beta-lactam antibiotics intravenous uh, infusion strategy in sepsis and septic shock. This is a meta-analysis uh, and uh, systematic review uh, and also trial sequential, sequential analysis for, of randomized trials uh, published in um, 2008. 2020 in Journal of Intensive Care. Beta-lactam antibiotic and uh, are commonly used in sepsis and septic shock, but there is doubt about intermittent infusion because the maintenance of concentration above minimal uh, inhibitor concentration is associated with bacteria clearance. For that, this uh, meta-analysis was uh, conducted. And uh, during hospitalization, they found that 21% died in the prolonged infusion versus 26% in the intermittent infusion. But the difference is not statistically significant. 
uh, about adverse events and also uh, occurrence of antibiotic resistant bacteria. No difference also between giving prolonged or intermittent infusion of beta lactam. The conclusion here is that prolonged infusion of beta lactam improve the target plasma concentration, improve the clinical cure uh, without increasing the number of adverse events. Uh, or the occurrence of antibiotic resistant bacteria, but uh, no improvement in hospital mortality uh, in the prolonged strategy of antibiotic. According to the last uh, guidelines, it's uh, suggested to use uh, the prolonged infusion of beta lactam for maintenance for, uh, to treat the patient. But this prolonged infusion should be uh, preceded by loading dose of antibiotic to achieve the uh, concentration. Uh, and it was demonstrated uh, according, to the, uh, according to the SSC 2021 that there is a reduction in short-term mortality. Uh, further researches, research are needed to evaluate the long-term outcomes and the emergence of uh, resistance. So here also just to uh, resume for patients with possible uh, septic shock uh, and uh, high likelihood for sepsis, uh, antibiotics should be given within the first hour. For patients with possible sepsis without shock, here rapid assessment and give antibiotic for within three hours if needed. Uh, it's uh, suggested to uh, limit the course of, uh, to limit the investigation in the time when uh, we are assessing our patients. For adults with uh, low likelihood of infection without shock here, it's not recommended to give antibiotic from the beginning. Prolonged infusion of beta-lactam is uh, recommended better than the, continue, the intermittent infusion. Another uh, cornerstone in the management of sepsis and septic shock is the hemodynamic management of the patient. When we say hemodynamic management, we say target mean arterial pressure which target to choose. So this study uh, attempt to answer this question. It's a randomized uh, clinical trial published in the JAMA in 2020 from, uh, from 10,000 patients eligible. They uh, included finally uh, about uh, 2,400 randomized to two groups. The main uh, outcome was the mortality at uh, 90 days. We can see here that there is no difference in uh, mortality at uh, three months, also at one year, if we can see, you can see here. Uh, as a uh, seen in this Kaplan-Meier curve. And the conclusion of this meta-analysis or this randomized trial, sorry, is that among patients uh, 65 years or older receiving vasopressor, permissive hypotension compared with usual care did not result in statistically significant reduction in mortality at 90 days. Uh, so the mean arterial pressure uh, uh, recommended now is uh, with a target uh, of 65 millimeter of mercury, better than having higher targets. Hemodynamic management will start by giving fluid for the patient which fluid we will choose. 0.9% uh, sodium chloride is the most common used resuscitation fluid. Most concern uh, has focused on the risk of development of acute kidney injury because of the high chloride content of saline. 
this uh, uh, this uh, randomized clinical trial, the split randomized clinical trial published in 2015, uh, compared the effect of uh, buffered crystalloid solution versus saline on acute kidney injury among patients in the intensive care unit. So uh, the study was conducted in four ICU, uh, in four ICU uh, in different hospitals. In um, this study, they randomized uh, about uh, 2,000 uh, and uh, 100 patients receiving normal saline or receiving uh, balanced, uh, balanced uh, saline. And uh, the uh, outcome uh, was uh, that in the balanced crystalloid, 9.6% of patients developed acute kidney injury versus 9.2% in the saline group developed acute kidney injury. But the difference is not significant. Also, the requirement uh, uh, the probability of requiring RRT, the hyperkalemia, the acidemia, the increasing of creatinine levels are uh, not significant uh, changes between the two uh, groups. And the conclusion is that using uh, balanced crystalloid compared to uh, with saline did not reduce the risk of acute kidney injury. Uh, six years later, uh, with the new guidelines. Now it's recommended to use crystalloid as first line fluid for resuscitation. But which fluid or which crystalloid to choose, it's suggested, not recommended, suggested to use balanced crystalloid instead of normal saline. Also, it's suggest, suggested, sorry, to uh, use albumin uh, if patient received uh, large volumes of crystalloid. The uh, second pillar of the hemodynamic management is administration of vasopressors. For patients with septic shock, it's recommended to use norepinephrine as first line agent or vasopressor. Dopamine, we have high quality evidence. Vasopressin, moderate quality evidence. Epinephrine, low quality evidence. Celepressin, angiotensin 2, very low quality evidence. Uh, if norepinephrine is not available at this time, we can use epinephrine or dopamine, but we must be careful uh, to the risk of arrhythmia when we are using uh, one of these two uh, vasopressors. And uh, we should to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, um, uh, to improve the availability of epinephrine. For patients with septic shock on norepinephrine, uh, and uh, not uh, reaching the target of uh, mean arterial pressure, it's suggested to add vasopressin instead of escalation the dose of epinephrine, of norepinephrine, sorry. So uh, if we are in the range of 0 0.25 to 0 0.5 mic per kilo per minute of norepinephrine, without uh, reaching the target, at this time we can add uh, vasopressin. If with these two drugs or these two vasopressor uh, map is not um, is still inadequate, it's suggested to add epinephrine. Telepressin is not recommended. So to uh, resume about vasoactive agents, the first line uh, vasopressor is norepinephrine. Ideally, uh, with the uh, throw central line, but if we don't have uh, central access, we should start with peripheral uh, big uh, size uh, vein. For patients with uh, septic shock on vasopressor, the target of mean arterial pressure is 65 millimeter of mercury, better than having uh, higher targets. 
Uh, also, it's important to consider uh, the possibility of invasive monitoring of arterial blood pressure. If uh, mean arterial pressure is still uh, inadequate with uh, low to moderate dose of norepinephrine, we will add vasopressin. For patients having uh, cardiac dysfunction related to the persistent uh, hypoperfusion or to a chronic uh, cardiac disease, uh, it's um, recommended to consider uh, adding dobutamine or switching to epinephrine. Here, it's important to know that uh, until now, levosimondone is not recommended uh, to uh, treat uh, septic shock with cardiac dysfunction. So we uh, should use dobutamine or switch to epinephrine. For uh, patients with the septic shock, it's uh, suggested to start uh, peripherally, uh, waiting for insertion of uh, central line. Uh, there is, until now, insufficient evidence to make a recommendation uh, on the use of restrictive versus liberal fluid uh, strategies in the first 24 hours after giving the initial resuscitation and our patient still hypovolemic. So it's not clear if we are for uh, liberal or for restrictive uh, fluid strategies, but I think it will depend on the comorbidities, on, on the assessment of uh, volemia by um, non-invasive uh, devices. And uh, at this time, we will decide uh, if we will be restrictive or uh, more uh, liberal. Uh, in uh, treatment of uh, sepsis and uh, septic shock, we have uh, to, uh, add, to add some uh, medication and some uh, therapy to prevent complications and to treat uh, comorbidities. Aywa? I continue? Continue, Dr. Continue. Shukran. We will start with hydrocortisone, uh, a large randomized controlled trial, including 3,800 patients, uh, the adrenal trial, which was published before the third uh, sepsis, before 2016. And uh, this uh, study demonstrated or showed that giving 200 milligram hydrocortisone per day by infusion uh, for seven days did not improve 90-day mortality compared to placebo. After the, after the apparition of the third uh, consensus with the sepsis 3, with the, the new definition of sepsis, uh, it was uh, conducted a post hoc analysis of this uh, adrenal trial to, uh, to, to uh, assess or uh, to evaluate the same endpoint when applying the new definition of, of sepsis uh, in this uh, adrenal trial population. And the uh, main or the primary endpoint was, as I said, mortality at 90 days. And we can uh, see here in this Kappen-Meyer curve that there is no change or no difference statistically uh, significant between giving hydrocortisone or giving placebo uh, by infusion for these patients in sepsis or septic shock. But now, in 2021, uh, the guidelines suggest to use IV corticosteroids, but not by infusion. It will be the total dose of 200 milligram per day uh, given for three or uh, for two or three times per day, but not by infusion. Glycemia and uh, sepsis. This review uh, published in 2000, uh, 2019 in the Journal of uh, Intensive Care Medicine, entitled the Blood Glucose Levels and Mortality in Patients with Sepsis, Dose Response Analysis of Observational Studies. This review included, uh, after screening and selection uh, of eligible papers, 10 studies. 
Here we have the different characteristics of these uh, studies. And uh, we can see here that the relationship between glycemia and mortality in patients uh, with sepsis and septic shock is not linear. Even uh, with uh, patients uh, having uh, established diabetes here, and as well with patient not known diabetic. The conclusion is that uh, among patients with sepsis, there was a U-shaped relationship between blood glucose and mortality for diabetic patients. Here it's like U. And a J-shaped relationship for non-diabetic patients. Uh, the blood glucose level between 145 and 155 milligram per deciliter corresponded to lowest mortality. So um, here we, uh, uh, we are illustrating the principle or the main guidelines uh, about uh, additional treatment. The first one is that uh, because we are speaking about uh, glycemia, if the glucose level is more than 180 milligram per deciliter, we should start our insulin therapy. To prevent uh, VTE, it's recommended to use molecular weight heparin, low molecular weight heparin over unfractionated heparin. It's not recommended to add mechanical VTE prophylaxis to pharmacological prophylaxis. Here we are speaking about acidemia and bicar. So for patients with septic shock and hypoperfusion induced lactic acidemia, it's not recommended to administer sodium bicarbonate therapy to improve hemodynamics or to reduce vasopressor requirements. But if patient has acute kidney injury associated, with severe metabolic acidosis, pH less than 7.2, it's suggested, not recommended, suggested to use sodium bicarb. For patients uh, in sepsis and septic shock, it's recommended to use restrictive transfusion uh, strategy over liberal transfusion strategy. <clears throat> it's, it's not recommended to use IV immunoglobulin, and for patients at risk to develop gastrointestinal bleeding, it's suggested to use prophylaxis of stress gastritis or stress ulcer. <clears throat> Sorry. So the, past, the last part is biomarkers and uh, sepsis. The most controversial uh, biomarker is lactate. This review and meta-analysis article published in 2017 evaluated the correlation between early lactate levels for prediction of mortality in patients with sepsis and septic shock, including almost 28,500 uh, patients with about 22 uh, studies um, after selection. This figure uh, shows that elevated lactate was associated with significantly uh, uh, increased risk of mortality with a positive risk uh, odd ratio and P is significant. The conclusion of this uh, meta-analysis is that elevated initial lactate level may prove to be a powerful predictor of mortality in septic patients. Uh, and uh, its prognostic, prognostic performance is optimal for clinical utility, but we need future larger and more adequately uh, prospective studies to, uh, to clarify the optimal cutoff of, uh, of this uh, biomarker with other biomarkers also. So now it's uh, recommended or it's suggested to measure blood lactate in patients suspected to have sepsis, it's suggested. Also, it's suggested to guide the resuscitation to decrease serum lactate if the first one wa wa was positive. 
Second, uh, biomarker procalcitonin. Multiple trials uh, have investigated the benefits of using procalcitonin to guide antibiotic therapy. However, conclusive evidence of the safety of this protocol remains insufficient. This recent meta-analysis was conducted to assess the effect of procalcitonin-guided antibiotic therapy uh, on clinical outcomes in ICU patients with infection and sepsis patients. Patient-level meta-analysis of randomized trial. Here we have 11 uh, randomized controlled trial retained after uh, selection of eligible trials. And the main result is shown in this, uh, in this forest plot. Uh, and uh, we can see that uh, antibiotic uh, therapy guided by procalcitonin is associated with the reduction of hospital mortality. Odds ratio is near to 1, 0 0.89, uh, uh, and P is 0 0.03. The conclusion is that procalcitonin guided antibiotic treatment uh, improve survival and shorter antibiotic treatment duration. But until now, recommendations are against using uh, procalcitonin as, uh, as uh, guidance to uh, give antibiotics for patients. We have multiple other biomarkers, uh, new, uh, still in uh, under uh, evaluation, like um, neutrophil CD64, like uh, interleukin 6, like uh, this one, uh, platelet activation with uh, this uh, NOx2. Uh, so they are under, uh, under uh, studies and until now, uh, no clear results about them. One of uh, promising uh, strategies is this trial, which is the first personalized medicine trial uh, published in the prestigious journal BMG. It's a double blind, placebo controlled, randomized, multi center, proof of concept, those finding phase two clinical trial to investigate the safety and toler toler tolerability and efficacy of Adre, uh, Adresi uh, Zumab, which is uh, uh, in vitro uh, adrenomedulin uh, hormone uh, given to patients in sepsis and uh, septic shock. Adrenomedulin, just to know that it's a peptide hormone, uh, which uh, can ameliorate and improve the endothelial function. Also, it has uh, vasodilatory properties. Uh, it uh, was demonstrated in the first phase that adrenomedulin uh, given uh, uh, for experimental uh, trials can be uh, beneficial. So uh, for that, this trial was conducted to, uh, to uh, evaluate the therapeutic use of this adrenomedulin uh, to improve endothelial dysfunction and to restore uh, and maintain uh, vascular integrity. Randomization is, uh, is detailed here. Also follow up for 90 days and uh, daily assessment the first seven days. Uh, results are not until now published, but it's a promising trial, I think. Uh, to finish, uh, take home uh, messages. The first one is uh, that Quixofa uh, should not be used alone to assess the severity of infected patients. Uh, give antibiotic immediately, particularly in patients with the sepsis and uh, with the signs of shock. Prolonged infusion can be uh, more than uh, intermittent. Balanced fluid may do better than normal saline. Uh, norepinephrine is the first line vasopressor. Uh, adding vasopressin instead of increasing high doses of norepinephrine is recommended if MAP is not uh, reached as a target of uh, 65. Uh, IV corticosteroids are uh, suggested for patients with septic shock needing uh, vasopressors and no sodium bicarb for hypoperfusion and used lactic acidemia. Uh, exception is if we have acute kidney injury associated with severe metabolic acidosis with uh, septic shock. Uh, as a conclusion, 
despite the exponential increase of knowledge in the last decades uh, about uh, pathophysiology of sepsis and septic shock. Unfortunately, uh, this has not translated to effective therapeutic interventions and this lethal syndrome remains to have an acceptable high morbidity and mortality. And thanks. Thank Hope you, Dr. Kasser. Thank you, Dr. Kasser, for this informative and uh, a lot of controversial topics. Uh, we have one question for you, Dr. Uh, what uh, you mean to uh, switch to epinephrine? Are you mean to be added with norepinephrine and vasopressin or instead mm -hmm. of vasopressin? Mm. Here we are speaking about, uh, speaking, sorry, about patients having septic shock with cardiac dysfunction related to uh, hypoperfusion or to chronic cardiac disease. For these patients, uh, if we are administering norepinephrine, we will add dobutamine. If uh, norepinephrine associated with dobutamine uh, is not uh, sufficient to reach our target of uh, mean arterial pr pressure, we will switch to epinephrine. So it will be epinephrine alone if norepinephrine plus dobutamine are insufficient. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kauser. Uh, and now we'll take a break uh, for 15 minutes and we'll go back with Dr. Henny. Uh, now it's uh, 8.10, so we will come back at uh, 8.25, uh, inshallah. Thank you. Shukran. Dr. Kauser, can you uh, stop sharing your uh, uh, screen, please?
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته ويلكم باك ناو ويل هاف ا توبيك ويز دكتور هاني باروم كونسلتنت اوف ايمرجنسي ميديسين اند هي از جروب ايمرجنسي ميديسين دايركت شيف ميديكال اوفيسر اوف ذا سعودي جيرمان هوستل ان سعودي اريبيا ويلكم دكتور هاني اند ذا مايك از يورز Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh jami'an. Thank you very much for hosting me uh, in this very uh, insightful and fruitful um, <clears throat> symposium. Um, I would like to update you. It's actually not an update rather than a thought organization of how to approach uh, atrial fibrillation in emergency. Um, <clears throat> Uh, most of my talk has been uh, updated uh, from the latest uh, American College of Emergency uh, Physician uh, updates uh, in 21, 2021, as well as the uh, European Association of Cardiology and uh, American Heart Association. So pretty much there's nothing uh, uh, much to know, but rather than uh, brainstorming and uh, opening uh, up uh, an interesting discussion with the group. So basically I'll, I'll be, um, I'll be uh, highlighting why AFib is, uh, is important and uh, then how to approach it and diagnose it. And then we'll touch up on uh, some management uh, strategies. And uh, my main focus is uh, on emergency. Uh, it's a pure emergency, uh, not cardiology. So uh, I'll try to cover the emergency segment uh, in this talk. Okay. So uh, it's a very common uh, arrhythmia in emergency. Tell me how many shifts uh, you guys cover and you don't, you don't encounter a natural fibrillation, an old uh, baba or mama with uh, rapid heart rate. And then once you do the ECG, you... Uh, you discover that she is in uh, uncontrolled AFib. So is that a new AFib? Is this is a uh, chronic uh, intermittent paroxysmal? Um, uh, I think for interruption, I think the presentation list is shared. Okay, I can stop sharing and reshare again, please. Okay, sure. technology glitches okay you're sharing stop share okay let's doctor بعدين لكم افتح الباوربوينت وبعد كده اسوي المشاركه okay do you see it now is it up لا مش فاهم الظاهر يا دكتور هاني ممكن حضرتك تقفل ستوب شيرينج وبعد كده تفتح المحاضره وبعد كده تعمل شيرينج شير اوكي Okay, is it clear now? Clear, Dr. Clear. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, so as I, as I was saying, uh, basically atrial fibrillation uh, uh, management update um, uh, is, is being put together from the latest update from the American, European, and American Heart Association. I'll be covering uh, the importance of AFib in emergency department and then how to diagnose it. And then uh, what's the appropriate approach from my uh, perspective in, in this regard? And then uh, basically my main focus will be uh, attended to uh, emergency department rather than uh, cardiology. So it's a very common uh, arrhythmia in emergency. It, it almost encounters every physician, every shift. So, uh, you know, um, provided this, uh, it should be uh, very clear uh, in, in their mind uh, how to approach it and um, uh, what are the signs of instability and uh, what are the management uh, sequence. Uh, basically, it accounts for two to four percent 
for those patients above 65 and uh, with the yearly increment of 2.5 uh, folds rise uh, as they grow older. Uh, and um, bearing in mind that these patients with AFib um, at a high risk of uh, stroke um, four to five times um, more than uh, regular population. So it's, it's a se serious matter that, uh, that warrants um, <clears throat> diagnosis and warrants uh, approach and disposition. Um, as well as uh, recognizing the prompt follow-up. So there's rarely uh, patients that been discharged from emergency without uh, arranging for appropriate follow-up uh, with cardiology or even admit them to uh, telemetry or high-risk uh, independent uh, observatory such as CCU. So let's begin with a common scenario. So you're, you're in, in your shift, you encounter a 28 years old woman was brought by ambulance uh, who suffered syncope. She was at work and she um, suffered syncope. She has no medical problems what, uh, at all. And she's been having this for the past few weeks. Now she's presenting with persistent chest pain. That's why she called uh, EMS and they brought her to your hospital. You do, you do a quick um, uh, ECG strip, you find uh, white complex irregular tachycardia with a heart rate of uh, 200 beats per minute. So you wonder, is it the, a supraventricular or ventricular uh, arrhythmia? Um, this is pretty common uh, bread and butter scenario that we encounter and face on a daily basis. So let me take you to a, a quick uh, definition. So simply, uh, it's uh, atrial fibrillation is um, is um, a, fo a form of uh, supraventricular tachyarrhythmia um, uh, with uh, irregular atrial uh, electrical activation and uh, consequently uh, contraction. Uh, the way it manifests on ECG, basically, it's uh, irregular, irregular RR intervals. Either this could be slow or could be fast, okay, with the uh, absence of distinct P waves and irregular um, atrial activation. <clears throat> now, as I was saying, is the most common sustained cardiac arrhythmia in adults with a yearly increment for those patients uh, above 60s and um, basically associates with um, substantial morbidity and, uh, and mortality. Um, the risk factors uh, associated with that is age, hypertension, diabetes, heart failure, coronary artery disease, uh, CKDs, uh, obesity, uh, obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, the Main um, risk factors that are highlighted in uh, blue are the major ones and the peripheral ones are, are uh, contributing. So aging, ethnicity, male sex, and genetics, uh, they play the major role in atrial fibrillation. Now followed up by all the other goodies such as vascular disease, um, acute illness or post-surgical procedure, a sedentary lifestyle or inactivity, uh, dyslipidemia, alcohol consumption, smoking, obesity, uh, COPD, respiratory illness, inflammatory diseases, and so on and so forth. So uh, modifiable, you know, uh, risks uh, when these patients arrive to, uh, to regular uh, internal medicine or cardiology, they focus on uh, all the um, um, endogenous cardiovascular modifiable uh, diseases such as vascular hypertension, okay, um, uh, or ischemic heart disease, um, also other things associated such as inflammatory from the previous lecture, they all basically uh, predispose to uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, alcohol consumption, endocrine disorder such as hyperthyroidism, diabetes, chromocytoma, and uh, neurological disorders such as subarachnoid hemorrhage. Not to forget the um, uh, the pulmonary embolism that is not here, but uh, I prefer to mention it because it is associated with atrial fibrillation and almost uh, about 13%. So new onset atrial fibrillation, uh, PE should be part of your differential diagnosis. Um, major five clinical um, presentations, they could be either be asymptomatic, 
uh, silent, basically, and, and, and people are wondering with it without having any symptoms, or basically they could be symptomatic coming in with palpitation, syncope, shortness of breath, fatigue, chest tightness, poor effort tolerance, dizziness, or they might become uh, destabilized, become hemodynamically unstable, um, where they become hypotensive uh, or get acute heart failure, uh, pulmonary edema, or uh, ongoing um, myocardial ischemia and cardiogenic shock. Or on the other spectrum, it, they could be hemodynamically stable. Now, the consequences of that, they, they could uh, uh, suffer death, which is 1.5 to 3.5 folds increase with increasing uh, uh, duration of illness. Or as I said, they could have uh, present with a stroke. And consequently, when you do ECG, you find that they're in atrial fibrillation. So 20 to 30%, uh, they present with, with ischemic stroke um, as, a, as, a, as a complication of uh, untreated or poorly managed atrial fibrillation. Um, LV dysfunction could be suppressed with uh, sustained atrial fibrillation in 20 to 30 percent. And uh, they could also suffer cognitive decline, depression, impaired quality of life, and they, um, they, they, they get hospitalized in 10 to 40 percent annually. So you, you can imagine the burden uh, and the, the financial burden of, of uh, poorly controlled AFib. Um, just for the sake of, uh, um, of simplicity, uh, there are too many definitions or, or subclassifications of atrial fibrillation. Um, but the, the one that made sense to me is the, uh, uh, the five classes of AFib. Um, I know too many people that use um, the three classifications, the four. I found the five is, is more convenient and it's adopted from the European Association. So uh, you have the first diagnosed, uh, perxismal, persistent, long-standing, persistent, or permanent. So depending on the duration and the onset. So if it's if it's never been diagnosed before, and there's no uh, irrespective of uh, the duration, uh, it's nominated as a first diagnosed, followed by perxismal. Uh, which is um, that terminates spontaneously uh, with or without intervention within seven days of onset. Persistent stays beyond seven days, including episodes that um, terminates by cardioversion. And uh, usually the definition is seven days or more. Longstanding is, uh, are those patients with uh, underlying AFib for more than 12 months or permanent. Uh, permanent is, uh, is the consensus between the treating cardiologist and the patient that there's nothing much other than uh, medication optimization. All terminology that you might hear, hear about it is um, basically lone AFib, valvular, non-valvular AFib, chronic AFib. These are all, uh, all, uh, are all terminology. Now let's say let's get back to the uh, to the uh, <clears throat> uh, to the previous scenario. Uh, so, well, what would be the approach in, in emergency? Uh, as any um, uh, emergency physician, basically you should under uncover the underlying causes of AFib. Um, if patient has a structural heart disease, um, endocrine, um, inflammatory conditions, uh, thromboembolic uh, causes. And then by the history, you should uncover, is it within or past the 48 hours, okay, in emergency. Now we're talking emergency, we're not talking cardiology. Now you should be able to uh, differentiate uh, and, and uh, make sure that this is uh, an AFib. Um, is it, um, is it um, as, as we mentioned before, uh, how fast it is? Is it regular, irregular, uh, narrow or wide complex tachycardia? And then uh, you should be, be able to order the diagnostic studies, including thyroid function tests, cardiac markers, and uh, dimer whenever indicated. And then you subcategorize your patient into hemodynamic stability, stable versus unstable, and we'll talk about them. 
and then uh, we will talk about uh, when to electrocute or uh, uh, start uh, electric synchronized cardioversion versus pharmacologic. And then we uh, will talk, touch up on the uh, uh, risk stratifying causes of um, when to um, um, when to use uh, anticoagulation versus when not to use anticoagulation, and what what comes after, what what, what determines uh, who should be discharged from emergency versus who should be admitted to the hospital. So as we said, the ACG is class one B. Basically, it's it's the gold standard of of diagnosis. Once you you uh, you do an ECG, you should be able to uh, to diagnose uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, and uh, as as we said, it's irregular irregular R waves. Um, uh, it could be as fast as two hundred. <clears throat> And as you can see here, uh, those um, uh, this rhythm above that shows atrial fibrillation, and um, uh, sometimes it should it could be fast enough that you cannot see a P wave. Uh, but this is uh, um, uh, an atrial fibrillation with uh, RVR or rapid ventricular response versus atrial flutter, with, uh, which is the sawtooth with different uh, block two to three, uh, one to three, one to four. Uh, block ratio. This is another one that shows a uh, rapid ventricular response in an atrial fibrillation. Um, in this subset of patients, you expect the blood pressure to drop because with the uh, rapid ventricular uh, response rate and uh, undetermined uh, underlying risk factors, uh, you tend to lose 15 to 20 percent of your cardiac output. So basically, um, uh, these patients, they usually become hypotensive and they become unstable. Uh, therefore, to, have, uh, to manage them, you have to have a very uh, robust um, uh, approach in an emergency. Um, now, another piece of evidence uh, from ASEP, um, um, uh, which is uh, a hemodynamic instability. They advocate that the uh, history of syncope, acute pulmonary edema, uh, ongoing myocardial ischemia and hypotension is, uh, is a mandate for uh, electrical cardioversion. It's a class 1B. Uh, while if patients with AFib and hemodynamic instability, uh, where there is a, a contraindication to electricity or uh, to sedation, uh, you could, um, you could uh, basically institute um, um, uh, chemical cardioversion uh, with amuterone. Uh, it's a class uh, 2B. Okay, so um, the, uh, the the first intervention of choice, just to recap, is um, electric cardioversion for unstable. For borderline um, um, unstable patients uh, and uh, those with contraindications um, or high risk patient, you could give it a trial of. Uh, chemical cardioversion. So, um, so this is um, um, a workup uh, scheme that uh, basically I encountered during my search. It's an updated uh, a a scheme from the American Association. Uh, basically, you got somebody with uh, a clear atrial fibrillation, narrow complex atrial fibrillation in less than uh, less than two days or forty eight hours. Okay. Um, and um, the question would be if he's adequately anticoagulated uh, for more than uh, four weeks. If yes, uh, and he's unstable, then you can sedate and electric electrically cardiovert him. And then you assign him to an observation unit or admit him to the hospital. If uh, he's at risk of sedation or has uh, any contraindications, you can consider um, um, a chemical cardioversion. Now, if, if successful in both scenarios and the back to sinus rhythm for more than one hour, okay, uh, you could control, write his regimen uh, with a calcium channel blocker, uh, consider cardiology consultation and um, start antiplatelet or anticoagulation as a bridge in the meantime. If nothing happens, despite of all trials, um, cardioversion, either chemically or uh, electrically, basically you refer him to cardiology and uh, get him into the hospital for uh, more observation and, and workup. 
this is another one uh, approach, um, pretty, pretty common in uh, American Heart Association. So basically when you get somebody who's um, hemodynamically unstable, basically you start two IVs, um, um, do, um, uh, do your uh, start oxygen, take 12 feet SCG, um, take all necessary lab that you want, including electrolytes and cardiac markers. And then uh, basically stratify this patient if he's in shock or uh, syncope, uh, cardiac ischemia or heart failure. If this is, yeah, this is deemed to be unstable, then you synchronize cardiovertem up to three um, uh, shocks if, um, and seek expert opinion. And then uh, basically if this patient is, um, um, you know, um, uh, QRS complex is, um, is narrow, i.e. Uh, less than 0 0.12, okay? Um, you, uh, you go through uh, vagal maneuvers if it's irregular, as if it's um, SVT, or if it's irregular, then you're probably dealing with atrial fibrillation. So basically you can use uh, diltiazem, beta blocker, um, um, if the patient is in failure, you could consider giving him uh, digoxin or amuterone uh, bolus, and then you start the infusion. Patient is back uh, with a sinus rhythm. Basically, you uh, you get him into the hospital, finish the rest of your workup. If if is is not converting, despite of uh, of uh, chemical cardioversion or rate control. Basically, uh, you could consider him as an atrial flutter and, and get him into CCU. Now, what about the broad uh, QRS complex tachycardia? If it's irregular, basically, you're probably dealing with two things, either uh, ventricular fibrillation, uh, uh, ventricular tachycardia, sorry, VTAC, or um, AFib with a burnt pathway. Uh, you could, there are tons of criteria, but what I could uh, uh, recall is the Brugada criteria that differentiate VTAC versus AFib with aberrancy. Uh, so um, if it's regular and deemed to be ventricular tachycardia and hemodynamically stable, basically you could um, certainly give him a muterone uh, bolus of a 300 then followed up uh, throughout the protocol. If the patient is known as an SVT and comes in with um, um, wide complex tachycardia. So it's most probably an SVT uh, with a burn pathway. Uh, so you go out through the, uh, the same protocol. Uh, if it's unstable, you shock him. If, uh, if it's um, stable, uh, you could uh, start a muterone. So uh, if you can uh, realize that a muterone, if you're in doubt, uh, you know, sometimes in emergency, if you're in doubt, you don't know, uh, what you're dealing with, uh, you just think amuterol, you wouldn't go wrong. But you got to be cautious um, if it's a young patient, less than 50, uh, who comes in with VTAC or, uh, or um, wide complex tachycardia, um, just give it a second thought that it still could be SVT rather than VT. If it's an old with multiple comorbid illnesses, uh, who comes into emergency, uh, basically, uh, I think it's most likely tend to be a VTAC rather than uh, SVT. So um, um, the main approach, uh, and I'm focusing here on emergency, uh, is to treat the patient and, and release from emergency after one hour observation, after completing all his blood workup and all his uh, necessary images. Now, if this patient needs second opinion and, and, and there is a consideration, this um, will be categorized as the second uh, category, uh, which, is, which are those patients that are at high risk and they're unsafe to be managed at home and they need further workup and management inside the hospital. And let me tell you, if you're in doubt, uh, basically just get cardiology to admit patient. I, I wouldn't discharge patient comfortably after he's been shocked or given a muterone uh, in, in emergency. Uh, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the approach of the American uh, Academy of, uh, of Cardiology, so we cannot argue much with that. So a pro step is to assess the rhythm and make sure that we're dealing with uh, um, uh, atrial fibrillation, then you fix the rhythm, and then you um, 
you think about this position, whether this patient is coming into the hospital or going home after, the, after getting him all necessary follow-up and writing his medication, including antiplatelet. And then you risk stratify for anticoagulation and make sure that his, uh, he should be anticoagulated before he comes back to the hospital. So the, uh, the, these, the, the category here to assess the rhythm after making sure that this patient has um, atrial fibrillation, if this patient fulfills the following, he's excluded from the criteria, such as if he's coming in with a frank acute coronary syndrome, decomposite heart failure or sepsis, he should come in right away to the hospital and you still manage his atrial fibrillation and, and, and manage the underlying um, uh, pathology that uh, tipped him over to, um, to atrial fibrillation. If he's in ischemia and myocardial infarction, you know you know what to do. Uh, heart failure, treat his heart failure while you uh, cautiously manage his atrial fibrillation. If he's in renal failure, probably you're going to manage him in, in CCU uh, with uh, cardiology and uh, nephrology. And um, uh, basically, if he's failing all measures that we've mentioned before, he still could be a good candidate to come into the hospital. Or even if the patient feels is unsafe to be managed at home or has uh, uh, social reasons, um, he could be considered to come into the hospital if he is poor compliant with his medication or he lives far away from the hospital. Then you fix the rhythm and we talked about it is, is the, the way to do it is to perform synchronized cardioversion if he fulfills the instability uh, protocol, which is uh, uh, acute coronary syndrome, heart failure, um, syncope, hypotension, uh, pulmonary edema. This is a patient that fulfills uh, electrical cardioversion. Um, if it has failed the electric cardioversion, the recommendation is to uh, replace the pads and um, uh, basically uh, give it another trial, okay? It's, uh, it's up to three times uh, cardioversion. I can consider repeating it. If it fails, uh, you consider a chemical cardioversion. And as we said, uh, rate control is uh, considered as uh, intervention of choice if the um, Atrial fibrillation duration is less than um, uh, 48 hours. If it's more than 48 hours, you could consider giving him digoxin, loading dose, and uh, or amuterone. After um, 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 rate control, you can uh, chemically cardiovert. If the patient fulfills uh, the uh, criteria of chemical cardioversion, which is um, um, he, Frail, frail enough not to tolerate um, electricity or has uh, some form of contraindication to sedation uh, or hemodynamically borderline is not like in a frank cardiogenic shock. Then uh, the choice would be amuterone, uh, digoxin, however, digoxin is slow, uh, abutilide or uh, flaconide. And I, I rarely use them and I, I rarely uh, see them in emergency. It used to be there before, but still amuterone is, uh, is a good choice uh, of intervention. Uh, early cardiology consultation, if patient uh, failed electrical chemical cardioversion or he has underlying uh, structural or ongoing ischemic heart disease or any other reasons uh, or pathologies that warrants him to come into the hospital in intensive care uh, or, or CCU uh, setting. How about anticoagulation? Um, who should be anticoagulated or who should not be anticoagulated I guess uh, your, your prime responsibility is to make sure that all of them should be anticoagulated in a way or another, but how can we get uh, through this? Um, uh, well, the best thing is um, uh, to get the oral anticoagulation, uh, oral uh, dose of anticoagulation or subcutaneous um, low molecular weight heparin or infrared heparin uh, as per the local guidelines. For those patients who uh, are anticoagulated, uh, basically they should be uh, they should be risk stratified, okay, for anticoagulation. There are too many uh, 
uh, roles that have been published uh, as for whom should we anticoagulate and whom are at high risk of bleed. So it's a risk benefit ratio. So um, I remember a long time ago, we started with SHADS, then comes the SHADS S2, and then the SHADS S2 VASC score. Um, and then these are the candidates uh, to be anticoagulated. And then and those at high risk of bleeding uh, has bled score ca came, uh, came out. And, and for those who, uh, who scores uh, child BASC, I'll, I will tell you uh, in details of um, what are the parameters that should be uh, incorporated in the, in the SHADS VASC. So basically, uh, SHAD BASC 2 is as good as SHAD BASC, but this is the most widely um, used um, a scoring system uh, for non valvular atrial fibrillation. Um, so uh, the score is up to nine points. Start off with uh, a congestive heart failure, hypertension, age more than 75, that scores two, diabetes. Uh, stroke TIS from embolism, vascular disease, or age uh, less than uh, um, 75, and uh, female sex. Um, if, if, if patients uh, gets zero, um, then basically he's not a candidate for anticoagulation. If his one anticoagulation is considered, two or more, uh, you should anticoagulate this patient uh, pending um, a referral to cardiology. What about HASPLEED? Now, HASPLEED score um, stands for hypertension, abnormal renal liver function, stroke bleed, uh, labial, INR, elderly, more than 65, drugs or alcohol. And, and these patients uh, basically um, are at those risk of uh, intracranial bleed. So if they accumulate more than three scores, uh, basically, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a relative contraindication. So um, as per the uh, score, it says uh, it's preferable not to anticoagulate this patient and, and leave them to cardiology to think of another modality of, uh, to manage their underlying atrial fibrillation. If it's one to two, basically, you can consider anticoagulate them. If it's one, you just anticoagulate them right away. So these are synergistically uh, scores that uh, work together uh, basically to, uh, to be able to manage this patient and uh, safely discharge him from emergency. Otherwise, um, all other categories should be admitted uh, to the hospital. Uh, this is in another, in another way. Um, now, what about hospitalization? As I said, um, deteriorating clinical status worsening uh, symptoms, um, failed cardioversion, inadequate uh, rate or symptom control uh, are good reasons of uh, admission. Or even if the patient um, basically uh, mentions to you that he's uh, unsafe to be discharged home and I'd rather prefer to come into the hospital so you consider admitting him to the hospital. A home discharge basically should be, uh, uh, should be considered for those patients who gets back to sinus rhythm, and I'm talking emergency again. So uh, those who, who revert to sinus rhythm uh, for more than one hour, hemodynamically stable, all their blood panel, cardiac enzymes, x-rays are clear. A patient understands the instructions and follow-up can be arranged within 24 to 48 hours with cardiology, they can be considered for uh, home discharge. Otherwise, you should get them into the hospital. If you personally ask me, I'd rather prefer to get the patients for the hospital to get all, uh, all of the above to be done in the hospital under a controlled setting and then be discharged home. So um, um, basically, I just would like to um, um, mention as a take-home message, um, as a, a workup um, uh, for, for, for those patients, as to uh, you have to assess the rhythm, make sure you're dealing with uh, narrow complex tachycardia, uh, 
as per Brugada, I did not mention Brugada because it's, it's gonna it, it take some a whole lecture. Um, after you make sure that is a, a narrow complex uh, or wide complex with aberrancy, atrial fibrillation, then you have to fix it either cardiovirgin or um, or um, electrical or chemical. And uh, after um, fixing the patient, if it's stable enough to just be discharged home, you discharge him. Otherwise, you. Uh, uh, bring him into the hospital. Not to forget to start anticoagulation um, uh, with antiplatelet uh, or uh, anticoagulation for um, uh, for further workup. I finish what I want to say. I'm open for any discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hani, for uh, this valuable uh, lecture. Uh, we have here one question. Uh, is there is any difference or specific in management in patients with valvular heart disease? Usually heart disease, uh, valvular heart disease are complex and they tend to be uh, more of a uh, permanent atrial fibrillation uh, type of patients and they're very hard to, uh, to manage in emergency. However, in emergency we'll do our part and then uh, we should be referred uh, for admission under cardiology uh, to be managed, um, probably they might need an ablation, they might probably need uh, an ICD, okay, to be inserted to a uh, better rate control them. So definitely the answer to your question is yes, there's a difference between uh, valvular versus non-valvular. Um, I'm dealing with non-valvular, um, native, uh, pure atrial fibrillation, uh, first diagnosed in emergency. All, all others should come into the hospital for further management. Okay, doctor, thank you, Dr. Hani. There is another question. Is there is any rule for uh, prokinamide? Uh, I've been once told by one of the AHA instructors uh, whom I did an ACLS with more than 20 years ago, you wouldn't go wrong with prokinamide. The only drawback with prokinamide is it, it takes long to prepare. Um, so if you're dealing with um, um, if you're dealing with unstable rhythm, so you're better off shock the patient or get a muterone, which is preloaded. Procanamide, you have to break it. You have to um, you have have you ever seen how procanamide is prepared? It takes you like uh, almost ten minutes to prepare procanamide. This is number one. Number two, it's not readily available in most of the crash cars nowadays. However, um, if you would give, if you would have the luxury to have procanamide around, it could revert any rhythm you could think of in, in ACLS, including atrial fibrillation. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rahani. No more questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, indeed. It's a pleasure. Uh, Sorry, can I have now... a comment, please? Yes. Sorry, it's, uh, it's Hisham in here. So uh, thanks, Dr. Hani, for the great talk. I just want to have a quick comment on, um, on the differentiation between the, um, the VT, the ventricular tachycardia, uh, versus SVT with, with aberrancy. So to the best of my knowledge, there, is all, there are so many different uh, scoring systems that are used, including the Brugada criteria to differentiate the two. And uh, none of them has been proven to be 100% sensitive, 100% specific. That's why in my practice, I go against this. They are time consuming. They're non-sensitive and non-specific. The problem with them, if we, uh, if we start using them is, apart from the waste of the time is, if, uh, if you use them because of the lack of the sensitivity, you will miss some VTs. And because of the lack of specificity, you will call SVTs and uh, with aberrancy as uh, VTs and the other way around. So my practice is always amiodarone or all, always assume it's VT and you will never go wrong uh, with this. Problem is there is a subgroup of ventricular tachycardia called adenosine sensitive ventricular tachycardia. So you will give adenosine and you will cardiovert the ventricular tachycardia back to sinus. So we'll, you will assume that you dealt with SVT with aberrancy. And this is the dangerous part because you will underestimate the condition you're dealing with and you will send the patient home assuming it was an SVT and actually it was VT. So that's why I completely go against using any way of differentiation. If we think we're dealing with broad complex regular tachycardia, 
I treat as VT until proven otherwise. Excellent comment, really uh, very valuable. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, by time and practice, uh, you develop your own protocol. So um, in emergency, our uh, um, dogma basically is to uh, assume the worst case scenario. So um, um, as, as you said, whenever I encounter um, uh, wide complex tachycardia, the first step, I take my pulse, okay, from the carotid. Okay, and make sure that I'm calm myself. And then I start taking a deep breath and think, think it over. Uh, in, in such a hypotensive white complex tachycardia, elderly or even young patients, um, you assume it's a VTAC uh, unless proven otherwise. So um, as, as Dr. Ibrahim said, you wouldn't go wrong with a muterone. So um, if, you're, if you're in doubt, just use a muterone cautiously all right, until you figure out what's going on for the patient. You will get your answer uh, immediately within five, 10 minutes. Thank you so much for this uh, comment. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Reni. Thank you, Dr. Uh, and now uh, with uh, Dr. Taimur, but uh, he is the chairman of emergency department, King Faisal Specialized Hospital, uh, consultant of emergency medicine. Uh, welcome, Dr. Uh, Taimur, and uh, uh, the mic is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to make sure that you all can hear me well and you can see my slides. Clear. Here, very good. So um, the topic that was given to me was pulmonary embolism in emergency department, the old uh, new dilemma. Um, you know, pulmonary embolism, uh, I, I think is, is one of the most challenging um, conditions when patients present with that uh, for multiple reasons, and we will, you know, get into that. Um, and just recently, actually two days ago, there was um, a patient that we had in the emergency department was uh, actually um, had a CT done in radiology, was sent home, and then he was called back uh, because he had uh, bilateral pulmonary emboli uh, with uh, with malignancy as well, so we see this on a, on a regular on a regular basis here. Uh, just uh, decrease my size here so I can see my own slides. So just a thought challenge, a question: Which of the following is most appropriate um, to risk stratify a patient with known pulmonary embolism? Well score, PE severity index, PERC rule or a clot burden on the CT. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I just uh, moved the question you know, away uh, too quickly, but um, you all think about it, and I'm sure most of you know the answer, but we'll go ahead and you know, complete the, 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 the talk and, and, and then uh, you know, try to answer the you know, question as well. Uh, so objectives uh, today would be that I would be presenting, um, uh, um, uh, you know, to you the, uh, the, the, the PE or pulmonary embolism uh, patient presentation, um, the risk factors uh, and, and the options for testing and guiding, uh, you know, principles and some uh, risk, uh, you know, stratification uh, for those patients. Uh, I'm not able to move my slides forward. Just one second. Okay. All right. Can I just decrease my bin, uh, the this this portion here? I don't need to see this. Can't. Okay. All righty. Um, or just a desktop, and then it's okay. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, first of all, can you mute? Can you mute? Um, okay. So the, uh, globally, if you look at it, the incidence of uh, pulmonary embolism has been uh, increasing. And I, I believe the reason for that is 
uh, emergency physicians are diagnosing pulmonary embolism much more frequently and readily than they used to. We have uh, more sophisticated tests and there's more or, or awakeness within the physicians uh, to really work up patients uh, who are coming in uh, to uh, us uh, so that um, we can diagnose them uh, you know, readily in the emergency departments. It used to be uh, a diagnosis that used to be made during autopsy. Uh, but nowadays we do make the diagnosis uh, in real life and we are able to treat them. Uh, the mortality rate, which has been quoted in uh, the older uh, studies is like 30%, which I believe is just too high a mortality rate, which uh, may not be the true reflection of the mortality rate at the current moment. And, and with multiple, um, you know, countries and, you know, um, have shown that the, the case fatality rate has reduced as well. So again, I, I congratulate all the emergency physicians for doing this because it has to be them along with the intensive care physicians and uh, other, um, other members of acute care who have really helped to reduce uh, this mortality. So as, as I mentioned, uh, you know, pulmonary embolism can uh, test uh, your skills, your your physician uh, experience, and your knowledge at any level, uh, from resident to the consultants, uh, because uh, a the history, uh, the history of these people may not be typical. You may not really get a clear cut history. Somebody might just present with a cough, might present with a low grade fever, might present uh, with a pleuritic pain. So it, it could be. Um, a presentation for uh, that you might confuse with something else. So it so the presentation isn't clear. Uh, so uh, or the history isn't clear for these people. And then the risk factors. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of people, um, you know, may have risk factors for the travel and uh, you know malignancies and uh, hypercoagulable states and trauma and surgeries and all of that stuff. But there's a, a a large group of people uh, who may not have any significant risk factors or known risk factors for developing a pulmonary embolism. So it again, it 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 would make you, um, you know, sort of guess what's going on with this patient. Again, examination, uh, it may range from uh, asymptomatic to somebody who is having a PEA. Uh, and or bradycardia and just shock and collapse. Um, you know, 20% uh, of the patients with uh, MI uh, and uh, PE have reprodu reproducible, uh, you know, chest pain. Um, again, that's uh, a major issue that uh, we see a lot of our residents would come push on the chest that uh, the pain is reproducible, just give them some ibuprofen and send them home. Uh, uh, and again, and you would find issues with that, you know, later on. Um, and then, you know, laboratory tests. There is no one laboratory test that you could do like you would do in our, you know, in, a, uh, in, for example, MI, a troponin or something like that, which can tell you that this person is having a pulmonary embolism. Uh, we'll talk about D-dimers and the troponins and the pro BNPs and stuff a little bit here as well. And then uh, the radiological workup, uh, although at the moment um, the CTA is almost like a gold standard for the diagnosis, but it has its own risks of having radiation and at times overdiagnosis uh, for uh, the pulmonary embolism because of, uh, you know, the issues with uh, litigation and the risks which our radiology colleagues have to go uh, through and they might call certain um, uh, you know, PEs which may not be clinically relevant or significant. And then the risk of treatment is, is there as well. The treatment isn't benign either, you know. Uh, it has, um, uh, like Dr. Hani mentioned about uh, uh, the, the risk of bleeding with uh, atrial fibrillation. Similarly, these people, if they're anticoagulated, they would have a risk of bleeding as well. Um, and um, so they could deteriorate. Um, and have you know significant consequences about it. So again, your diagnosis has to be correct. Your treatment regimens should be correct as well. So some of the risk factors. 
Um, the way uh, you could remember by the mnemonic is the thrombosis, the trauma, uh, hypercoagulable state, which are various hypercoagulable states, um, and then recreational drug use for R, which is IV drug use, uh, older folks, uh, birth controls, everybody knows that, obesity, surgery, immobilization for greater than three days and so on, uh, and some sickness as well. Um, which, which can result into um, developing, you know, pulmonary embolisms or a deep vein thrombosis, which is a part of, of, uh, the, of the disease. So 20% um, have no risk factors uh, and they still develop uh, pulmonary embolism or deep vein thrombosis. So this is uh, economy class syndrome. Um, 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 I, I travel economy as well. Uh, and uh, we all know how it feels to be sitting uh, in the you know, window seat and if you want to go uh, pee, you want to hold it and your legs are all tied up uh, and you're not drinking fluids and the long flights that I take uh, you know, back to US, uh, um, you know, they can become very, very difficult uh, at times. And um, uh, so, th so they are the ones which would result into deep vein thrombosis for the people. And uh, so, uh, a, you know, the way you would prevent that uh, was uh, either uh, you could uh, travel, um, you know, business class, which is um, if, if you can, uh, or uh, you could take um, uh, essentially an aisle uh, seat, uh, actually, it, so they say because there are people who uh, would be sitting uh, next to you and they want to get up. So, uh, you know, by default, you may have to get up and move a little bit so that the people can pass by um, and, and help uh, you move as well. So, so that would be a way to uh, you know, prevent you know, blood clots. I, I know a friend of mine used to travel from US to uh, Australia and she used to take uh, uh, you know, Klexan um, you know, with her, but um, I, I don't think that's what I've used before, but uh, um, I, I do you know, take an aisle seat. Aspirin doesn't do anything. Um, now, you all know about Wells' criteria as this historic doctor, you know, Brian Wells from, from Canada, um, uh, Ottawa. He, he's, uh, you know, done a lot of work on this. Um, and um, so they are, uh, again, related to some uh, history uh, uh, from the patient. And then there are some, uh, you know, simple, uh, simple criteria for Wells uh, as, as, as well. Um, and um, so it, it includes uh, the clinical signs for DVT, and then there's a, you know scoring for that, uh, heart rate, recent surgery, immobilization, things like that. Um, and then if the score for the original Wells criteria, if it is uh, less than four, P is unlikely, and if it's on the simplified Wells, if it's uh, you know, great, it should be less than one. So any of that, if it's positive, then there is a chance that there could be a pulmonary embolism. Um, now, you know, the, if, you, if you talk to, you know, Dr. Wells, he, he always mentions that, you know, these criteria have to be applied before you get the D-dimer or before you get uh, the X-ray. So this is the pretest probability. So when you see the patient for the first time, that is when you have to apply these criteria. And I tell these to our residents that this is the most important part, that these are pretest uh, criteria to be applied or pretest probability before you would know any of the lab results and stuff. So that's not the right time to apply the Wells criteria. So, which low risk patients need workup for pulmonary embolism? So, this is, again is another rule that um, has been built up. Uh, this is called the pulmonary embolism rule out criteria or the PERC scoring. Uh, it's the way to remember that is like a had clots or hormones age more than 50, uh, DVT, uh, or had a PE before. Um, uh, you know, coughing up blood like hemoptysis, uh, lower extremity swelling, uh, O2SATs, um, if they're less than 95, uh, tachycardia, heart rate greater than 100, um, and uh, surgery within uh, the last uh, four weeks or so. Um, so uh, I just mentioned that because um, um, I'm just going to, sorry, I'm going to turn it off.
um, uh, because um, yeah, so so these are um, uh, the symptomatic or the hi the history part of it that we can um, we can um, um, we can check on these on these patients and get a score. And anybody who has these positive would require workup for a pulmonary embolism. Now, if you put them together, so if you get the simplified well score and you score um, uh, you know, greater than one, then on, on wells, you go and get ahead and do imaging. But if your uh, simplified well score is less than one, then PE is unlikely. At the moment, then you can apply the PERC score at that time. And if you answer, if you're less than 50 and your pulse is good and your SATs are above 95, so none of them is there, then there's no need for further workup on these people. But if any of the FERC scores becomes positive uh, or there's no to any of these questions, then you would do a quantitative whole blood D-dimer test. And if that is positive, then you could uh, you know, go ahead and do the imaging uh, for these patients. So general, you know, uh, guiding principles uh, would be that um, the choice of initial diagnostic tests should be guided by the clinical assessment of the um, probability of PE and by the patient characteristics that may influence the, 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 the test uh, accuracy. Uh, some tests are uh, good for ruling in a pulmonary embolism, for example, a helical CT. Uh, or a CTPE uh, that would rule in. It would say, yes, you have uh, or you, you don't. And then some tests are good to rule out a PE, which is the D-dimer test. It doesn't tell you that it is, uh, that this person has PE, but it, it tells you that um, you know, if, it's, if it's negative, it's, it's reassuring them. Others are able to do both, but are often non-diagnostic, like the VQ scan. So, for a D-dimer, do it if you think it's going to be negative. So if you think in this patient, this D-dimer will be negative, you can do it, then that's a good rule out uh, for a DVT in, 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 in that case or a PE. Uh, but in somebody who is having a malignancy or post-surgery, you know it's gonna be elevated. So there's no point in doing a D-dimer at that time. So don't order if you're planning to get a CT scan on that person anyway. If you think that this person has a PE, tachycardic, hypotensive, has pleuritic pain, hemoptysis, all the things, and you think this person needs a CT, there's no point in doing a D-dimer at that point. And then if a chest X-ray is normal, a VQ scan is something that you know, can be done. Uh, it would be more beneficial to do. If the, if the chest X-ray is abnormal, then the CTA would be a better test to do. I thought I'd just put these in there for um, some of the guiding principles, which we forget. Now, you know, coming back to the D-dimer, uh, is D-dimer um, affected by age? Uh, yes, uh, it is affected by age. Um, so the D-dimer test to rule out the you know, thromboembolic events has a high false positive rate in elderly people. So it goes up with the age. And especially above the age of 50, the cutoff for this uh, D-dimer is elevated then. And so how do I perform an age-adjusted D-dimer testing? So the formula for that is simple. You take the age in years, multiply that by 10 uh, for people who are above the age of 50. So if somebody is 88 years old, uh, you would multiply that by 10, so that's 880. So any D-dimer, below 880 should be considered as okay for that person um, and or anything above 880 should be considered as as positive for that person so age adjusted d-dimer is something to consider and and to practice which i think would help another uh you know catch 22 with um pulmonary embolism is uh, in 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 pregnancies you know a, a pregnancy hypercoagulable state even during pregnancy or even after pregnancy, um, uh, you know, during the postpartum period as well, 
Um, some um, you know, studies suggest that this might be number one cause of obstetric mortality. Um, so in, in the pregnant patients, uh, we have issues as well. So what, what to do under, under those circumstances? Because in, in a pregnancy, during pregnancy, you know, with the CTA, you would be exposing them uh, to, um, to, to radiation. And what about the D-dimer in, in these people? Uh, the D-dimer uh, is, uh, is probably going to be elevated. So we'll, we'll, we'll mention that here now. That, um, so in pregnant women having, you know, have generally been excluded from all the studies. So all these studies that we do initially um, uh, for, you know, pregnancy or, or pregnant females are not part of the study. So all of these criteria that have been built, um, they are not part uh, of the study. So we don't know if they really, um, you know, have the same sort of, uh, you know, consequences as anybody else uh, or not. Um, and um, um, the first trimester, uh, there is no significant change uh, in uh, the D-dimer. Uh, so the levels are sort of the same as any other uh, you know, person would be. But in second and third trimester, the levels are usually elevated. Although, uh, a trimester adjusted, just like we had age, age adjusted D-dimer, if you have trimester adjusted D-dimer, you know, cutoffs uh, increased by like 250 for each trimester has been suggested for, um, for a PE in pregnancy. Uh, but, you know, um, the DIPEP, uh, you know, study could not find um, a D-dimer threshold below which the PE could be ruled out in pregnancy. So therefore, the, the American Thoracic Society re recommends not using D-dimer in, in pregnancy. So, um, you know, there are many proposed strategies for working up the pregnant uh, females, uh, but no diagnostic algorithm has uh, the robust, is, is robust enough uh, for a strong recommendation. Um, So there are some observational um, uh, evidence that a negative D-dimer result rules out a PE in otherwise low-risk uh, pregnant patients. A retrospective review of 152 uh, pregnant and postpartum patients who underwent a VQ and a CTA for pulmonary embolism uh, found a sensitivity of about 100%, but only a specificity of about 42%. The European Society of Cardiology recommends considering VQ scan to rule out suspected PE in, um, in pregnant women uh, with a normal chest X-ray, and that a CTA should be performed if the chest X-ray is abnormal. But uh, if you look at the Canadians here, uh, what they are recommending is to do like a two-tier um, Wells uh, criteria and if that is elevated, go and do a leg ultrasound. And if the results are uh, inconclusive, then you could do a weak spect or a, a CTA. Um, and if the results are positive, you go ahead and treat them. Um, but if the ultrasound was negative, you can stop, uh, you can stop there. Um, and um, so if you do the wells, if the wells is low, um, then you can do the PERC score. Uh, again, if that's positive, then you could do a D-dimer results. And if that is elevated, then you can again go ahead and do a, a leg of ultrasound. All these complexities, um, you know, the decision rules uh, and the criterias are out there. but Honestly, uh, the physician Gestalt, which is a physician, ex an experienced emergency physician, if that emergency physician takes a good history from the patient, does a good examination of the patient, and then if you ask him, do, what do you think this patient has or doesn't have, his suspicion or his ideas would almost be very close to all these decision rules. 
So, um, you know, we all talk about these decision rules and we talk about how to, you know, go ahead and do the workups, but the clinical judgment is very, very important. And it, it is it is the way to go, I really think. But again, in, in pregnant females, um, think about leg ultrasound uh, and think about the VQ spec or VQ scanning. I know a lot of our physicians, uh, you know, we are, we are comfortable ordering D-dimers, comfortable ordering CTAs, but we're not ordering VQ scans uh, as much. Maybe there is uh, the availability issue in certain areas because you need to have radionuclei uh, material for it. Uh, there is a very sm slight radiation, radioactive material, you know, is, is given it, but the risks are, you know, like very minimal. So CTA being the gold standard uh, for pulmonary embolism at the moment, um, but in order to avoid unnecessary CAT scans, you can't CAT scan everybody that comes uh, through your um, you know, ED. Um, you have to, um, you know, have some sort of um, uh, exclusion criteria that this is, or inclusion criteria that this is I, uh, your patient that I would CT and this is a patient that I wouldn't CT and that would depend upon how you've been, um, you know, on your clinical judgment, essentially. Uh, because CTAs are prone for uh, overdiagnosing clinically irrelevant uh, emboli in, in the low-risk patients. Its uh, sensitivity approaches about 100% uh, for clinically relevant pulmonary emboli. Uh, in those with high pretest probability, there is a small chance that a clot might be missed. So somebody who is high risk, you do a CTA and it's uh, negative, what do you do then? Um, so in those patients, uh, one of the way to do it would be to order a leg Doppler, um, you know, down the road a few days later uh, to make sure that this is not uh, developing or it's not something that is, uh, you know, a clot hasn't developed in the legs. So that would be, would be my approach. Um, the VQ scan um, in PE, uh, you know, challenges uh, in the diagnosis are there because of the issue of the intermediate scans uh, results, uh, but they are useful in young and healthy patients with normal chest X-ray and especially patients who have uh, CT contrast uh, allergies. VQ spec scan. Uh, it's like a three-dimensional scan, which is done. Uh, it, it has a better, um, uh, you know, sensitivity than the regular uh, VQ scan, um, uh, and uh, it just gives you positive, negative, less intermediates, um, and a superior uh, accuracy as compared to the traditional scan, uh, but poorer specificity than the CTA for uh, PE but a lower radiation dose as well. So um, ideal for um, a, a pregnant uh, female. Now I wanna to touch a little bit about the subsegmental uh, pulmonary emboli to treat or not to treat. Uh, in the last 10 years, um, the incidence of diagnosing uh, PE has doubled uh, despite no change in the mortality. Uh, partly due to the advances in the CT, the radiology technology, um, and, and the overcalling of the subsegmental PE uh, for medical legal uh, reasons. Although, um, you know, there are some variability in practices, most emergency physicians end up treating the subsegmental PE, but should we? So that's, that's the question. So an observational study by Goya et al. in 2015 reviewed about 2,000 patients uh, with um, a diagnosis of, sex, of a subsegmental PE and showed that whether or not anticoagulation was given, there were no recurrent pulmonary emboli, yet 5% of the anticoagulated patients developed life-threatening bleeding. Other studies have yielded similar results. So there is a risk of treatment as well. So, um, you know, shared decision-making, consider the patient's bleeding risk, like mentioned, the has blood score, which is used for atrial fibrillation, you can use this here as well, and, um, um, and discuss the potential treatment options uh, with, the, with the patient. The 2018 ASAP clinical policy on acute venous thromboembolic disease uh, mentions that um, um, 
that ASAP gives withholding anticoagulation in patients with subsegmental PE, a level C recommendation in states, given the lack of evidence, anticoagulation uh, treatment decisions for patients with subsegmental PE without uh, associated DVT should be guided by individual patient risk profiles and preferences. So talk to your patients, discuss with them, include them in the decision making. Start anticoagulation for subsegmental PE in the ED with an exception that anticoagulation may be stopped in follow-up, right? So thus start it, arrange for a follow-up for them, and then it may be stopped by the internal medicine physician or so. So that's another approach of dealing with it. So while the risk of major bleeding with a full course of anticoagulation is significant, the risk of bleeding with a few doses of anticoagulant is very low. So this is what our ASAP is you know, saying. Mentioned a little bit about the PESI score, the S-PESI score, which is the pulmonary embolism, embolism severity index. This is to risk stratify patients who have had a diagnosis of pulmonary emboli uh, that um, that to see, uh, you know, uh, what is their risk of, of developing worsening um, and, and for risk for mortality and stuff. So it's based upon the age, the, 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 the gender, the uh, history of cancer, uh, heart failure, heart rate, systolic blood pressure, so all clinical uh, stuff here. Uh, respiratory rate, the temperature, altered mental status. So every point has a score, you add the score, and then for, uh, for PESI, you have five classes, so 65 being the lowest, and then 125 and above would be a class five, so very high risk, high, high class. For S-PESI, uh, you have uh, a, a score a zero is low risk. Anything more than one is considered as, as, as a high risk. Uh, it does include uh, saturation of less than 90%. Uh, and the pulse rate is 110, systolic pressure less than 100, um, you know, similar to that. So they are, these are the scores that help you risk stratify uh, the patients. So historically, we've been, uh, we've been taught, uh, you know, or we still use actually, uh, massive PE or submassive PE or subsegmental PE. But in reality, it is not the size of a thrombus that really matters. Uh, what matters is that, uh, uh, that how much of a hemodynamic compromise that thrombus does, because also depends upon patient's uh, physiological status. Uh, you know, a massive PE is a PE uh, that would cause more than 50% narrowing in a pulmonary artery. Uh, but, um, uh, you can have smaller size PEs and cause more of a hemodynamic problem. So uh, another way uh, or a preferred way nowadays to, um, to, to uh, risk stratify is to say as high risk, which has somebody with hemodynamic uh, or who is hemodynamically unstable, uh, intermediate risk, uh, or a low risk. A low risk person is somebody who could be treated um, as an outpatient uh, uh, and be sent home, intermediate risk sh uh, should be admitted, and then the high risk, you know, definitely should go to the ICU, um, which would have hemodynamic, hemodynamic uh, instability. Now, um, so if, if you see, how do you define that? So the high risk, uh, you have hemodynamic instability, so somebody is in shock, uh, their PESI score is class three, four, or five, or S-PESI is greater than one. Um, and they also have the signs of right ventricular um, dysfunction on, uh, on imaging. Now, so this is, again, a newer concept, which is um, the, to look at the right ventricle. Um, either you can look it up through a CT scan, uh, where you have the ratio of... Uh, the right ventricle or, uh, over the left ventricle, um, you know, size ratio. So it should be greater than 0.9 or point or or, or one, um, and um, you could do it uh, on ultrasound uh, uh, as well. 
where you look at the end um, uh, end diastolic uh, measurement of the right ventricle, which is more than 30 uh, you know, millimeters, uh, or you could look at the you know, paradoxical septal movement. Um, so when the ventricle is contracting, the you know, septum is sort of moving in the opposite direction um, and uh, open rehypertension. So, there are, so the, the, there are findings that you can have on imaging both ultrasound which is echocardiogram uh, of the heart and um, uh, also uh, the CT scan. And then you also have the cardiac markers. Uh, now we know troponin and uh, the pro BNP um, are non-diagnostic for PE, but they and, and any elevation in them correlates with mortality. So uh, when these people are having a large or uh, high risk um, you know, pulmonary emboli resulting in elevation of troponins, which, you know, a lot of folks are calling troponitis uh, or high pro BNP, the risk of mortality is going to be higher for them. So these are the high risk people. Intermediate has been divided into two, which is intermediate high or intermediate low. Uh, so none of these patients have shock in them, uh, but they uh, have um, a higher uh, PESI scores. Um, and they may have elevation in their, um, you know, troponins and the pro BNPs. And the low intermediate uh, risk uh, patients uh, have either one, either a pro BNP or a troponin is, is elevated. And the low risk patients, um, they have um, no shock, uh, their PESI scores are good, um, and uh, they may not have an elevation in their, um, you know, biological markers uh, for uh, like troponins and, and the pro BNP. I wanted to put this slide in there because I know John Hopkins has started this um, uh, a PERT team, which is pulmonary embolism response team. Um, and um, I'm not sure if any of the hospitals has this. Uh, we currently don't. Uh, I'm in Medina right now. I was in Riyadh before, um, which I think uh, King Faisal Riyadh may be able to develop a team like this because we have enough burden uh, for these kind of patients where um, if these people are referred to us from outside facilities or uh, we find a patient who is in ED or ICU who has been diagnosed with severe pulmonary emboli, uh, we ask this team to come uh, just like a code team. They come, a cardiologist, a pulmonologist, uh, you know, um, uh, a surgeon, uh, interventional radiology, uh, ICU guy or a vascular guy, and, and then they decide what to do with these people. Uh, because um, I believe that um, uh, although um, in hemodynamic uh, compromised patients, uh, there is a way to uh, give thrombolytic therapy for them, systemic thrombolytic therapy, uh, or the people who have um, um, high risk for bleeding to give uh, you know, catheter-directed thrombolytic therapy, but I think that is done less and less, not too, I mean, I've seen these, uh, the, the thrombolytics given um, during codes uh, or it, very late stages, but I think it needs to be done a little bit sooner to improve the care you know, for these people. So I think if we have a multidisciplinary team that might help us make these decisions sooner and in, in, in a, uh, you know, joint fashion, and shared responsibilities are not all the burden on us in the emergency department. So uh, pretest uh, again, this is the summary slide. Um, uh, at the end of this talk, uh, inshallah, the pretest clinical assessment. Again, we have multiple scores, but I guess physician gestalt, a good phys uh, history, a good physical examination is is important. Diagnosis, uh, you need to rule. You need to know what are the tests that can rule out and rule in your diagnosis um, and then if you can expose somebody to radiation or not uh, can you get an echocardiogram or can you do your own ultrasound cardiac ultrasound um, or not and just read that confidently or not so that is one of the things that you do in diagnosis of these people then risk stratification um, based upon your um, your uh, your clinical um, uh, situation of hypotension or not, the PESI scores, the RV um, size, and or, uh, the, the the tropes and the others, and then the and then the treatment options, 
uh, for these people, uh, which I didn't go into. Um, again, uh, I think the low molecular weight heparin is um, essentially uh, the way to go for us in the emergency room. Um, I wouldn't personally discharge anybody on um, the oral anticoagulants, the, um, the even the newer ones, uh, without doing a proper consultation with uh, our folks, um, internal medicine folks who are doing thromboembolic uh, in our department, um, uh, or the primary service, uh, you know, for those, uh, for uh, you know, for these people. Because uh, I think there needs to be a, a close follow up for these uh, these these you know folks. Uh, the surgical embolectomy, the Vinakeva filters um, um, are options. Uh, Vinakeva filters have actually fallen uh, out of favor a lot. Um, anybody who can really take oral anticoagulants um, shouldn't really be getting the, the the filters. But there is maybe a small um, you know segment of patients that might do. Uh, or might require that. I think FDA is now saying you can use them for about a month to 54 days uh, or, or, or so. Um, and, um, and then, you know, there's a risk of bleeding, the recurrent P's and our VTEs. Um, uh, we, we need to be aware of, of, of those as well in patients who already are on, uh, on, on the treatments, if they're therapeutic or not therapeutic. So I think that's that's it for uh, our side. I would be happy to take any questions. Uh, and if you want me to go back to my my question, um, which was uh, initially uh, put up, which of the following is the most appropriate to use to risk stratify a patient with a known pulmonary embolism? Is it well score? Uh, PE, serotonin index, PERC rule, uh, criteria, and the clot burden on the CT. Uh, we know um, it's uh, not going to be well scored because that's uh, the pretest probability, and the PERC rule is also used, has to be used as pretest. Um, the clot burden on the CT in geography is a, is a, is a possibility here with the PE, serotonin index, uh, but again, the clot burden itself is is not the only thing it, it, it is I think mostly the uh, you know the PESI score um, in there all right thank you very much thank you so much Dr. Bot for the very informative uh, presentation in this dilemma as we said initially uh, we have a couple of questions in the Q a section if you can reach it Okay. Um, in pregnant patients with suspected uh, PE DVT, what would be the D dimer cutoff? So, um, as I mentioned uh, in there, they're saying it's uh, 250 uh, per uh, trimester. So you add on 250 for the second trimester 250 for the third but uh, honestly um i'm not going to be the one using the d dimers for for the pregnant patients um but uh yes it's 250 is is what they're saying if it's negative then you're good but uh, that's what it is and post trauma young kids with um uh, post trauma young kids with mild increased d dimer how to proceed um, you know, uh, one is like the blood clots and stuff, but then you can have pulmonary emboli, fat emboli, and you can have other emboli as, as well. Uh, it would be tricky, uh, depending if it's, a long, if it's a long bone fracture or not. You, all of these uh, people would require um, uh, like if, if you have a high clinical suspicion, I would, I would not go with the D-dimer. I would go with, you know, CTA to kind of, you know, look at it in, in those people. But post, like if somebody gets a splint or a cast or something, you would need to put them on a VTE prophylaxis. In King Faisal Hospital, uh, VTE prophylaxis post-surgery, uh, no matter what kind of surgery it is, it is so religiously followed. 
um, you know, that is uh, even they would get the compression stockings and also the hap or, or the, you know, Lovenox, which is the, um, you know, Plexan over here in Saudi. Um, any uh, recommendations uh, about you about use years algorithm in uh, pregnancy? Uh, you could. Um, I'm not very familiar with that. Um, and then there is. Um, can you please uh, elaborate a little bit about? COVID-19 vaccination and the risk of, uh, yeah, I know. So COVID-19, I was thinking about that um, to put it in my uh, slides, but I, I didn't. It's, um, yeah, very good. Um, actually, we've seen patients uh, post uh, COVID vaccine. Actually, one of our paramedics, um, uh, his, um, his son, actually, young, young guy, uh, he died uh, after COVID uh, vaccination, developed, um, you know, clots and pulmonary embolia and stuff too. So the risk is there, but I still think the vaccine is, uh, is it's better to take the vaccine. I took the vaccine uh, and the booster shots as well. All my patients did as well. Um, so uh, the risk is, is, uh, uh, is there. Um, but we should take the vaccine as well because I, I guess the risk of getting the COVID and the complications of the COVID is higher than the risk of um, you know getting the, um, the 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 PE or the clots with with the you know COVID nineteen uh, vaccine. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Ismail, uh, are you ready? Yes, inshallah. Uh, I'm very happy to have Dr. Ahmed Ismail with us uh, at the last uh, lecture uh, in this symposium, uh, talking about the cutting edge in uh, management of DKA. Dr. Ahmed Ismail is a consultant of emergency medicine, and the, he is the program director of the residency program in uh, East Jeddah Hospital. He is a fellow of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. He is one of the very, very first uh, Egyptian doctors, doctors uh, who got this uh, uh, certificate. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, uh, uh, just a couple of uh, seconds before you start, please, uh, because uh, it will be the last one and they are going to close after this lecture. I really want to appreciate and uh, uh, thank every one of the speakers who honored us in this uh, symposium. Also, thank you uh, for the uh, all attendees who joined uh, over the two days. Uh, and we are going to send them the, uh, the links. Uh, what we have done is just a trial to throw a stone in the stagnant water in uh, uh, medical education, especially in uh, Medina regarding the um, uh, emergency medicine. We are uh, appreciating all the uh, hospitals contributed with us, and we are open for all other hospitals to also to contribute with us. Thank you so much. Thank you for the academic affairs. Dr. Ahmed, the mic is yours. I just want to be sure that uh, the mic is, is working and the screen has been shared already. Yes, it is. Right. Okay. Right. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, everyone. This is uh, Ahmed Smail, consultant emergency medicine. I will be with you, inshallah, for the next, uh, inshallah, few minutes or more. Uh, I know that you are exhausted for the last two days. Inshallah, we are not going to talk more. We are going to finish by decay. We know well that uh, DKA one of the commonest uh, emergency presentation, either in adult or pediatric. So let's talk what's the evidence and what is the update in DKA. So if we're going to talk about DKA, let's talk about clinical presentation for the patient who is a 14 year old boy who presented to emergency department. He's complaining of some sort of abdominal pain for the last few days with no past medical history. So basically this patient, when landed to emergency department, we start usually as a standard by taking a vital for this patient. And when you go to the vital, this is the patient who presented and landed to emergency department, and this is already his vital. So when you go to the blood pressure, blood pressure is maintained uh, 110 over 80, with heart rate of 120, a little bit tacky. It's not that significant, could be because of pain, could be dehydration, could be a lot of uh, things that uh, can exacerbate uh, this tachycardia. 
and then he has a normal temperature with, which is not the cause for this tachycardia and respiratory rate. And now his respiratory rate is the cabinet a little bit with 25 uh, per minute. Okay, in pediatric age group, um, still one more vital should be taken in triage. And this is, should be considered uh, one of the vital signs, which is random blood sugar. If we deal with this patient with just uh, these parameters, this is, uh, could be considered a mistake when patient presents with abdominal pain in this age. So we need to check random blood sugar for all this pediatric age group presented with abdominal pain. Why we are concerning mainly about abdominal pain, we are going to talk about this later in job. So when we check random blood sugar for this patient, incidentally finding that we discovered that the patient has a high random blood sugar with 400 milligram per deciliter, which is definitely not normal uh, for this patient. When we talk more to the patient and we know well that uh, the patient doesn't have any past medical history, so now we have a patient who doesn't have any problems before presented with acute onset and uh, new onset uh, high random blood sugar, which consider type 1 diabetes uh, for this uh, boy. So abdominal pain uh, is considered one of the most commonest presentation in DK. We know well that there are some other presentation can be uh, present in this patient, but abdominal pain per se, this is one of the commonest presentation, approaches mainly nearly 50% from the patient presented with uh, DKE, uh, found that they have um, abdominal pain. And this is mainly because of the ketone, which is released in their blood uh, circulation, which causes uh, that GIT irritation. Uh, adding to the abdominal pain, we still have another symptoms. Uh, it could, all of them could be present and some as well. So nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, this is the most commonest, mainly abdominal pain. If we're adding to them from the history, the patient went to be a lot and he drinks a lot of water, so polyuria, polydepsia, and uh, some sort of weakness, generalized fatigability, unexplained weight loss for the last uh, couple of months. So all these together, um, as well as the vital sign, uh, putting this, this patient on the track that this patient uh, mostly having a DKA. Meanwhile, we, we didn't diagnose yet uh, a DKA. It could be just a hyperglycemia. Uh, if we want to say this patient has a DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, we should have some sort of criteria to be found in this patient, adding to this uh, vital sign, adding to this clinical presentation to say this patient has a DKA. So this is a clinical presentation for that patient. So if we're going to examine him, we we'll discover that the patient is dry a little bit. And we can discover this dryness either in mucous membrane, either in his tongue. And um, not all doctors or not all healthcare worker can uh, diagnose that frothy or can diagnose this frothy breath or cosmal from the cosmal breathing of the patient. Um, I, I can't uh, diagnose uh, this uh, frothy uh, uh, press. Cosmal breathing, this patient is tachypneic and he has a shallow breathing as well, rapid breathing. So this patient was cosmal breathing and this acetone odor in his uh, breath, uh, this is also uh, can put you a track that this patient, most probably he, he may have a decay. From that fatigability, patient may be confused a little bit and tachypneic. And this tachypneic, it's actually it's a compensatory mechanism for uh, this patient to wash out his CO2. This patient in uh, severe acidosis, and he will try to compensate this acidosis by washing out uh, CO2 to put himself in alkalotic uh, pathway, to just try to compensate this uh, acidosis. And finally, this patient will be tachycardic. Tachycardic could be, as we said, from pain, from uh, dehydration, from stress. So all this can uh, exacerbate this tachycardia. So if we put all this history together, now we are dealing with patient, uh, mostly he has a DKA, but if we want really to confirm this, we need to set the criteria. What happened in this patient? Why this patient went to this DKA? So basically DKA mainly or mostly common in type one uh, diabetes mellitus, which is less common in type two. The ratio is two to one, two in type one diabetes um, mellitus. 
This patient, he, because of uh, severe uh, uh, hyperglycemia, this patient will go to dehydration and probably he may uh, lost about six liter of his uh, fluid due to dehydration. And this dehydration could be because of vomiting, could be because of uh, uh, hyperglycemia and urination, polyuria, uh, decreased oral intake for the last few days or weeks. So all this can put the patient in dehydration state. Why the patient in type 2 diabetes doesn't have uh, or not common to have uh, type, not common to have DKA because a patient in type 2 diabetes, he still has some sort of insulin in his uh, circulation uh, comparison to the type 1 diabetes. So in type 2 diabetes, as long as the patient still has insulin, so there is no such ketone in his blood. But once there is no insulin, the patient will go for uh, ketone in his blood, and this is well. Uh, put the patient in this uh, track of DKA. So once a patient uh, doesn't have enough insulin or no insulin in his blood circulation, he will now go for the hyperglycemia. His random sugar uh, will significantly be high, more than 300, 400, even 500 uh, milligram. And the, the, the system of his body just try to uh, find out and treat uh, this uh, problem. So uh, the lipolysis is started and the ketone uh, production will be subsequently uh, leads to ketonemia. And this ketonemia uh, subsequently will go uh, put the patient in metabolic acidosis. Now, from all that information, we believe that this patient has a DKA. So if we would just want to confirm that this patient has a DKA, or just a hyperglycemia, we need to have a criteria to confirm the diagnosis. So basically, patient should be a hyperglycemia, so his glucose should be more than 250 milligram per deciliter. And there is some exception, I'm going to talk about this later. And secondly, his pH. So once patient lands in an emergency department, you need just to get a point of care uh, random blood sugar. We'll, uh, now, we'll, uh, random sugar will be high, then quickly get a VBG sample, and we'll find that his pH is less than 7.3. Then in the VBG as well, we'll find that his bicarbonate is less than 18 uh, milli equivalent. Then we'll dip his urine or take a blood ketone, a blood sample to check for ketone. So now patient has high random blood sugar with uh, metabolic acidosis been based in, in his uh, pH with low in serum uh, bicarbonate and uh, presence of ketone either in blood or urine. Then we're going to calculate his anion gap from either from VBG if it's a really accurate uh, regarding uh, electrolyte or just take a blood sample uh, to check for chemistry. So calculate his anion gap and now we'll patient, find the patient that he has high anion gap metabolic acidosis. So now we are putting our patient in uh, confirmatory uh, criteria that this patient, uh, he has a DKE, which could be, this is the first presentation for this patient emergency department with uh, new onset diabetes, and most of these cases, new onset diabetes will uh, present to the emergency department first time as a DKE, or already patient known to have uh, hyperglycemia, known to have diabetes, and because of some factors, this patient will uh, end up with DKE. Okay, so if the patient doesn't have any problems before and he's clinically well and he doesn't have any past medical history, and that patient all of a sudden uh, presented to emergency department with uh, DKE, or patient already known to have type 1 or either type 2 diabetes, then uh, he presented with DKE. So what could the patient put the patient in this uh, way to have DKE? So there are a lot of causes and precipitating factors that put this patient to, un 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 uh, to uh, put him on a state that he will be in hyperglycemic state. And uh, as long as there is no insulin, this hyperglycemia will end up uh, with DKA or it will be severe enough with severe dehydration, then put that patient on type 2 to DKA as well. So infection, which is uh, one of the most commonest cause for uh, uh, DKA and precipitate the DKA. If we're going to talk an infection, talk about the infection. 
So this is based on the patient's clinical presentation. If the patient gets a history that he is coughing a little bit, he has a fever. And so we need to, to dig more to find why this patient has this infection and uh, precipitate the decay. It could be ETI based on the symptoms. It could be a severe epigastric pain, which all the patients mostly have uh, epigastric pain. But we need to keep in mind that pancreatitis also could be the cause for this uh, decay. So we need to dig more in the history to find out where is the infection that precipitates this decay. If you find that the patient doesn't have any infection, so we need to go uh, to search for more why this patient has decay. So infarction, uh, sorry, in, in, infraction, which means uh, insulin non-compliance. If the patient is not compliant to his insulin uh, medication, so patient already known to have uh, diabetes, is an irregular insulin, and for the last few days, he doesn't have his regular insulin or he uh, take uh, less therapeutic dose. So this is uh, exacerbating his uh, hyperglycemia and put him in decay as well. Uh, or patient has an infarction, which uh, because of that stress of infarction, either this infarction in his uh, coronaries, uh, he has an MI or this ischemic event happened to his brain and he has a stroke. All these stress factors put that patient on uh, the pathway for uh, decay. And simultaneously, if the patient has a decay, and because of that decay, he went for severe dehydration and uh, decreased oral intake and repeated vomiting, so he will be in hypercoagulable state. And this hypercoagulable state will put the patient on the risk of pulmonary embolism, on risk of strokes because of dehydration. So it's uh, either this way or that way. Infant, which we may that the patient because of pregnancy, uh, he may induce that decay. If the patient using uh, illicit drugs and use uh, substance abuse, uh, either cocaine or whatever this stuff, also this could be the exacerbating factor for this decay. Iatrogenic, and this is uh, related to the medication we are giving to the patient, and we are not really aware about the side effect and. Um, because of side effect, patient went for severe hyperglycemia, like steroid and this in, in this COVID uh, pandemic, we used uh, to use uh, steroid a lot. And the side effect for this steroid patient may go for um, decay. So just bear in mind and take uh, uh, precaution while before prescribing this medication and to be sure that the patient doesn't have uh, a diabetes. And if he has diabetes, just you need to be sure for that this patient will benefit from this steroid. Uh, if it's really uh, beneficial for him, okay, that's, that's fine. Go ahead and control the sugar. But if it's debatable and it doesn't show that, that uh, much effect, so there is, need to, uh, there is no need to put your patient on risk of um, hyperglycemia and control. Another stressful condition when the patient has a GI bleeding or has a surgery, so all these uh, problems. Uh, and these factors can put patients also in decay. Finally, some medication like uh, beta blockers and thiazide, fluoroquine, uh, fluoroquinolones, all uh, can exacerbate uh, decay. Now we said that the patient should be hyperglycemia uh, to have a decay, but sometimes we may find that the patient has an eoglycemic decay. Uh, which with uh, random blood sugar will be less than 250 milligram per deciliter. But adding to this uh, 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 random blood sugar reading, he still have uh, metabolic acidosis. He still has a ketone in his urine. His bicarb is low. So now we are talking about euglycemic decay. It's not that common, but still present in some patient who has uh, liver problems, who is alcoholic. And also in a pregnant uh, patient, we may find that this patient type of patient has also a euglycemic DKA. Uh, or patient already he is in DKA for a couple of days, and he just took his insulin today. So before landing to emergency department, you just uh, check his uh, blood sugar, and his blood sugar is, uh, is less than 250, but he's still DKA because of the last few days he wasn't compliant to his medication. So that's why he's euglycemic right now. Finally, some patient was taking uh, SGLTs uh, uh, to inhibitors, and this type of medication uh, has been approved to uh, lower blood sugar in uh, type, type 2 diabetes. But unfortunately, this patient, uh, sorry, this uh, type of medication can also 
uh, exacerbate the euglycemic decay, which is uh, end by uh, flozen uh, medication. Now we have patient who has um, uh, metabolic acidosis, high anion gap metabolic acidosis, and we know we need to know exactly. If there are other causes can put this patient on high anion gap metabolic acidosis, or this is just a clear cut uh, decay. So you need to keep in your mind that some causes of high anion gap metabolic, some, some factors that can cause high anion gap metabolic acidosis, uh, like uh, renal failure, like uh, lactic acidosis, like some patient who takes uh, ingestion of salicylate or uh, ethylene or methanol. So also this uh, high anion gap metabolic acidosis, just to keep in your mind uh, that while de dealing with this patient, that this could be another uh, problem rather than, rather than just a clear-cut decay. Um, now, does all patients presented with decay, are they are severe enough to be in, in resuscitation area, to be managed in ICU or some patients can be managed in uh, ward, can be uh, discharged at home. So basically, this is uh, based on uh, severity classification. So we have mild DKA and moderate, then severe DKA. And this is basically based on uh, patient uh, pH. So if the patient pH um, from 7.25 till 7.3, which uh, consider uh, mild, but if the pH it drops to seven, so this is uh, moderate. If below seven, so this is definitely severe uh, decay. And also correlated with uh, serum bicarbonate. So if serum bicarbonate up to less, up to from 15 to 18, so this is uh, mild decay. If drops than uh, 15 to 10, so this is moderate. And if less than 10, so this is a severe decay. Why we are classifying this uh, or classifying this presentation? Because uh, it based on this clinical presentation and these parameters, we may decide to take this patient to the high dependent area and emergency department with close monitoring, or he can be managed uh, in other area less uh, in, in uh, monitoring in emergency department or uh, at um, final destination for this position for him. Okay, after you decide that your patient has DKE based on clinical presentation, based on history and examination, then uh, you put all that patient on the diagnostic criteria and he fulfill all uh, criteria for DKE. So what investigation you want to proceed in emergency department, uh, either laboratory or radiological, uh, to support you either in diagnosis or to discover the persisting factor. So basically, random blood sugar, it's um, it's must to be done. Okay. Does we do we need to proceed for all uh, chemistry panels, um, um, coagulation profile, CBCs? So uh, electrolytes, it's a it's a must to be done. Uh, mainly sodium and potassium. Magnesium phosphorus also sometimes it has been uh, documented that uh, has dropped in uh, DKE. Renal profile, yes, we need to know that uh, the patient status uh, regarding his uh, renal profile because if with severe dehydration, patient will start to show increase in uh, PON, uh, maybe acute kidney injury as well, and that may, could be the precipitating for this DKE because of renal failure. Do you need to proceed for troponin for all patients uh, presented with DKA? Uh, definitely not. It's based on the um, age and uh, risk stratification for this patient uh, that he may have uh, MI or silent MI. So based on ACG, based on the past medical history, clinical presentation, if he has chest pain or not, but this is not a routine investigation to be done. Uh, but renal profile electrolyte, yes, it's a routine to be done as well. CBC, will it make difference in patient management? Uh, actually not because these patients may have increase in white cell count, which is not really correlated with uh, infection because sometimes it could be also uh, because of a stress, not only an infection. Uh, but 
to differentiate between this increase in white cell count is it really related to infection or related to stress just look up, look for uh, neutrophils is it high if it's high so goes with infection if it's not so this is mostly related to the stress uh, venous blood gas versus arterial blood gas so uh, which one is a um, is a practice so uh, venous blood uh, gas vbg uh, we requested in a patient with dka rather than arterial blood gas uh, why because we are not looking for any uh, thing related to po2 which is a main difference between arterial and venous uh, as long as patient is setting well and he doesn't have decrease in oxygen saturation so there is no need uh, to uh, put the patient at risk for this uh, painful procedure and the venous blood sample will be enough to check for his VBG, to check for his metabolic status, to check uh, for electrolyte uh, as well. Then check for ketone either um, by uh, point of care, uh, clock check, uh, which has a ketone strip, or check in urine for ketone in urine. And the uh, serum ketone is more uh, uh, sensitive and specific for uh, this rather than um, urine. Do we need to proceed for imaging for this type of patient? Uh, actually not. Uh, there is no such um, radiological or radiographic uh, uh, diagnostic test for that patient of DKE. There is no standard to, to, to uh, chest X-ray for all patients of DKE. It depends on the history. So if you're suspecting that the patient may have an infection, so, okay, go ahead for uh, chest, I mean, chest infection. So go ahead for chest X-ray to see if he has a consolidation or pneumonia. If he doesn't have and the examination wise is fine, so then you need for, to do X-ray. Do we need to do CT brain? Uh, it depends if you're suspecting meningitis uh, and this is, could be the precipitating cause for this DKA or the patient went, uh, unfortunately, after a while to cerebral edema. So you may go for CT. Uh, ECG, not all patients also should have an ECG if you're dealing with young age, he doesn't have any comorbidities before and he doesn't have any chest pain, so there is no uh, ECG, but just bear in mind that all the age you may be presented with silent MI and this could be the precipitating for this DK. Now let's go to the practice. After this introduction, how can I manage this patient who presented with DK? Okay, so now that boy, that chap who has a four, uh, is a 14 year old, presented all this uh, clinical presentation and he confirmed that this patient has a DKA and he doesn't have any precipitating factor and this is just all of a sudden uh, incidental finding. So what you are going to do with this patient, you had a random blood sugar in trash, shows that his random blood sugar is 14, you, get a, you drag a PBG, shows a pH, pH is 7.0 uh, uh, with spike carb of 10. Um, normal uh, sodium and potassium in VBG. So what you're going to do next, his respiratory rate is 20 plus. Um, so basically this patient should be in a resuscitation area, resus bay. You put him in cardiac monitor, you check his uh, oxygen saturation, so put him in pulse oximeter. This, this type of patient he may be prone for arrhythmia if he, does, if he has any uh, electrolyte abnormality, either hyperkalemia or hypokalemia. So just be in mind this patient should be in cardiac monitor because they are prone for arrhythmia. Then pop and cannula in. Uh, once you secure the line, drag the blood investigation and the keep the line in. If you can have two lines, uh, this is definitely will be uh, better because this patient will have an insulin infusion at some time uh, as well as uh, fluid infusion. Uh, what could be difficult a little bit initially if the patient is really dehydrated, uh, but meanwhile, just uh, pop a line in and uh, start the fluid. I'm going to talk about this. Now check his random blood sugar and you confirm he's in DKE. Then keep in mind that treating such patient is not just treating DKE, you are treating DKE and the treating the precipitating factor as well. And this is really important. You may go in to treat the patient with DKA, with fluid and stuff like this. And your patient has an MI on the other hand, and the patient may arrest at any time because of arrhythmia and because of uh, this uh, MI, and you didn't treat this well, and patient will crash at any time. So your question right now, this patient has a DKA or not? Yes. The second the question, why he has a DKA? So, Keep searching for the cause for this DKA and 
keep in mind that you need definitely to treat this uh, precipitating factor if you has if the patient doesn't have any precipitating factor okay that's fine but you need to keep this question in your mind and this is really important okay abcd approach for all uh, critically ill patients presented to emergency department what we need to do in a way for this patient this patient is really tachypneic, respiratory rate 20 plus, 30 plus. And the, uh, as long as he's trying to compensate his acidosis, he's going to breathe more faster to compensate this metabolic acidosis. So we have a critical time. If your patient, you, you notice that he's really tired, he's really exhausted from that fast breathing, and he started to have normal, normal uh, breathe, a normal uh, respiratory rate. So initially he was 35, now he's going to 30, 25, 20, 15. You shouldn't be happy with this respiratory rate of 15. This is really dangerous. Uh, I'm warning the sign that this patient was going to crash at any time. Normal respiratory rate means the patient is in failure and you need, you don't need to wait till your patient reaches this failure. So once you discover that the patient started to be exhausted and tired and he cannot breathe more fast, so this is your time inter to intervene. But otherwise, if the patient can compensate and he still can breathe well with no clinically uh, exhausted, so okay, just keep the patient and don't do any invasive intervention regarding the airway apart from some oxygenation if he uh, really sick. But at some uh, uh, point, you need to do your intervention and you need to intubate the patient. Keep in your mind that intubation should be avoided should be avoided as much as you can. If possible, avoid uh, intubation and avoid ventilation. But if your patient started to go uh, to this normal heart rate, normal respiratory rate or going to be crashed, so there is no way intubate him and ventilate him. Um, which medication you're going to use uh, for uh, the rapid sequence? Are you going to use the chronium? Are you going to use succinyl? It's better to use perochronium just to be away from succinide because succinide can exacerbate or can uh, precipitate hyperkalemia and such a patient. So erochronium is the best. Who is going to do this? We would say the most uh, uh, senior doctor in the emergency department, he will be the one responsible for this uh, intubation. This is not the time for training for uh, our colleague. This is the time to save life for this patient. If you're going, not going to intubate him immediately right now, he may crash, okay? Re-oxygenate him well with bag mask ventilation, uh, not just for by, by oxygen, no, you, you need to start bagging him uh, with bag mask ventilation with 100% of oxygen for at least three to five minutes, giving your uh, rapid sequence medication, uh, sedation and the muscle relaxant, then intubate him immediately. After intubation, that patient before intubation and before sedation and before muscle relaxant, he was breathing on the rate of at least 30 or 35. So once you intubate him, you need to keep him on that rate of respiratory, uh, on, on that uh, respiratory rate. So he was breathing on 33, so bottom him in 33. He was breathing on 40, bottom him in 40. Because with this respiratory rate pre-oxygenation or pre-intubation, he was 40. He, by this rate, he was able to compensate his metabolic acidosis. So if you put him back after intubation on the rate of 12 or 15, you are putting that patient of, on, on risk of severe and exacerbating his uh, metabolic acidosis because there is no compensation right now by respiratory effort. And this is really important and should keep in mind regarding the respiratory rate post the intubation for this type of patient. Now you intubate him, you put him in uh, mechanical ventilation if he needs, or the patient is stable little bit and be, we can continue uh, for uh, other management rather than intubation. So the first line of treatment for this patient after securing AP uh, to go C. And to see here, we pop a cannula in your drug, your blood investigation, you check random blood sugar. Then you start to transfuse uh, or to infuse uh, fluid. Okay, so initial polis for that patient will be 20 ml per kg. Uh, an adult, we usually start from one liter to 1.5 and so, and this is, will be a polis in adult, but in pediatric, we start 20 ml per kg. Uh, unless you have a concern regarding cerebral edema and 
you have you are you need to be cautious more so we start by 10 ml per kg if the patient is really shock in pediatric but if you're going to deal with adult patient who are going to give him one liter bolus over 15 to 20 minutes you need to be sure that your patient doesn't have any kidney problem before he doesn't have any history of heart failure before because right now you may put your patient on risk of uh, pulmonary edema or overload uh, if he has a CKD. Now, the debate, do we need to start sodium bicarb? Sorry, do we need to start sodium chloride, normal saline? Or um, the new studies showed that we may, it's better for the patient to use uh, plasma light or linger lactate. Why we, has, why we have this uh, debate between, we used to give normal saline before and even Though right now for the old policies in the hospital, in some hospital still using the normal saline and the other started to move to the uh, new um, uh, policy regarding uh, plasma light or lactate printer. What is the difference? In normal saline patient will be more prone to have hypercholoremic uh, non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. In, 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 in normal saline, we'll see here, in normal uh, saline, uh, the sodium will be 154 uh, milli equivalent, and the chloride will be as well 154. But if we compare this normal saline to the ringer, which only has uh, chloride 109 uh, and in plasma light chloride uh, 98, was more or less the same, just a um, little bit difference, about nine milli equivalent. Comparison to the normal saline, uh, more with uh, 50 milli equivalent. Uh, sodium as well is a little bit uh, lower in, in, in plasma light and more lower uh, with 25 uh, milli equivalent less in Ringer lactate. So with this difference in sodium and chloride mainly, they uh, prefer to use uh, plasma light and Ringer lactate rather than uh, sodium chloride. And also in um, uh, when you use uh, plasma light, uh, less potassium and the faster resolution of acidosis has been uh, noticed and uh, established with using plasma light. So that's why the new recommendation is to use a balanced solution, which is plasma light or Ringer uh, lactate, but still sodium chloride is an acceptable option and also can be used, but this is uh, should be used initially as a bolus, but when you go for the maintenance, it's should be or it's uh, recommended to be half normal saline uh, with either D5 or just uh, water, uh, but uh, to keep continuing giving the patient with uh, five to six liter of normal saline, this is patient, your patient will go, will end up with hyperchloremic non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. So we are treating him from one way and uh, iatrogenically uh, giving him more uh, chloride and more sodium which can uh, exacerbate the problem. Okay, so the bottom line here is still normal saline. Uh, it's a good option, but if you have the uh, chance to use either plasma light or ringer lactate, this is definitely will be the best, but also you need to go back again to your uh, hospital policy and to see exactly what is, has been written there in their policy. I need to follow the hospital protocol, but if you have this chance to talk about this uh, new regimen of treatment, it definitely will be, the, uh, it will be better. Now you resuscitate, you start to resuscitate your patient with uh, fluid. Now we are talking NC. Uh, so you give him a polus of fluid, like a one liter of normal saline or 20, uh, 10 to 20 ml uh, per kg in pediatric. Then you will go for uh, insulin therapy. This patient has a hyperglycemia. Uh, so you are going on dehydration. So you are treating uh, dehydration with fluid and you are treating the hyperglycemia with insulin. Uh, there is some precaution to use an, an insulin. We're going to talk about this uh, in relation to the potassium, not in relation uh, to the uh, random sugar itself, but because of insulin effect on potassium, there is less, some consideration should, should be keep, kept in your mind before starting the insulin. But if you decide that your potassium is okay, I'm going to talk about the potassium later, and you decide to use an, your insulin, and this is the time for insulin. So what is the dose? You will start by 0.1 unit per kg, and no more longer uh, polus of insulin. 
We used to do this before to give a bolus of insulin, like a six unit initially, then start the infusion, but no more uh, high dose of insulin, just to go for the maintenance dose of insulin. And your target insulin, so you're basically you know, not giving insulin only for hyperglycemia. You are giving insulin for hyperglycemia and for resolution of acidosis. So what does it mean? If your patient started to drop his random blood sugar below to 50, you still need to keep to give him an insulin to uh, treat this acidosis. But if you're still giving him an insulin with uh, uh, 250, of, uh, 250 milligram of uh, sugar, this patient will end up with hypoglycemia. So you need to give him uh, dextrose simultaneously with fluid. Otherwise, the patient will go for hypoglycemia. So the role of insulin, not only to treat hyperglycemia, but also to treat the acidosis. So keep the insulin infusion till you have cure of this acidosis. So for how long do we are going to keep uh, insulin infusion? Till you have at least a two from this following. If the patient by carb improved above 15 mL equivalent, if his pH improved above 7.3, if his anion gap has been closed, so patient closes his anion gap, no more high anion gap, and he either has normal pH above 7.3 or uh, bicarb above 15. So this is the time to stop insulin infusion and to shift the patient or bridging the patient to the sub-Q. Okay, so if the patient has his random blood sugar drop below 250, so this is the time to put dextrose infusion. Can we use subcutaneous infusion? Sorry, so can we use subcutaneous insulin rather than the infusion? In some studies, they said yes, we can use uh, the subcutaneous uh, insulin, rap act rapid insulin, rather than uh, infusion. But this is in limited situation. If the patient has a mild DKA who's clinically well, he doesn't have a vomiting, he uh, can tolerate oral, so patients can be improved quickly. Yes, we can put him in subcutaneous, uh, subcutaneous insulin. Uh, because the uh, uh, half-life of insulin is nearly 30 minutes, so we can still giving him insulin uh, every one hour. Uh, and uh, this patient most probably may be discharged uh, soon. But if the patient is uh, sick enough and he's in either uh, moderate or severe DKA, so the subcutaneous infusion will not be the best uh, option at that time. So you give him a fluid, you give him an insulin, then you decide to give him potassium and uh, as we said there is no insulin infusion unless you know exactly what is his uh, potassium sometimes we don't depend uh, on uh, potassium in uh, in vbg because sometimes it will be not really accurate so we'll go for uh, potassium uh, in serum and once you know your as a patient the potassium this is the time to start the insulin why we say this if the patient the potassium is less than 3.3 there is no insulin infusion. So you will hold your insulin, you're just giving some fluid, and simultaneously you need to correct this hypokalemia by giving him potassium infusion from 20 to 40 milli equivalent uh, per liter. So there is no insulin at that time. But if the potassium level is from 3.3 to 5.3, so yes, you can give him an insulin, but simultaneously you need to give him a potassium uh, infusion. and uh, uh, this is with uh, fluid infusion. So you give him three medications together, you give him fluid infusion, you give him uh, insulin infusion, and you need to give him potassium infusion as well if he's uh, from 3.3 to 5.3. But if the patient above 5.3, so there is no harm, you can start your insulin safely, there is no need to add any potassium uh, infusion, and to keep the fluid therapy uh, for this patient, and to keep checking potassium every one to two hours according to the hospital policy. The debatable uh, medication. Sodium bicarb for severe decay. Sodium bicarb for mild to moderate decay. Is there any rule for sodium bicarb in DKA patient? The new guideline said clearly avoid sodium bicarb. There is no routine use of sodium bicarb because uh, sodium bicarb will be uh, metabolized to uh, CO2 and the, the system and the body will wash out this CO2 uh, by respiratory ventilation. And your patient already tachypneic, his respiratory rate already right now uh, 30 plus. 
and you are giving him sodium bicarb and the sodium will buffer this sodium bicarb to wash out the CO2. So we'll put him in more the kidney and you are putting your patient at risk from severe exhaustion to his respiratory muscle to fail at any time. So is there no clinical indication and no indication to give sodium bicarb? It's a limited use only in some situation. There is no routine, pH 7, pH 7 plus, um, sometimes uh, less than 7, but patient is still maintaining his breathing. Uh, yes, you, you can avoid sodium bicarb because it causes rebound uh, acidosis later on. But only limited uh, situation, you can use sodium bicarb, which is in profound hyperkalemia, and we know well that we can use sodium bicarb, and this is one of the treatments for hyperkalemia to give uh, sodium bicarb. If your patient unfortunately went for cardiac arrest, so at that time, this is the time for sodium bicarb. And finally, if the patient is really shocky or supporting him with fluid and patient in severe uh, hypoperfusion with uh, shock state and hypotension, severely tachycardic, yes, you can give him sodium bicarb if he's really uh, severe enough and he may crash at any time. But in routine use of sodium bicarb, no, there is no routine use of sodium bicarb. Now we back again to the aglycemic DKA in some patient who is, uh, has a liver problem, who is alcoholic, who is pregnant. We just take his insulin and, and it landed to emergency department and his random sugar is uh, less than 250. So at that time, you will give him a, a dextrose infusion simultaneously with uh, insulin and the fluid and potassium and the potassium in, uh, in case of uh, clinical indication or laboratory indication. But this type of patient, the eugalacemic DKA, keep in mind, you need to continue giving him an insulin, but be aware about hypoglycemia, so give him the extreme infusion. Finally, why your patient may arrest at any time? What is the cause of this in DKA? Okay. Cerebral edema. You are giving your patient more fluid. You are trying to treat his dehydration. So you are over, over uh, um, hydrating him with more fluid. So he will end up with cerebral edema. And now the atrogenic problem. You are giving him more fluid. He went to cerebral edema. You start to give him insulin infusion before checking his potassium. And that patient went to hyperkalemia because of potassium shift insulin, uh, put, uh, insulin shift uh, potassium uh, intracellular. So the patient will end up with more hyperkalemia with this insulin infusion. Then he will go for cardiac arrest. So also this is an iatrogenic cause. Uh, finally, hypoglycemia. You are giving your patient insulin. You are checking his random blood sugar frequently. Or patient already euglycemic and you didn't discover this, then he went for hypoglycemia and he may crash because of this hypoglycemia. So all causes of this mainly heterogenic unless the patient has a precipitating factor, either he has an MI before or stroke before or pulmonary embolism before or all other causes precipitating the DKA, or because of the patient who already has a DKA and he's in hypercoagulable state, he went up with a severe pulmonary embolism or massive pulmonary embolism, and he crashed from this pulmonary embolism. So this is the causes. Some of these causes are iatrogenic because of um, improper management, and some cannot be, uh, uh, it's not an iatrogenic. It could, it could be before precipitating or a subsequent uh, complication from DK. So we'll go through quickly from uh, cerebral edema, one of the iatrogenic uh, problems. Uh, you should uh, keep in your mind that when you are resuscitation, you're stating patient with uh, fluid, be aware, be aware about uh, cerebral edema, which could be uh, a fatal uh, consequences from this fluid infusion. It's mainly in pediatric, but also can be, has been reported in some cases in adult that he went up with uh, cerebral edema, but it's mainly, it's a, a pediatric presentation, uh, but also can be uh, reported in adult as well. To diagnose uh, cerebral edema, you should have either one diagnostic criterion or two major criteria, or one major and the two minor criteria. In diagnostic criteria, if the patient's posturing is started to decorticate or disrepreate, if your patient has abnormal response to pain, he is not responsive to pain as he was, 
if he started to have some sort of cranial nerve palsy, or finally, if your patient has a neurogenic respiratory pattern. Or one, two major, uh, if he disturb a conscious level, if he has sustained a decrease in heart rate, we are, we are aware about a uh, Cushing phenomena. If the patient, he has high blood pressure and simultaneously he drop his heart rate. So that patient is going uh, for Cushing. So be, uh, be aware about dropping a uh, heart rate and this heart rate is not related to pleural resuscitation. No patient all of a sudden dropping his heart rate uh, by 20. So be aware about Cushing and uh, one of the major criteria for cerebral edema. Finally, patients start to have some sort of incontinence. Minor uh, criteria. Uh, if the patient started to vomit and he was clinically well and he was stable enough and he doesn't have any more vomiting, then all of a sudden start to vomit. So be, my, be aware that this vomiting could be because of his ICB rather than just uh, stomach irritation. If he has unexplained headache, if he started to be more lethargic and weak rather than he was initially lethargic and he improved and started to be lethargic with headache and vomiting. So all these criteria put your patient at risk of cerebral edema. If his diastolic blood pressure started to be up more than 90, now we are going to talk about uh, Cushing again with hypertension and bradycardia. And if your patient is uh, young enough, less than five years old. So if you discover that your patient has uh, cerebral edema, what you need to do immediately, first of things, just uh, elevate the head uh, of the bed uh, to 30 degree and discontinue IV fluid, no more IV fluid, and you need to start uh, osmotic diuresis. You need to uh, pull this fluid again from his circulation, either to give him manitol or by giving him hypertonic uh, solution. So by this, uh, intervention. Hopefully, your patient may return back, uh, but uh, take care not to put your patient at risk of cerebral edema because of overhydration, or your patient may go for risk of hypokalemia because of starting insulin infusion uh, before checking potassium level, or patient your patient went to severe hyper, hypoglycemia uh, because if you didn't because you are not checking his uh, blood sugar uh, regularly. Finally, you decide that your patient has been treated in emergency department, have given, been given everything needed in emergency department, where you are going to uh, transfer your patient. Most of the patients definitely need to be admitted to the hospital, as your patient needs to be admitted to ICU uh, or can be admitted to a step down or intermediate ICU or um, ward admission with some sort of close monitoring. This is based on the, some criteria. If your patient's uh, mental status is deteriorated, he has a cerebral edema, so definitely this is an ICU case. If depends on the degree of acidosis, if he's mild uh, acidosis, this is, can also be treated outside uh, with close uh, follow-up with his GP or can be admitted to the ward, but if he's uh, severely acidotic, so this is an ICU case. Uh, based on the concomitant or precipitating factor, if your patient has a severe stroke, is there a conscious level, MI or pulmonary embolism, this is definitely ICU, but if he's stable or not with some sort of chest infection, so this can be um, a ward admission. Then follow again your hospital protocol regarding the admission uh, and the insulin infusion, because some hospital can provide insulin infusion in ward or regular bit, and others, there is no uh, insulin infusion in regular bit, and this should be only in ICU. So again, back to your hospital policy. If your patient was clinically well, then he started to have refractory hypotension, or you are not able to treat his uh, anion gap, and he still has a, a high anion gap metabolic acidosis, so still this patient need uh, more uh, further management and close monitoring, and this patient will be an ICU case. So by the end of uh, this slide, this is the disposition for this patient. And now patient can be safely uh, going home or can be admitted uh, to another, uh, or can be admitted to the ICU or step down. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you have been enjoyed. If you have any question, you are welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed. Jazakumullah khairan. I think we have a couple of questions in the Q&A uh, section, if you can have a look. Okay, so how can we differentiate between renal failure and the DKE, metabolic acidosis, come 
uh, with both of them. Okay, so we need back again to the DKA criteria. In DKA criteria, we said that you need to have um, high metabolic, uh, high anion gap metabolic acidosis, which is uh, present in uh, both uh, renal, acute renal failure and the DKA. But in DKA, you still have uh, your patient who has uh, high random uh, blood sugar and he has ketone urine, which is not uh, present in uh, acute renal failure. Okay, uh, maybe hyperglycemic, not DKA. Uh, maybe hyperglycemic, not DKA. Yes, can, your patient may be just on hyperglycemia, not DKA. Again, if he just has a high random blood sugar, but he does his VBG is normal, his pH is okay, and he uh, doesn't have any ketone in his urine. So this is just a hyperglycemia. We treat it according to hospital protocol, can be given sub-Q, can be giving uh, IV fluid, uh, and follow up uh, with uh, his GP. An aeoglycemic uh, TKA will target blood glucose level to start insulin. Again, an aeoglycemic uh, TKA will target blood glucose level to start insulin infusion. Okay, so we said an aeoglycemic uh, DKA, once is a, so the patient basically, either that patient, he uh, presented initially with a hyperglycemic DKA, and now he is going down to reach the aeoglycemic uh, DKA, his random sugar dropped to 250. So this is the time to start uh, insulin simultaneously with uh, dextrose infusion. But if your patient initially started or presented with random sugar of 200, and he fulfilled all the criteria for DKA regarding his metabolic status, regarding his VBG and the ketone. So at that time, you will start immediately the dextrose infusion uh, D5 or D10 based on the hospital uh, policy. And simultaneously, you will start insulin infusion. In some hospital, where they put a, a cutoff uh, number about uh, random sugar. If the random sugar uh, drops than 120, so no more insulin infusion, just to stop insulin till you load up the patient with more glucose, then you resume back of insulin. So uh, basically, it, it based on the hospital protocol. I think in NSS, it's still the standard flow of management, a normal saline, when the of TKA is in most guidelines, uh, namely NICE and the local uh, MOH protocols, hyperchloric metabolic acidosis really happen, and it's very dry and rapidly. Uh, yes, yeah, you are right. We still, we still, even in our hospital, we're still using the normal saline protocol. This is still some studies has been reported this hyperchloremic uh, metabolic acidosis, uh, but it has not been established as a guideline. Uh, so if we are going to change the guideline in any hospital, we are not depending only on uh, such a study. It's a uh, calmative uh, studies and uh, let's see the evidence. If the evidence is enough uh, with a systematic uh, review or uh, type one uh, evidence, okay, we can uh, discuss about this, but if it's just a study, uh, no, it's uh, we'll, we'll back again to the hospital protocol. Can sodium bicarb be given pre-intubation if respiratory failure, uh, peripheral potassium supplement to what limit? I'm sorry, I didn't uh, understand that question. Peripheral potassium supplement to what limit? I don't understand the question. Um, can sodium bicarb be given pre-intubation in renal? I haven't read uh, this regarding pre-intubation uh, in respiratory failure. I haven't read this regarding giving uh, sodium bicarb, but it has been clearly mentioned that uh, you need to be quickly, you need to be slick uh, while you're putting your tube in with uh, avoid some medications that can exacerbate uh, the hyperkalemia like uh, succinyl and to get the experienced person, but I haven't read regarding uh, to give sodium bicarb, so I don't know if there is any evidence regarding this or not. How do you know if my patient is having adequate management of TKA? How fast the ketone should be improving? How fast random blood sugar going down? Okay, so there are some criteria to say that your patient is improving. If he's clinically started, clinically, a uh, patient was confused, lethargic, and now he's able to communicate with you, so this is clinical uh, sign of, uh, of improvement that your patient having uh, uh, DKA, proper DKA management. On the other hand, if the patient, uh, you are following up his VBG initially was 7.0, then now he's 7.1, 7.2, and so. So now you have an evidence, uh, a radiological uh, laboratory evidence that your patient also 
uh, improving. If he start to close his anion gap, initially his anion gap was 20, now his anion gap going down. So this is also uh, confirmatory uh, evidence that your patient is improving. Uh, that's it. I think we have answered all questions. And uh, thank you all. Um, we took a lot of time. I know that I'm exhausted. It's nearly one hour, but I was really glad to meet you today. And inshallah, we're going to meet you soon once Dr. Mohammed uh, 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 announced for uh, another conference, inshallah. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, and the pleased to meet you today. And thanks all. Thank, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, and then of this uh, uh, seminar, I want to thank all our eminent doctors. I want to uh, also thank our uh, chairman, Dr. Muhammad Talat, and يعني نفع الله بكم وبعلمكم دكاترة الأفاضل أبتعتم وأفدتم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أستغفرك وأتوب إليك إن كنا أحسننا فمن الله إن كنا أسأنا فمن أنفسنا ومن الشيطان أشكركم وإلى موعد قادم إن شاء الله مع أعراس أكاديمية كثيرة إن شاء الله مع السعودي الألماني شرفتونا ونورتونا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته